Carnacki the Ghost Finder by William Hope Hodgson Chapter 1 The Gateway of the Monster In response to Carnacki's usual card of invitation to have dinner and listen to a story, I arrived promptly at 427 Chain Walk to find the three others who were always invited to these happy little times there before me. Five minutes later, Carnacki, Arkwright, Jessop, Taylor, and I were all engaged in the pleasant occupation of dining. "'You've not been long away this time,' I remarked, as I finished my soup, forgetting momentarily Carnacki's dislike of being asked even to skirt the borders of his story until such time as he was ready. Then he would not stint words. "'That's all,' he replied, with brevity, and I changed the subject, remarking that I had been buying a new gun, to which piece of news he gave an intelligent nod, and a smile which I think showed a genuinely good-humored appreciation of my intentional changing of the conversation. Later, when dinner was finished, Carnacki snugged himself comfortably down in his big chair, along with his pipe, and began his story, with very little circumlocution. As Dodgson was remarking just now, I've only been away a short time, and for a very good reason, too. I've only been away a short distance. The exact locality I'm afraid I must not tell you, but it is less than twenty miles from here, though except for changing a name that won't spoil the story. And it is a story, too. One of the most extraordinary things ever I've run against. I received a letter a fortnight ago from a man I must call Anderson, asking for an appointment. I arranged a time, and when he came I found that he wished me to investigate and see whether I could not clear up a long-standing and well, too well, authenticated case of what he termed haunting. He gave me very full particulars, and finally, as the case seemed to present something unique, I decided to take it up. Two days later I drove to the house, late in the afternoon, and found it a very old place, standing quite alone in its own grounds. Anderson had left a letter with the butler, I found, pleading excuses for his absence, and leaving the whole house at my disposal for my investigations. The butler evidently knew the object of my visit, and I questioned him pretty thoroughly during dinner, which I had in rather lonely state. He is an old and privileged servant, and had the history of the grey room exact in detail. From him I learned more particulars regarding two things that Anderson had mentioned in but a casual manner. The first was that the door of the grey room would be heard in the dead of night to open and slam heavily, and this even though the butler knew it was locked, and the key on the bunch in his pantry. The second was that the bedclothes would always be found torn off the bed and hurled in a heap in the corner. But it was the door slamming that chiefly bothered the old butler. Many and many a time, he told me, he had lain awake and just got shivering with fright, listening, for sometimes the door would be slammed time after time, thud, 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 so that sleep was impossible. From Anderson I knew already that the room had a history extending back over a hundred and fifty years. Three people had been strangled in it, an ancestor of his and his wife and child. This is authentic, as I had taken very great pains to discover, so that you can imagine it was with a feeling I had a striking case to investigate that I went upstairs after dinner to have a look at the grey room. Peter, the old butler, was in rather a state about my going, and assured me with much solemnity that in all the twenty years of his service no one had ever entered that room after nightfall. He begged me, in quite a fatherly way, to wait till the morning when there would be no danger, and then he would accompany me himself. Of course I smiled a little at him and told him not to bother. I explained that I should do no more than look round a bit and perhaps affix a few seals. He need not fear. I was used to that sort of thing. But he shook his head when I said that. There isn't many ghosts like ours, sir, he assured me with mournful pride, and by Jove he was right, as you will see. I took a couple of candles, and Peter followed with his bunch of keys. He unlocked the door, but would not come inside with me. He was evidently in a fright, and he renewed his request that I would put off my examination until daylight. Of course I laughed at him again, 
and told him he could stand sentry at the door and catch anything that came out. "'It never comes outside, sir,' he said, in his funny old solemn manner. Somehow he managed to make me feel as if I were going to have the creeps right away. Anyway, it was one to him, you know. I left him there and examined the room. It is a big apartment and well furnished in the grand style with a huge four-poster which stands with its head to the end wall. There were two candles on the mantelpiece and two on each of the three tables that were in the room. I lit the lot and after that the room felt a little less inhumanly dreary, though, mind you, it was quite fresh and well kept in every way. After I had taken a good look round, I sealed lengths of baby ribbon across the windows, along the walls, over the pictures, and over the fireplace and the wall closets. All the time as I worked the butler stood just without the door, and I could not persuade him to enter, though I jested him a little, as I stretched the ribbons, and went here and there about my work. Every now and again he would say, "'You'll excuse me, I'm sure, sir, but I do wish you would come out, sir. I'm fair in a quake for you.' I told him he need not wait, but he was loyal enough in his way to what he considered his duty. He said he could not go away and leave me all alone there. He apologized, but made it very clear that I did not realize the danger of the room, and I could see, generally, that he was in a pretty frightened state. All the same, I had to make the room so that I should know if anything material entered it, so I asked him not to bother me unless he really heard or saw something. He was beginning to get on my nerves, and the feel of the room was bad enough without making it any nastier. For a time further I worked, stretching ribbons across the floor and sealing them, so that the merest touch would have broken them, were anyone to venture into the room in the dark with the intention of playing the fool. All this had taken me far longer than I had anticipated, and suddenly I heard a clock strike eleven. I had taken off my coat soon after commencing work. Now, however, as I had practically made an end of all that I intended to do, I walked across to the settee and picked it up. I was in the act of getting into it when the old butler's voice, he had not said a word for the last hour, came sharp and frightened. "'Come out, sir, quick! There's something going to happen!' Jove, but I jumped. And then, in the same moment, one of the candles on the table to the left went out. Now whether it was the wind or what, I do not know, but, just for a moment, I was enough startled to make a run for the door, though I am glad to say that I pulled up before I reached it. I simply could not bunk out, with the butler standing there after having, as it were, read him a sort of lesson on being brave, you know. So I just turned right around, picked up the two candles off the mantelpiece, and walked across to the table near the bed. Well, I saw nothing. I blew out the candle that was still alight. Then I went to those on the two tables and blew them out. Then, outside the door, the old man called again. Oh, sir, do be told, do be told. All right, Peter, I said, and by Jove, my voice was not as steady as I should have liked. I made for the door, and had a bit of work not to start running. I took some thundering long strides, as you can imagine. Near the door, I had a sudden feeling that there was a cold wind in the room. It was almost as if the window had been suddenly opened a little. I got to the door, and the old butler gave back a step, in a sort of instinctive way. "'Collar the handles, Peter,' I said, pretty sharply, and shoved them into his hands. I turned and caught the handle and slammed the door shut with a crash. Somehow, do you know, as I did so, I thought I felt something pull back on it, but it must have been only fancy. I turned the key in the lock, and then again double-locking the door. I felt easier then, and set to and sealed the door. In addition, I put my card over the keyhole and sealed it there after which I pocketed the key and went downstairs, with Peter, who was nervous and silent, leading the way. Poor old beggar! It had not struck me until that moment that he had been enduring a considerable strain during the last two or three hours. About midnight I went to bed. My room lay at the end of the corridor upon which opens the door of the grey room. I counted the doors between it and mine, and found that five rooms lay between and I am sure you can understand that I was not sorry. Then, just as I was beginning to undress, an idea came to me, 
and I took my candle and sealing wax, and sealed the doors of all five rooms. If any door slammed in the night, I should know just which one. I returned to my room, locked the door, and went to bed. I was waked suddenly from a deep sleep by a loud crash somewhere out in the passage. I sat up in bed and listened, but heard nothing. Then I lit my candle. I was in the very act of lighting it when there came the bang of a door being violently slammed along the corridor. I jumped out of bed and got my revolver. I unlocked the door and went out into the passage, holding my candle high and keeping the pistol ready. Then a queer thing happened. I could not go a step towards the gray room. You all know I am not really a cowardly chap. I've gone into too many cases connected with ghostly things to be accused of that. But I tell you I funked it, simply funked it, just like any blessed kid. There was something precious unholy in the air that night. I ran back into my bedroom and shut and locked the door. Then I sat on the bed all night and listened to the dismal thudding of a door up the corridor. The sound seemed to echo all through the house. Daylight came at last and I washed and dressed. The door had not slammed for about an hour, and I was getting back my nerve again. I felt ashamed of myself, though. In some ways it was silly, for when you're meddling with that sort of thing, your nerve is bound to go sometimes. And you just have to sit quiet and call yourself a coward until daylight. Sometimes it is more than just cowardice, I fancy. I believe at times it is something warning you and fighting for you. But, all the same, I always feel mean and miserable after a time like that. When the day came properly, I opened my door and, keeping my revolver handy, went quietly along the passage. I had to pass the head of the stairs along the way, and who should I see coming up but the old butler, carrying a cup of coffee? He had merely tucked his nightshirt into his trousers, and he had an old pair of carpet slippers on. "'Hello, Peter,' I said, feeling suddenly cheerful, for I was as glad as any lost child to have a live human being close to me. Where are you off to with the refreshments? The old man gave a start and slopped some of the coffee. He stared up at me, and I could see that he looked white and done up. He came on up the stairs and held out the little tray to me. I'm very thankful indeed, sir, to see you safe and well, he said. I feared one time you might risk going into the gray room, sir. I've lain awake all night with the sound of the door, and when it came light I thought I'd make you a cup of coffee. I knew you would want to look at the seals, and somehow it seems safer if there's two, sir. Peter, I said, you're a brick. This is very thoughtful of you. And I drank the coffee. Come along, I told him, and handed him back the tray. I'm going to have a look at what the brutes have been up to. I simply hadn't the pluck to in the night. I'm very thankful, sir, he replied. Flesh and blood can do nothing, sir, against devils and that's what's in the gray room after dark. I examined the seals on all the doors as I went along, and found them right, but when I got to the gray room the seal was broken, though the card over the keyhole was untouched. I ripped it off and unlocked the door and went in, rather cautiously, as you can imagine, but the whole room was empty of anything to frighten one, and there was heaps of light. I examined all my seals, and not a single one was disturbed. The old butler had followed me in, and suddenly he called out, "'The bedclothes, sir!' I ran up to the bed and looked over, and, surely, they were lying in the corner to the left of the bed. Jove, you can imagine how queer I felt. Something had been in the room. I stared for a while from the bed to the clothes on the floor. I had a feeling that I did not want to touch either. Old Peter, though, did not seem to be affected that way. He went over to the bed coverings and was going to pick them up, as doubtless he had done every day these twenty years back, but I stopped him. I wanted nothing touched until I had finished my examination. This I must have spent a full hour over, and then I let Peter straighten up the bed, after which we went out and I locked the door, for the room was getting on my nerves. I had a short walk and then breakfast, after which I felt more my own man, and so returned to the gray room and, with Peter's help, and one of the maids, I had everything taken out of the room except the bed, even the very pictures. I examined the walls, floor, and ceiling then, with probe, hammer, and magnifying glass, but found nothing suspicious. 
and I can assure you I began to realize, in very truth, that some incredible thing had been loose in the room during the past night. I sealed everything up again and went out, locking and sealing the door as before. After dinner, Peter and I unpacked some of my stuff, and I fixed up my camera and flashlight opposite to the door of the gray room, with a string from the trigger of the flashlight to the door. Then, you see, if the door were really opened, the flashlight would blare out, and there would be, possibly, a very queer picture to examine in the morning. The last thing I did, before leaving, was to uncap the lens, and after that I went off to my bedroom and to bed, for I intended to be up at midnight, and to ensure this I set my little alarm to call me, also I left my candle burning. The clock woke me at twelve, and I got up and into my dressing gown and slippers. I shoved my revolver into my right side pocket and opened the door. Then I lit my dark room lamp and withdrew the slide so that it would give a clear light. I carried it up the corridor about thirty feet and put it down on the floor with the open side away from me so that it would show me everything that might approach along the dark passage. Then I went back and sat in the doorway of my room with my revolver handy, staring up the passage towards the place where I knew my camera stood outside the door of the gray room. I should think I had watched for about an hour and a half when, suddenly, I heard a faint noise away up the corridor. I was immediately conscious of a queer prickling sensation about the back of my head, and my hands began to sweat a little. The following instant, the whole end of the passage flicked into sight in the abrupt glare of the flashlight. There came the succeeding darkness, and I peered nervously up the corridor, listening tensely, and trying to find what lay beyond the faint glow of my dark lamp, which now seemed ridiculously dim by contrast with the tremendous blaze of the flash power. And then, as I stooped forward, staring and listening, there came the crashing thud of the door of the gray room. The sound seemed to fill the whole of the large corridor, and go echoing hollowly through the house. I tell you I felt horrible, as if my bones were water, simply beastly. Jove, how I did stare, and how I listened! And then it came again, thud, 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 and then a silence that was almost worse than the noise of the door, for I kept fancying that some awful thing was stealing upon me along the corridor. And then, suddenly, my lamp was put out, and I could see not a yard before me. I realized all at once that I was doing a very silly thing sitting there, and I jumped up. Even as I did so, I thought I heard a sound in the passage, and quite near me. I made one backward spring into my room and slammed and locked the door. I had my revolver in my hand, but it seemed an abominably useless thing. I felt that there was something the other side of that door. For some unknown reason I knew it was pressed up against the door, and it was soft. That was just what I thought. Most extraordinary thing to think. Presently I got hold of myself a bit, and marked out a pentacle hurriedly with chalk on the polished floor, and there I sat in it almost until dawn. And all the time, away up the corridor, the door of the gray room thudded at solemn and horrid intervals. It was a miserable, brutal night. When the day began to break, the thudding of the door came gradually to an end, and, at last, I got hold of my courage and went along the corridor in the half-light to cap the lens of my camera. I can tell you it took some doing, but if I had not done so my photograph would have been spoiled, and I was tremendously keen to save it. I got back to my room and then set to and rubbed out the five-pointed star in which I had been sitting. Half an hour later there was a tap at my door. It was Peter with my coffee. When I had drunk it, we both went along to the gray room. As we went, I had a look at the seals on the other doors, but they were untouched. The seal on the door of the gray room was broken, as also was the string from the trigger of the flashlight, but the card over the keyhole was still there. I ripped it off and opened the door. Nothing unusual was to be seen until we came to the bed. Then I saw that, as on the previous day, the bedclothes had been torn off and hurled into the left-hand corner, exactly where I had seen them before. I felt very queer, but I did not forget to look at all the seals, only to find that not one had been broken. Then I turned and looked at old Peter, and he looked at me, nodding his head. Let's get out of here, I said. It's no place for any living human to enter without proper protection. 
We went out then, and I locked and sealed the door again. After breakfast I developed the negative, but it showed only the door of the gray room half opened. Then I left the house, as I wanted to get certain matters and implements that might be necessary to life, perhaps to the spirit, for I intended to spend the coming night in the gray room. I got back in a cab about half-past five with my apparatus, and this Peter and I carried up to the gray room, where I piled it carefully in the center of the floor. When everything was in the room, including a cat which I had brought, I locked and sealed the door and went towards the bedroom, telling Peter I should not be down for dinner. He said, Yes, sir, and went downstairs, thinking that I was going to turn in, which was what I wanted him to believe, as I knew he would have worried both me and himself if he had known what I intended. But I merely got my camera and flashlight from my bedroom and hurried back to the gray room. I locked and sealed myself in and set to work, for I had a lot to do before it got dark. First I cleared away all the ribbons across the floor, then I carried the cat, still fastened in his basket, over towards the far wall and left it. I returned then to the center of the room and measured out a space twenty-one feet in diameter, which I swept with a broom of hyssop. About this I drew a circle of chalk, taking care never to step over the circle. Beyond this I smudged, with a bunch of garlic, a broad belt right around the chalked circle. And when this was complete, I took from among my stores in the center a small jar of a certain water. I broke away the parchment and withdrew the stopper. Then, dipping my left forefinger in the little jar, I went round the circle again, making upon the floor, just within the line of chalk, the second sign of the Sama ritual, and joining each sign most carefully with the left-hand crescent. I can tell you I felt easier when this was done, and the water circle complete. Then I unpacked some more of the stuff that I had brought, and placed a lighted candle in the valley of each crescent. After that I drew a pentacle so that each of the five points of the defensive star touched the chalk circle. In the five points of the star I placed five portions of the bread, each wrapped in linen, and in the five veils five opened jars of the water I had used to make the water circle. And now I had my first protective barrier complete. Now anyone, except you who know something of my methods of investigation, might consider all this a piece of useless and foolish superstition, but you all remember the Black Veil case, in which I believe my life was saved by a very similar form of protection, whilst Astor, who sneered at it, and would not come inside, died. I got the idea from Sigsend, M.S., written, so far as I can make out, in the fourteenth century. At first, naturally, I imagined it was just an expression of the superstition of his time, and it was not until a year later that it occurred to me to test his defense, which I did, as I've just said, in that horrible black veil business. You know how that turned out. Later I used it several times, and always I came through safe until that moving fur case. It was only a partial defense, therefore, and I nearly died in the pentacle. After that I came across Professor Garder's experiments with a medium. When they surrounded the medium with a current in vacuum, he lost his power, almost as if it cut him off from the immaterial. That made me think a lot, and that is how I came to make the electric pentacle, which is a most marvelous defense against certain manifestations. I used the shape of the defensive star for this protection, because I have, personally, no doubt at all, but that there is some extraordinary value in the old magic figure. Curious thing for a twentieth-century man to admit, is it not? But then, as you all know, I never did, and never will, allow myself to be blinded by the little cheap laughter. I ask questions, and keep my eyes open. In this last case I had little doubt that I had run up against a supernatural monster, and I meant to take every possible care, for the danger is abominable. I turn to now to fit the electric pentacle, setting it so that each of its points and veils coincided exactly with the points and veils of the drawn pentagram upon the floor. Then I connected up the battery, and the next instant 
the pale blue glare from the intertwining vacuum tubes shone out. I glanced about me then, with something of a sigh of relief, and realized suddenly that the dusk was upon me, for the window was gray and unfriendly. Then round at the big empty room, over the double barrier of electric and candlelight, I had an abrupt, extraordinary sense of weirdness thrust upon me. In the air, you know, as it were, a sense of something inhuman impending. The room was full of the stench of bruised garlic, a smell I hate. I turned now to the camera, and saw that it and the flashlight were in order. Then I tested my revolver, carefully, though I had little thought that it would be needed. Yet, to what extent materialization of an abnatural creature is possible, given favorable conditions, no one can say, and I had no idea what horrible thing I was going to see, or feel the presence of. I might, in the end, have to fight with a materialized monster. I did not know, and could only be prepared. You see, I never forgot that three other people had been strangled in the bed close to me, and the fierce slamming of the door I had heard myself. I had no doubt that I was investigating a dangerous and ugly case. By this time the night had come, though the room was very light with the burning candles, and I found myself glancing behind me, constantly, and then all around the room. It was nervy work waiting for that thing to come. Then, suddenly, I was aware of a little cold wind sweeping over me, coming from behind. I gave one great nerve thrill, and a prickly feeling went all over the back of my head. Then I hove myself round with a sort of stiff jerk and stared straight against that queer wind. It seemed to come from the corner of the room to the left of the bed, the place where both times I had found the heap of tossed bedclothes. Yet I could see nothing unusual, no opening, nothing. Abruptly I was aware that the candles were all a flicker in that unnatural wind. I believe I just squatted there and stared in a horribly frightened, wooden way for some minutes. I shall never be able to let you know how disgustingly horrible it was sitting in that vile, cold wind. And then, flick, 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 all the candles round the outer barrier went out, and there was I, locked and sealed in that room, and with no light beyond the weakish blue glare of the electric pentacle. A time of abominable tenseness passed, and still that wind blew upon me. And then, suddenly, I knew that something stirred in the corner to the left of the bed. I was made conscious of it, rather by some inward, unused sense than by either sight or sound, for the pale, short-radius glare of the pentacle gave but a very poor sight for seeing by. Yet, as I stared, something began slowly to grow upon my sight, a moving shadow, a little darker than the surrounding shadows. I lost the thing amid the vagueness, and for a moment or two I glanced swiftly from side to side, with a fresh new sense of impending danger. Then my attention was directed to the bed. All the coverings were being drawn steadily off, with a hateful, stealthy sort of motion. I heard the slow, dragging slither of the clothes, but I could see nothing of the thing that pulled. I was aware in a funny, subconscious, introspective fashion that the creep had come upon me, yet that I was cooler mentally than I had been for some minutes, sufficiently so to feel that my hands were sweating coldly, and to shift my revolver half-consciously whilst I rubbed my right hand dry upon my knee, though never for an instant taking my gaze or my attention from those moving clothes. The faint noises from the bed ceased once and there was a most intense silence, with only the sound of the blood beating in my head. Yet immediately afterwards I heard again the slurring of the bedclothes being dragged off the bed. In the midst of my nervous tension I remembered the camera, and reached round for it, but without looking away from the bed. And then, you know, all in a moment, the whole of the bed coverings were torn off with extraordinary violence and I heard the flump they made as they were hurled into the corner. There was a time of absolute quietness then for perhaps a couple of minutes, and you can imagine how horrible I felt. The bedclothes had been thrown with such savageness, 
and then again the brutal unnaturalness of the thing that had just been done before me. Abruptly, over by the door, I heard a faint noise, a sort of crickling sound, and then a pitter or two upon the floor. A great nervous thrill swept over me, seeming to run up my spine and over the back of my head, for the seal that secured the door had just been broken. Something was there. I could not see the door. At least, I mean to say that it was impossible to say how much I actually saw, and how much my imagination supplied. I made it out, only as a continuation of the gray walls. And then it seemed to me that something dark and indistinct moved and wavered there among the shadows. Abruptly I was aware that the door was opening, and with an effort I reached again for my camera, but before I could aim it the door was slammed with a terrific crash that filled the whole room with a sort of hollow thunder. I jumped like a frightened child. There seemed such a power behind the noise, as though a vast, wanton force were out. Can you understand? The door was not touched again, but directly afterwards I heard the basket in which the cat lay creak. I tell you I fairly pringled all along my back. I knew that I was going to learn definitely whether whatever was abroad was dangerous to life. From the cat there rose suddenly a hideous caterwaul that ceased abruptly, and then, too late, I snapped off the flashlight. In the great glare I saw that the basket had been overturned, and the lid was wrenched open, with the cat lying half in and half out upon the floor. I saw nothing else, but I was full of the knowledge that I was in the presence of some being or thing that had the power to destroy. During the next two or three minutes there was an odd, noticeable quietness in the room, and you much remember I was half-blinded, for the time, because of the flashlight, so that the whole place seemed to be pitchy dark just beyond the shine of the pentacle. I tell you it was most horrible. I just knelt there in the star and whirled around, trying to see whether anything was coming at me. My power of sight came gradually, and I got a little hold of myself, and abruptly I saw the thing I was looking for, close to the water circle. It was big and indistinct, and wavered curiously, as though the shadow of a vast spider hung suspended in the air just beyond the barrier. It passed swiftly round the circle and seemed to probe ever towards me, but only to draw back with extraordinary jerky movements, as might a living person if they touched the hot bar of a grate. Round and round it moved, and round and round I turned. Then, just opposite to one of the veils in the pentacles, it seemed to pause, as though preliminary to a tremendous effort. It retired almost beyond the glow of the vacuum light, and then came straight towards me, appearing to gather form and solidity as it came. There seemed a vast, malign determination behind the movement that must succeed. I was on my knees and I jerked back, falling onto my left hand and hip in a wild endeavor to get back from the advancing thing. With my right hand I was grabbing madly for my revolver, which I had let slip. The brutal thing came with one great sweep straight over the garlic and the water circle, almost to the veil of the pentacle. I believe I yelled. Then, just as suddenly as it had swept over, it seemed to be hurled back by some mighty, invisible force. It must have been some moments before I realized that I was safe, and then I got myself together in the middle of the pentacles, feeling horribly gone and shaken, and glancing round and round the barrier, but the thing had vanished. Yet I had learned something, for I knew now that the gray room was haunted by a monstrous hand. Suddenly, as I crouched there, I saw what had so nearly given the monster an opening through the barrier. In my movements within the pentacle I must have touched one of the jars of water, for just where the thing had made its attack the jar that guarded the deep of the veil had been moved to one side, and this had left one of the five doorways unguarded. I put it back quickly and felt almost safe again, for I had found the cause and the defense was still good, and I began to hope again that I should see the morning come in. When I saw that thing so nearly succeed, I had an awful, weak, overwhelming feeling that the barriers could never bring me safe through the night against such a force. You can understand? For a long time I could not see the hand, but presently I thought I saw, once or twice, an odd wavering over among the shadows near the door. A 
little later, as though in a sudden fit of malignant rage, the dead body of the cat was picked up and beaten with dull, sickening blows against the solid floor. That made me feel rather queer. A minute afterwards the door was opened and slammed twice with tremendous force. The next instant the thing made one swift, vicious dart at me from out of the shadows. Instinctively I started sideways from it, and so plucked my hand from upon the electric pentacle, where, for a wickedly careless moment, I had placed it. The monster was hurled off from the neighborhood of the pentacles, though, owing to my inconceivable foolishness, it had been enabled for a second time to pass the outer barriers. I can tell you I shook for a time, with sheer funk. I moved right to the center of the pentacles again, and knelt there, making myself as small and compact as possible. As I knelt, there came to me presently a vague wonder at the two accidents which had so nearly allowed the brute to get at me. Was I being influenced to unconscious voluntary actions that endangered me? The thought took hold of me, and I watched my every movement. Abruptly I stretched a tired leg and knocked over one of the jars of water. Some was spilled, but because of my suspicious watchfulness, I had it upright and back within the veil, while yet some of the water remained. Even as I did so, the vast, black, half-materialized hand beat up at me out of the shadows, and seemed to leap almost into my face. So nearly did it approach, but for the third time it was thrown back by some altogether enormous, overmastering force. Yet, apart from the dazed fright in which it left me, I had for a moment that feeling of spiritual sickness, as if some delicate, beautiful inward grace had suffered which is felt only upon the too near approach of the abhuman, and is more dreadful, in a strange way, than any physical pain that can be suffered. I knew by this more of the extent and closeness of the danger, and for a long time I was simply cowed by the butt-headed brutality of that force upon my spirit. I can put it no other way. I knelt again in the center of the pentacles, watching myself with more fear, almost, than the monster, for I knew now that, unless I guarded myself from every sudden impulse that came to me, I might simply work my own destruction. Do you see how horrible it was? I spent the rest of the night in a haze of sick fright, and so tense that I could not make a single movement naturally. I was in such fear that any desire for action that came to me might be prompted by the influence that I knew was at work on me. And outside of the berry that ghastly thing went round and round, grabbing and grabbing in the air at me. Twice more was the body of the dead cat molested. The second time I heard every bone in its body scrunch and crack, and all the time the horrible wind was blowing upon me from the corner of the room to the left of the bed. Then, just as the first touch of dawn came into the sky, that unnatural wind ceased in a single moment, and I could see no sign of the hand. The dawn came slowly, and presently the wan light filled all the room, and made the pale glare of the electric pentacle look more unearthly. Yet, it was not until the day had fully come that I made any attempt to leave the barrier, for I did not know but that there was some method abroad in the sudden stopping of that wind to entice me from the pentacles. At last, when the dawn was strong and bright, I took one last look around and ran for the door. I got it unlocked, in a nervous and clumsy fashion, then locked it hurriedly, and went to my bedroom, where I lay on the bed and tried to steady my nerves. Peter came presently with the coffee, and when I had drunk it, I told him I meant to have a sleep, as I had been up all night. He took the tray and went out quietly, and after I had locked my door I turned in properly, and at last got to sleep. I woke about midday, and after some lunch, went up to the gray room. I switched off the current from the pentacle, which I had left on in my hurry. Also, I removed the body of the cat. You can understand I did not want anyone to see the poor brute. After that, I made a very careful search of the corner where the bedclothes had been thrown. I made several holes and probed, and found nothing. Then it occurred to me to try with my instrument under the skirting. I did so, and heard my wire ring on metal. I turned the hook end that way, and fished for the thing. At the second go, I got it. It was a small object, and I took it to the window. 
I found it to be a curious ring, made of some graying material. The curious thing about it was that it was made in the form of a pentagon, that is, the same shape as the inside of the magic pentacle, but without the mounts which form the points of the defensive star. It was free from all chasing and engraving. You will understand that I was excited when I tell you that I felt sure I held in my hand the famous luck ring of the Anderson family, which indeed was of all things the one most intimately connected with the history of the haunting. This ring was handed on from father to son through generations, and always, in obedience to some ancient family tradition, each son had to promise never to wear the ring. The ring, I may say, was brought home by one of the crusaders under very peculiar circumstances but the story is too long to go into here. It appears that young Sir Hulbert, an ancestor of Anderson's, made a bet, in drink, you know, that he would wear the ring that night. He did so, and in the morning his wife and child were found strangled in the bed, in the very room in which I stood. Many people, it would seem, thought young Sir Hulbert was guilty of having done the thing in drunken anger, and he, in an attempt to prove his innocence, slept a second night in the room, he also was strangled. Since then, as you may imagine, no one has ever spent a night in the Grey Room until I did so. The ring had been lost so long that it had become almost a myth, and it was most extraordinary to stand there with the actual thing in my hand, as you can understand. It was whilst I stood there looking at the ring that I got an idea, supposing that it were, in a way, a doorway. You see what I mean? A sort of gap in the world hedge? It was a queer idea, I know, and probably not my own, but came to me from the outside. You see, the wind had come from that part of the room where the ring lay. I thought a lot about it. Then the shape, the inside of a pentacle. It had no mounts, and without mounts, as the Sigmund M.S. has it, The mounts which are the five hills of safety. To lack is to give power to the demon and surely to favor the evil thing. You see, the very shape of the ring was significant, and I was determined to test it. I unmade the pentacle, for it must be made fresh and around the one to be protected. Then I went out and locked the door, after which I left the house to get certain matters. For neither yarbs nor fire nor water must be used a second time, I returned about 7.30, and as soon as the things I had brought had been carried up to the gray room, I dismissed Peter for the night, just as I had done the evening before. When he had gone downstairs, I let myself into the room, and locked and sealed the door. I went to the place in the center of the room where all the stuff had been packed, and set to work with all my speed to construct a barrier about me and the ring. I do not remember whether I explained it to you, but I had reasoned that, if the ring were in any way a medium of admission, and it were enclosed with me in the electric pentacle, it would be, to express it loosely, insulated, do you see? The force, which had visible expression as a hand, would have to stay beyond the barrier which separates the ab from the normal, for the gateway would be removed from accessibility. As I was saying, I worked with all my speed to get the barrier completed about me and the ring, for it was already later than I cared to be in that room unprotected. Also, I had a feeling that there would be a vast effort made that night to regain the use of the ring, for I had the strongest conviction that the ring was a necessity to materialization. You will see whether I was right. I completed the barriers in about an hour, and you can imagine something of the relief I felt when I felt the pale glare of the electric pentacle once more all about me. From then onwards, for about two hours, I sat quietly, facing the corner from which the wind came. About eleven o'clock a queer knowledge came that something was near to me, yet nothing happened for a whole hour after that. Then, suddenly, I felt the cold, queer wind begin to blow upon me. To my astonishment it seemed now to come from behind me, and I whipped around with a hideous quake of fear. The wind met me in the face. It was blowing up from the floor close to me. I stared down in a sickening maze of new frights. What on earth had I done now? The ring was there, close beside me, where I had put it. Suddenly, as I stared, bewildered, I was aware that there was something queer about the ring. Funny, shadowy movements and convolutions. 
I looked at them stupidly, and then, abruptly, I knew that the wind was blowing up at me from the ring. A queer indistinct smoke became visible to me, seeming to pour upwards through the ring, and mix with the moving shadows. Suddenly I realized that I was in more than any mortal danger, for the convoluting shadows about the ring were taking shape, and the death hand was forming within the pentacle. My goodness, do you realize it? I had brought the gateway into the pentacles, and the brute was coming through, pouring into the material world as gas might pour out from the mouth of a pipe. I should think that I knelt for a moment in a sort of stunned fright. Then, with a mad, awkward movement, I snatched at the ring, intending to hurl it out of the pentacle. Yet it eluded me, as though some invisible living thing jerked it hither and thither. At last I gripped it, yet... In the same instant, it was torn from my grasp with incredible and brutal force. A great black shadow covered it and rose into the air and came at me. I saw that it was the hand, vast and nearly perfect in form. I gave one crazy yell and jumped over the pentacle and the ring of burning candles and ran despairingly for the door. I fumbled idiotically and ineffectually with the key, and all the time I stared with a fear that was like insanity towards the barriers. The hand was plunging towards me, yet, even as it had been unable to pass into the pentacle when the ring was without, so now, that the ring was within, it had no power to pass out. The monster was chained, as surely as any beast would be, where chains were riveted upon it. Even then I got a flash of this knowledge, but I was too utterly shaken with fright to reason, and the instant I managed to get the key turned I sprang into the passage and slammed the door with a crash. I locked it and got to my room somehow, for I was trembling so that I could hardly stand, as you can imagine. I locked myself in, and managed to get the candle lit, and I lay down on my bed, and kept quiet for an hour or two, and so I got steadied. I got a little sleep later, but woke when Peter brought my coffee. When I had drunk it I felt altogether better, and took the old man along with me whilst I had a look into the grey room. I opened the door and peeped in. The candles were still burning, wan against the daylight, and behind them was the pale glowing star of the electric pentacle. And there, in the middle, was the ring, the gateway of the monster, lying demure and ordinary. Nothing in the room was touched, and I knew that the brute had never managed to cross the pentacles. Then I went out and locked the door. After a sleep of some hours, I left the house and returned in the afternoon in a cab. I had with me an oxyhydrogen jet and two cylinders containing the gases. I carried the things into the grey room, and there, in the center of the electric pentacle, I erected a little furnace. Five minutes later the luck ring, once the luck, but now the bane, of the Anderson family, was no more than a little solid splash of hot metal. Karnacki felt in his pocket and pulled out something wrapped in tissue paper. He passed it to me. I opened it and found a small circle of grayish metal, something like lead, only harder and rather brighter. Well, I asked at length, after examining it and handing it round to the others, did that stop the haunting? Karnacki nodded. Yes, he said. I slept three nights in the grey room before I left. Old Peter nearly fainted when he knew that I meant to, but by the third night he seemed to realize that the house was just safe and ordinary, and, you know, I believe in his heart he hardly approved. Karnacki stood up and began to shake hands. Out you go, he said genially, and presently we went, pondering, to our various homes. End of The Gateway of the Monster Chapter 1 of Karnacki the Ghost Finder Chapter 2 The House Among the Laurels This is a curious yarn that I am going to tell you, said Karnacki, as after a quiet little dinner we made ourselves comfortable in his cozy dining room. I have just got back from the west of Ireland, he continued. Wentworth, a friend of mine, has lately had rather an unexpected legacy, in the shape of a large estate and manor, about a mile and a half outside the village of Corentin. This place is named Gannington Manor, and has been empty a great number of years, as you will find is almost always the case with houses reputed to be haunted, as it is usually termed. 
It seems that when Wentworth went over to take possession, he found the place in very poor repair, and the estate totally uncared for, and, as I know, looking very desolate and lonesome generally. He went through the big house by himself, and he admitted to me that it had an uncomfortable feeling about it. But, of course, that might be nothing more than the natural dismalness of a big empty house, which has been long uninhabited, and through which you are wandering alone. When he had finished his look round, he went down to the village, meaning to see the one-time agent of the estate, and arrange for someone to go in as caretaker. The agent, who proved, by the way, to be a Scotchman, was very willing to take up the management of the estate once more, but he assured Wentworth that they would get no one to go in as caretaker, and that his, the agent's, advice was to have the house pulled down and a new one built. This naturally astonished my friend, and as they went down to the village, he managed to get a sort of explanation from the man. It seems that there had been always curious stories told about the place, which in the early days was called Landrew Castle, and that within the last seven years there had been two extraordinary deaths there. In each case they had been tramps, who were ignorant of the reputation of the house, and had probably thought the big empty place suitable for a night's free lodging. There had been absolutely no signs of violence to indicate the method by which death was caused, and on each occasion the body had been found in the great entrance hall. By this time they had reached the inn where Wentworth had put up, and he told the agent that he would prove that it was all rubbish about the haunting by staying a night or two in the manor himself. The death of the tramps was certainly curious, but did not prove that any supernatural agency had been at work. They were but isolated accidents, spread over a large number of years by the memory of the villagers, which was natural enough in a little place like Corunton. Tramps had to die sometime, and in some place, and it proved nothing that two out of possibly hundreds who had slept in the empty house had happened to take the opportunity to die under shelter. But the agent took his remark very seriously, and both he and Dennis, the landlord of the inn, tried their best to persuade him not to go. For his soul's sake, Irish Dennis begged him to do no such thing, and because of his life's sake, the Scotchman was equally in earnest. It was late afternoon at the time, and as Wentworth told me, it was warm and bright, and seemed such utter rot to hear those two talking seriously about the impossible. He felt full of pluck, and he made up his mind he would smash the story of the haunting at once by staying that very night in the manor. He made this quite clear to them, and told them that it would be more to the point, and to their credit, if they offered to come up along with him and keep him company. But poor old Dennis was quite shocked, I believe, at the suggestion, and though Tabbot, the agent, took it more quietly, he was very solemn about it. It seems that Wentworth did go, and though, as he said to me, when the evening began to come on, it seemed a very different sort of thing to tackle. A whole crowd of the villagers assembled to see him off, for by this time they all knew of his intention. Wentworth had his gun with him and a big packet of candles, and he made it clear to them all that it would not be wise for anyone to play any tricks, as he intended to shoot at sight. And then, you know, he got a hint of how serious they considered the whole thing, for one of them came up to him, leading a great bull mastiff, and offered it to him, to take to keep him company. Wentworth patted his gun, but the old man who owned the dog shook his head and explained that the brute might warn him in sufficient time for him to get away from the castle, for it was obvious that he did not consider the gun would prove of any use. Wentworth took the dog and thanked the man. He told me that already he was beginning to wish that he had not said definitely that he would go, but as it was, he was simply forced to. He went through the crowd of men and found suddenly that they had all turned in a body and were keeping him company. They stayed with him all the way to the manor and then went right over the whole place with him. It was still daylight when this was finished, though turning to dusk, and for a while the men stood about, hesitating, as if they felt ashamed to go away and leave Wentworth there all alone. He told me that, by this time, he would gladly have given fifty pounds to be going back with them. And then, abruptly, an idea came to him. He suggested that they should stay with him and keep him company through the night. For a time they refused and tried to persuade him to go back with them. But finally he made a proposition that got home to them all. He planned that they should all go back to the inn, and there get a couple of dozen bottles of whiskey, a donkey load of turf and wood, and some more candles. 
Then they would come back and make a great fire in the big fireplace, light all the candles, and put them round the place, open the whiskey, and make a night of it. And by Jove, he got them to agree. They set off back and were soon at the inn, and here, whilst the donkey was being loaded and the candles and whiskey distributed, Dennis was doing his best to keep Wentworth from going back. But he was a sensible man in his way, for when he found that it was no use, he stopped. You see, he did not want to frighten the others from accompanying Wentworth. I tell you, sir, he told him, tis of no use at all therein to reclaim the castle. Tis cursed with innocent blood, and you'll be better off pulling it down and building a fine new one. But if you be intending to stay the night, keep the big door open wide and watch for the blood drip. If so much as a single drip falls, don't stay though all the gold in the world be offered ye. Wentworth asked him what he meant by the blood drip. Sure, he said, tis the blood of them as old Black Mick way back in the old days kilt in their sleep. Twas a feud as he pretended to patch up, and he invited them, the O'Hara's they was, seventy of them, and he fed them and spoke soft to them, and them thrust in him, stayed to sleep with him. Then he and them with him started in and a murdered them as they was all as they was sleeping. Tis from me father's grandfather's you have the story, and since then tis death to any, so they say, to pass the night in the castle when the blood drip comes. Twill put out candle and fire, and then in the darkness the virgin herself would be powerless to protect thee. Wentworth told me he laughed at this, chiefly because, as he put it, one must always laugh at that sort of yarn, however it makes you feel inside. He asked old Dennis whether he expected him to believe him. Yes, sir, said Dennis. I do mean you to believe it, and please God, if you believe, you may be back safe before morning. The man's serious simplicity took hold of Wentworth, and he held out his hand. But for all that, he went, and I must admire his pluck. There were now about forty men, and when they got back to the manor, or castle as the villagers always call it, they were not long in getting a big fire going and lighted candles all round the great hall. They had all brought sticks, so that they would have been a pretty formidable lot to tackle by anything simply physical, and of course Wentworth had his gun. He kept the whiskey in his own charge, for he intended to keep them sober, but he gave them a good strong tot all round first, so as to make things seem cheerful and to get them yearning. If you once let a crowd of men like that grow silent, they begin to think, and then to fancy things. The big entrance door had been left wide open by his orders, which shows that he had taken some notice of Dennis. It was a quiet night, so this did not matter, for the lights kept steady, and all went on in a jolly sort of fashion for about three hours. He had opened a second lot of bottles, and everyone was feeling cheerful, so much so that one of the men called out aloud to the ghosts to come and show themselves. And then, you know, a very extraordinary thing happened, for the ponderous main door swung quietly and steadily to, as though pushed by an invisible hand, and shut with a sharp click. Wentworth stared, feeling suddenly rather chilly. Then he remembered the men and looked round at them. Several had ceased their talk and were staring in a frightened way at the big door, but the great number had never noticed and were talking and yarning. He reached for his gun, and the following instant the great bullmastiff set up a tremendous barking, which drew the attention of the whole company. The hall, I should tell you, is oblong. The south wall is all windows, but the north and east have rows of doors leading into the house, whilst the west wall is occupied by the great entrance. The rows of doors leading into the house were all closed, and it was toward one of these in the north wall that the big dog ran. Yet he would not get very close and suddenly the door began to move slowly open until the blackness of the passage beyond was shown. The dog came back among the men, whimpering, and for a minute there was an absolute silence. Then Wentworth went out from the men a little and aimed his gun at the doorway. "'Whoever's there, come out, or I shall fire!' he shouted. But nothing came, and he blazed forth both barrels into the dark. As though the report had been a signal, all the doors along the north and east walls moved slowly open, and Wentworth and his men were staring, frightened, into the black shapes of the empty doorways. Wentworth loaded his gun quickly and called to the dog, but the brute was burrowing away in among the men, 
and this fear on the dog's part frightened Wentworth more, he told me, than anything. Then something else happened. Three of the candles over in the corner of the hall went out, and immediately about half a dozen in different parts of the place. More candles were put out, and the hall had become quite dark in the corners. The men were all standing now, holding their clubs and crowded together, and to no one said a word. Wentworth told me he felt positively ill with fright. I know the feeling. Then, suddenly, something splashed onto the back of his left hand. He lifted it and looked. It was covered with a great splash of red that dripped from his fingers. An old Irishman near to him saw it and croaked out in a quavering voice, The blood drip! When the old man called out, they all looked, and in the same instant others felt it upon them. There were frightened cries of, The blood drip! The blood drip! And then about a dozen candles went out simultaneously, and the hall was suddenly dark. The dog let out a great mournful howl, and there was a horrible little silence, with everyone standing rigid. Then the tension broke, and there was a mad rush for the main door. They wrenched it open and tumbled out into the dark, but something slammed it with a crash after them and shut the dog in, for Wentworth heard it howling as they raced down the drive. Yet no one had the pluck to go back and let it out, which does not surprise me. Wentworth sent for me the following day. He had heard of me in connection with that steeple monster case. I arrived by the night mail and put up with Wentworth at the inn. The next day we went up to the old manor, which lies in rather a wilderness, though what struck me most was the extraordinary number of laurel bushes about the house. The place was smothered with them, so that the house seemed to be growing up out of a sea of green laurel. These, and the grim, ancient look of the old building, made the place look a bit dank and ghostly, even by daylight. The hall was a big place, and well lit by daylight, for which I was not sorry. You see, I had been rather wound up by Wentworth's yarn. We found one rather funny thing, and that was the great bull mastiff lying stiff with its neck broken. This made me feel very serious, for it showed that whether the case was supernatural or not, there was present in the house some force exceedingly dangerous to life. Later, whilst Wentworth stood guard with a shotgun, I made an examination of the hall. The bottles and mugs from which the men had drunk their whiskey were scattered about, and all over the place were the candles, stuck upright in their own grease. But in the somewhat brief and general search, I found nothing, and decided to begin my usual exact examination of every square foot of the place, not only of the hall, in this case, but of the whole interior of the castle. I spent three uncomfortable weeks searching, but without result of any kind. And, you know, the care I take at this period is extreme, for I have solved hundreds of cases of so-called hauntings at this early stage simply by the most minute investigation and the keeping of a perfectly open mind. But, as I said, I found nothing. During the whole of the examination, I got Wentworth to stand guard with his loaded shotgun, and I was very particular that we were never caught there after dusk. I decided now to make the experiment of staying a night in the great house, of course protected. I spoke about it to Wentworth, but his own attempt had made him so nervous that he begged me to do no such thing. However, I thought it well worth the risk, and I managed in the end to persuade him to be present. With this in view, I went to the neighboring town of Gaunt, and by an arrangement with the chief constable, I obtained the services of six policemen with their rifles. The arrangement was unofficial, of course, and the men were allowed to volunteer, with a promise of payment. When the constables arrived early that evening at the inn, I gave them a good feed, and after that we all set out for the manor. We had four donkeys with us, loaded with fuel and other matters, also two great boarhounds, which one of the police led. When we reached the house, I set the men to unload the donkeys, whilst Wentworth and I set to and sealed all the doors, except the main entrance, with wax and tape, for if the doors were really opened, I was going to be sure of the fact. I was going to run no risk of being deceived by ghostly hallucination or mesmeric influence. By the time that this was done, the policemen had unloaded the donkeys and were waiting, looking about them curiously. I set two of them to lay a fire in the big grate, and the others I used as I required them. I took one of the boarhounds to the end of the hall furthest from the entrance, and there I drove a staple into the floor to which I tied the dog with a short tether. 
Then round him I drew upon the floor the figure of a pentacle in chalk. Outside of the pentacle I made a circle with garlic. I did exactly the same thing with the other hound, but over more in the northeast corner of the big hall, where the two rows of doors make the angle. When this was done I cleared the whole center of the hall and put one of the policemen to sweep it, after which I had all my apparatus carried into the cleared space. Then I went over to the main door and hooked it open, so that the hook would have to be lifted out of the house before the door could be closed. After that I placed lighted candles before each of the sealed doors and one in each corner of the big room, and then I lit the fire. When I saw that it was properly alight, I got all of the men together, by the pile of things in the center of the room, and I took their pipes from them. For as the Sigsand manuscript has it, there must no light come from within the barrier, and I was going to make sure. I got my tape measure then, and measured out a circle thirty-three feet in diameter, and immediately chalked it out. The police and Wentworth were tremendously interested, and I took the opportunity to warn them that this was no piece of silly mumming on my part, but done with a definite intention of erecting a barrier between us and any abhuman thing that the night might show to us. I warned them that, as they valued their lives, and more than their lives it might be, no one must on any account whatsoever to pass beyond the limits of the barrier that I was making. After I had drawn the circle, I took a bunch of the garlic and smudged it right round the chalk circle, a little outside of it. When this was complete, I called for candles from my stock of material. I set the police to lighting them, and, as they were lit, I took them and sealed them down to the floor, just within the chalk circle, five inches apart. As each candle measured approximately one inch in diameter, it took sixty-six candles to complete the circle, and I need hardly say that every number and measurement has a significance. Then, from candle to candle, I took a gerd of human hair, entwining it alternately to the left and to the right, until the circle was completed, and the ends of the hair shod with silver and pressed into the wax of the sixty-sixth candle. It had now been dark some time, and I made haste to get the defense complete. To this end I got the men well together and began to fit the electric pentacle right around us, so that the five points of the defensive star came just within the hair circle. This did not take me long, and a minute later I had connected up the batteries and the weak blue glare of the intertwining vacuum tube shone all around us. I felt happier then, for this pentacle is, as you all know, a wonderful defense. I have told you before how the idea came to me after reading Professor Gardner's Experiments with a Medium. He found that a current of a certain number of vibrations in vacuo insulated the medium. It is difficult to suggest an explanation non-technically, and if you are really interested, you should read Carter's lecture on astral vibrations compared with material involuted vibrations below the six billion limit. As I stood up from my work, I could hear outside in the night a constant drip from the laurels, which, as I have said, come right up around the house, very thick. By the sound I knew that a soft rain had set in, and there was absolutely no wind, as I could tell by the steady flames of the candles. I stood a moment or two listening, and then one of the men touched my arm and asked me in a low voice what they should do. By his tone I could tell that he was feeling something of the strangeness of it all, and the other men, including Wentworth, were so quiet that I was afraid they were beginning to get shaky. I set to then and arranged them with their backs to one common center, so that they were sitting flat upon the floor with their feet radiating outward. Then, by compass, I laid their legs to the eight chief points, and afterward I drew a circle with chalk around them, and opposite to their feet I made the eight signs of the Sa'ama ritual. The eighth place was, of course, empty, but ready for me to occupy at any moment, for I had admitted to make the sealing sign at that point, until I had finished all my preparations and could enter the inner star. I took a last look round the great hall and saw that the two big hounds were lying quietly with their noses between their paws. The fire was big and cheerful, and the candles before the two rows of doors burnt steadily, as well as the solitary ones in the corners. Then I went round the little star of men and warned them not to be frightened whatever happened, but to trust to the defense, and to let nothing tempt or drive them to cross the barriers. Also I told them to watch their movements and to keep their feet strictly to their places. For the rest there was to be no shooting unless I gave the word. And now at last I went to my place, and sitting down, made the eighth sign just beyond my feet. 
Then I arranged my camera and flashlight handy and examined my revolver. Wentworth sat behind the first sign, and as the numbering went round reversed, that put him next to me on my left. I asked him, in a low voice, how he felt, and he told me, rather nervous, but that he had confidence in my knowledge, and was resolved to go through with the matter, whatever happened. We settled down to wait. There was no talking, except that, once or twice, the police bent toward one another and whispered odd remarks concerning the hall that appeared queerly audible in the intense silence. But in a while there was not even a whisper from anyone, and only the monotonous drip, drip of the quiet rain without the great entrance, and the low, dull sound of the fire in the big fireplace. It was a queer group that we made sitting there, back to back, with our legs starred outward, and all around us the strange blue glow of the pentacle, and beyond that the brilliant shining of the great ring of lighted candles. Outside of the glare of the candles, the large empty hall looked a little gloomy by contrast, except where the light shone before the sealed doors, and the blaze of the big fire made a good honest mass of flame. And the feeling of mystery. Can you picture it all? It might have been an hour later that it came to me suddenly that I was aware of an extraordinary sense of dreeness, as it were, come into the air of the place. Not the nervous feeling of mystery that had been with us all the time, but a new feeling, as if there were something going to happen any moment. Abruptly there came a slight noise from the east end of the hall, and I felt the star of men move suddenly. Steady! Keep steady! I shouted, and they quieted. I looked up the hall and saw that the dogs were upon their feet and staring in an extraordinary fashion toward the great entrance. I turned and stared also and felt the men move as they craned their heads to look. Suddenly the dogs set up a tremendous barking and I glanced across to them and found that they were still pointing for the great doorway. They ceased their noise just as quickly and seemed to be listening. In the same instant I heard a faint chink of metal to my left that set me staring at the hook which held the great door wide. It moved, even as I looked. Some invisible thing was meddling with it. A queer, sickening thrill went through me, and I felt all the men about me stiffen and go rigid with intensity. I had a certainty of something impending, as it might be the impression of an invisible but overwhelming presence. The hall was full of a queer silence, and not a sound came from the dogs. Then I saw the hook slowly raised out of its hasp, without any visible thing touching it. Then a sudden power of movement came to me. I raised my camera with a flashlight fixed, and snapped it at the door. There came the great blare of the flashlight, and a simultaneous roar of barking from the two dogs. The intensity of the flash made all the place seem dark for some moments, and in that time of darkness I heard a jingle in the direction of the door, and strained to look. The effect of the bright light passed, and I could see clearly again. The great entrance door was being slowly closed. It shut with a sharp snick, and there followed a long silence, broken only by the whimpering of the dogs. I turned suddenly and looked at Wentworth. He was looking at me. "'Just as it did before,' he whispered. "'Most extraordinary,' I said, and he nodded and looked round nervously. The policemen were pretty quiet, and I judged that they were feeling rather worse than Wentworth, though, for that matter, you must not think that I was altogether natural. Yet I have seen so much that is extraordinary that I dare say I can keep my nerves steady longer than most people. I looked over my shoulder at the men, and cautioned them, in a low voice, not to move outside the barriers, whatever happened, not even though the house should seem to be rocking and about to tumble onto them for well I knew what some of the great forces were capable of doing. Yet, unless it should prove to be one of the cases of the more terrible Saiti manifestation, we were almost certainly of safety, so long as we kept to our order within the pentacle. Perhaps an hour and a half passed, quietly, except when, once in a while, the dogs would whine distrustfully. Presently, however, they ceased even from this, and I could see them lying on the floor with their paws over their noses in a most peculiar fashion and shivering visibly. The sight made me feel more serious, as you can understand. Suddenly, the candle in the corner furthest from the main door went out. An instant later, Wentworth jerked my arm, and I saw that the candle before one of the sealed doors had been put out. I held my camera ready. Then, 
One after another, every candle about the hall was put out, and with such speed and irregularity that I could never catch one in the actual act of being extinguished. Yet for all that, I took a flashlight of the hall in general. There was a time in which I sat half-blinded by the great glare of the flash, and I blamed myself for not having remembered to bring a pair of smoked goggles, which I have sometimes used at these times. I had felt the men jump at the sudden light, and I called out loud to them to sit quiet, and to keep their feet exactly in their proper places. My voice, as you can imagine, sounded rather horrid and frightening in the great room, and altogether it was a beastly moment. Then I was able to see again, and I stared here and there about the hall, but there was nothing showing unusual, only, of course, it was dark now over in the corners. Suddenly I saw that the great fire was blackening. It was going out visibly as I looked. If I said that some monstrous, invisible, impossible creature sucked the life from it, I could best explain the way the light and flame went out of it. It was most extraordinary to watch. In the time that I watched it, every vestige of fire was gone from it, and there was no light outside the ring of candles around the pentacle. The deliberateness of the thing troubled me more than I can make clear to you. It conveyed to me such a sense of a calm, deliberate force present in the hall. The steadfast intention to make a darkness was horrible. The extent of the power to affect the material was now the one constant anxious questioning in my brain. You can understand. Behind me I heard the men moving again, and I knew that they were getting thoroughly frightened. I turned half round and told them quietly but plainly that they were safe only so long as they stayed within the pentacle in the position in which I had put them. If they once broke and went outside the barrier, no knowledge of mine could state the full extent of the dreadfulness of the danger. I steadied them up by this quiet, straight reminder, but if they had known, as I knew, that there is no certainty in any protection, they would have suffered a great deal more, and probably have broken the defense, and made a mad, foolish run for an impossible safety. Another hour passed after this in an absolute quietness. I had a sense of awful strain and oppression, as if I were a little spirit in the company of some invisible, brooding monster of the unseen world, who, as yet, was scarcely conscious of us. I leant across to Wentworth and asked him in a whisper whether he had a feeling as if something were in the room. He looked very pale, and his eyes kept always on the move. He glanced just once at me and nodded, then stared away round the hall again, and when I came to think, I was doing the same thing. Abruptly, as though a hundred unseen hands had snuffed them, every candle in the barrier went dead out, and we were left in a darkness that seemed, for little, absolute, for the light from the pentacle was too weak and pale to penetrate far across the great hall. I tell you, for a moment I just sat there as though I had been frozen solid. I felt the creep go all over me, and seemed to stop in my brain. I felt all at once to be given a power of hearing that was far beyond the normal. I could hear my own heart thudding most extraordinarily loud. I began, however, to feel better after a while, but I simply had not the pluck to move. You can understand. Presently I began to get my courage back. I gripped at my camera and flashlight and waited. My hands were simply soaked with sweat. I glanced once at Wentworth. I could see him only dimly. His shoulders were hunched a little, his head forward, but though it was motionless, I knew that his eyes were not. It is queer how one knows that sort of thing at times. The police were just as silent. And thus a while passed. A sudden sound broke across the silence. From two sides of the room there came faint noises. I recognized them at once as the breaking of the sealing wax. The sealed doors were opening. I raised the camera and flashlight, and it was a peculiar mixture of fear and courage that helped me to press the button. As the great flare of light lit up the hall, I felt the men all about me jump. The darkness fell like a clap of thunder, if you can understand, and seemed tenfold. Yet, in the moment of brightness, I had seen that all the sealed doors were wide open. Suddenly, all around us, there sounded a drip drip, drip upon the floor of the great hall. I thrilled with a queer, realizing emotion, 
and a sense of a very real and present danger, imminent. The blood drip had commenced, and the grim question was now whether the barriers could save us from whatever had come into the huge room. Through some awful minutes the blood drip continued to fall in an increasing rain, and presently some began to fall within the barriers. I saw several great drops splash and star upon the pale glowing intertwining tubes of the electric pentacle, but strangely enough I could not trace that any fell among us. Beyond the strange, horrible noise of the drip there was no other sound. And then abruptly from the boarhound over in the far corner there came a terrible yelling howl of agony, followed instantly by a sickening breaking noise and an immediate silence. If you have ever, when out shooting, broken a rabbit's neck, you will know the sound in miniature. Like lightning, the thought sprang into my brain, It has crossed the pinnacle, for you will remember that I had made one about each of the dogs. I thought instantly, with a sick apprehension, of our own barriers. There was something in the hall with us that had passed the barrier of the pentacle about one of the dogs. In the awful succeeding silence I positively quivered, and suddenly one of the men behind me gave out a scream, like any woman, and bolted for the door. He fumbled and had it open in a moment. I yelled to the others not to move, but they followed like sheep, and I heard them kick the candles flying in their panic. One of them stepped on the electric pentacle and smashed it, and there was utter darkness. In an instant I realized that I was defenseless against the powers of the unknown world, and with one savage leap I was out of the useless barriers and instantly through the great doorway and into the night. I believe I yelled with sheer funk. The men were a little ahead of me, and I never ceased running, and neither did they. Sometimes I glanced back over my shoulder, and I kept glancing into the laurels which grew all along the drive. The beastly things kept rustling, rustling in a hollow sort of way, as though something were keeping parallel with me among them. The rain had stopped, and a dismal little wind kept moaning through the grounds. It was disgusting. I caught Wentworth and the police at the lodge gate. We got outside and ran all the way to the village. We found old Dennis up, waiting for us, and half the villagers to keep him company. He told us that he had known in his soul that we should come back, that is, if we came back at all, which is not a bad rendering of his remark. Fortunately, I had brought my camera away from the house, possibly because the strap had happened to be over my head. Yet I did not go straight away to develop, but sat with the rest of the bar, where we talked for some hours, trying to be coherent about the whole horrible business. Later, however, I went up to my room and proceeded with my photography. I was steadier now, and it was just possible, so I hoped, that the negatives might show something. On two of the plates I found nothing unusual, but on the third, which was the first one that I snapped, I saw something which made me quite excited. I examined it very carefully with a magnifying glass, then I put it to wash and slipped a pair of rubber overshoes over my boots. The negative had showed me something very extraordinary, and I had made up my mind to test the truth of what it seemed to indicate without losing another moment. It was no use telling anything to Wentworth and the police, until I was certain, and also I believed that I stood a greater chance to succeed by myself, though, for that matter, I do not suppose anything would have taken them up to the manor again that night. I took my revolver and went quietly downstairs and into the dark. The rain had commenced again, but that did not bother me. I walked hard. When I came to the lodge gates, a sudden queer instinct stopped me from going through, and I climbed the wall into the park. I kept away from the drive and approached the building through the dismal dripping laurels. You can imagine how beastly it was. Every time a leaf rustled, I jumped. I made my way round to the back of the big house and got in through a little window which I had taken note of during my search, for, of course, I knew the whole place from roof to cellars. I went silently up the kitchen stairs, fairly quivering with funk, and at the top I went to the left, and then into a long corridor that opened, through one of the doorways we had sealed, into the big hall. I looked up it and saw a faint flicker of light away at the end, and I tiptoed silently toward it, holding my revolver ready. As I came near to the open door I heard men's voices, and then a burst of laughing. I went on, until I could see into the hall. 
There were several men there, all in a group. They were well-dressed, and one, at least, I saw was armed. They were examining my barriers against the supernatural with a good deal of unkind laughter. I never felt such a fool in my life. It was plain to me that they were a gang of men who had made use of the empty manor, perhaps for years, for some purpose of their own. And now that Wentworth was attempting to take possession, they were acting up the traditions of the place, with the view of driving him away and keeping so useful a place still at their disposal. But what they were, I mean, whether coiners, thieves, inventors, or what, I could not imagine. Presently they left the pentacle and gathered round the living boarhound, which seemed curiously quiet, as though it were half-drugged. There was some talk as to whether to let the poor brute live or not, but finally they decided it would be good policy to kill it. I saw two of them force a twisted loop of rope into its mouth, and the two bites of the loop were brought together at the back of the hound's neck. Then a third man thrust a thick walking stick through the two loops. The two men with the rope stooped to hold the dog so that I could not see what was done, but the poor beast gave a sudden, awful howl, and immediately there was a repetition of the uncomfortable breaking sound I had heard earlier in the night, as you will remember. The men stood up and left the dog lying there, quiet enough now, as you may suppose. For my part, I fully appreciated the calculated remorselessness which had decided upon the animal's death, and the cold determination with which it had afterward been executed so neatly. I guessed that a man who might get into the light of these particular men would be likely to come to quite as uncomfortable an ending. A minute later, one of the men called out to the rest that they should shift the wires. One of the men came toward the doorway of the corridor in which I stood, and I ran quickly back into the darkness of the upper end. I saw the man reach up and take something from the top of the door, and I heard the slight ringing jangle of steel wire. When he had gone, I ran back again, and saw the men passing, one after another, through an opening in the stairs, formed by one of the marble steps being raised. When the last man had vanished, the slab that made the step was shut down, and there was no sign of a secret door. It was the seventh step from the bottom, as I took care to count, and a splendid idea, for it was so solid that it did not ring hollow, even to a fairly heavy hammer, as I found later. There is little more to tell. I got out of the house as quickly and quietly as possible, and back to the inn. The police came without any coaxing when they knew the ghosts were normal flesh and blood. We entered the park and the manor in the same way that I had done. Yet, when we tried to open the step, we failed and had finally to smash it. This must have warned the haunters, for when we descended to a secret room which we found at the end of a long and narrow passage in the thickness of the walls, we found no one. The police were horribly disgusted, as you can imagine. But for my part, I did not care either way. I had laid the ghost, as you might say, and that was what I set out to do. I was not particularly afraid of being laughed at by the others, for they had all been thoroughly taken in, and in the end I had scored without their help. We searched right through the secret ways, and found that there was an exit at the end of a long tunnel, which opened in the side of a well out in the grounds. The ceiling of the hall was hollow, and reached by a little secret stairway inside of the big staircase. The blood drip was merely colored water, dropped through the minute crevices of the ornamented ceiling. How the candles and the fire were put out I do not know, for the hunters certainly did not act quite up to tradition, which held that the lights would be put out by the blood drip. Perhaps it was too difficult to direct the fluid without positively squirting it, which might have given the whole thing away. The candles and the fire may possibly have been extinguished by the agency of carbonic acid gas, but how suspended I have no idea. The secret hiding places were, of course, ancient. There was also, did I tell you, a bell which they had rigged up to ring when anyone entered the gates at the end of the drive. If I had not climbed the wall, I should have found nothing for my pains, for the bell would have warned them I had gone in through the gateway. What was on the negative, I asked, with much curiosity? A picture of the fine wire with which they were grappling for the hook that held the entrance door open. They were doing it from one of the crevices in the ceiling. They had evidently made no preparations for lifting the hook. I suppose they never thought that anyone would make use of it, and so they had to improvise a grapple. The wire was too fine to be seen by the amount of light we had in the hall, but the flashlight picked it out. Do you see? 
The opening of the inner doors was managed by wires, as you will have guessed, which they unshipped after use, or else I should soon have found them when I made my search. I think I have now explained everything. The hound was killed, of course, by the men direct. You see, they made the place as dark as possible first. Of course, if I had managed to take a flashlight just at that instant, the whole secret of the haunting would have been exposed. But fate just ordered it the other way. And the tramps, I ask? Oh, you mean the two tramps who were found dead in the manor, said Carnacki. Well, of course it is impossible to be sure one way or the other. Perhaps they happened to find out something and were given a hypodermic. Or it is just as probable that they had come to the time of their dying and just died naturally. It is conceivable that a great many tramps had slept in the old house at one time or another. Carnacki stood up and knocked out his pipe. We rose also and went for our coats and hats. Out you go, said Carnacki genially, using the recognized formula, and we went out onto the embankment and presently through the darkness to our various homes. End of chapter two. Chapter three. The Whistling Room. Carnacki shook a friendly fist at me as I entered, late. Then he opened the door into the dining room and ushered the four of us, Jessop, Arkwright, Taylor, and myself, into dinner. We dined well, as usual, and equally as usual. Carnacki was pretty silent during the meal. At the end, we took our wine and cigars to our usual positions, and Carnacki, having got himself comfortable in his big chair, began without any preliminary. I have just got back from Ireland again, he said, and I thought you chaps would be interested to hear my news. Besides, I fancy I shall see the thing clearer after I have told it all out straight. I must tell you this, though, at the beginning. Up to the present moment I have been utterly and completely stumped. I have tumbled upon one of the most peculiar cases of haunting, or devilment of some sort, that I have come against. Now listen. I have been spending the last few weeks at Iastre Castle, about twenty miles northeast of Galway. I got a letter about a month ago from a Mr. Sid K. Tussock, who, it seemed, had bought the place lately and moved in, only to find that he had bought a very peculiar piece of property. When I got there, he met me at the station, driving a jaunting car, and drove me up to the castle, which, by the way, he called a house shanty. I found out that he was pigging it there with his boy brother and another American, who seemed to be half-servant and half-companion. It seems that all the servants had left the place in a body, as you might say, and now they were managing among themselves, assisted by some day help. The three of them got together a scratch feed, and Tossock told me all about the trouble whilst we were at the table. It was most extraordinary, and different from anything that I have had to do with, though that buzzing case was very queer, too. Tossock began right in the middle of his story. We've got a room in this shanty, he said, which has got a most infernal whistling in it, sort of haunting it. The thing starts any time, you never know when, and it goes on until it frightens you. All the servants have gone, as you know. It's not ordinary whistling, and it isn't the wind. Wait till you hear it. We're all carrying guns, said the boy, and slapped his coat pocket. As bad as that, I said. And the older boy nodded. It may be soft, he replied, but wait till you've heard it. Sometimes I think it's some infernal thing, and the next moment I'm just as sure that someone's playing a trick on me. Why, I asked, what is to be gained? You mean, he said, that people usually have some good reason for playing tricks as elaborate as this. Well, I'll tell you. There's a lady in this province by the name of Miss Donahue who's going to be my wife, this day two months. She's more beautiful than they make em. And so far as I can see, I've just stuck my head into an Irish hornet's nest. There's about a score of hot young Irishmen been courting her these two years gone, and now that I've come along and cut them out, they feel raw against me. Do you begin to understand the possibilities? Yes, I said, perhaps I do in a vague sort of way, but I don't see how all this affects the room. Like this, he said, when I had fixed up with Miss Donahue, I looked out for a place and bought this little house shanty. Afterward, I told her, one evening during dinner, that I had decided to tie up here, and then she asked me whether I wasn't afraid of the whistling room. I told her that it must have been thrown in gratis, as I had heard nothing about it. 
There were some of her men friends present, and I saw a smile go round. I found out, after a bit of questioning, that several people have bought this place during the last twenty-odd years, and it was always on the market again after a trial. Well, the chap started to bait me a bit, and offered to take bets after dinner that I'd not stay six months in the place. I looked once or twice to Miss Donahue, so as to be sure I was getting the note of the talky-talky, but I could see that she didn't take it as a joke at all. Partly, I think, because there was a bit of a sneer in the way the men were tackling me, and partly because she really believes that there is something in this yarn of the whistling room. However, after dinner, I did what I could to even things up with the others. I nailed all their bets and screwed them down hard and safe. I guess some of them are going to be a hard hit unless I lose, which I don't mean to. Well, there you have practically the whole yarn. Not quite, I told him. All I know is that you have bought a castle with a room in it that is in some way queer and that you've been doing some betting. Also, I know that your servants have got frightened and run away. Tell me something about the whistling. Oh, that, said Tassock. That started the second night we were in. I'd had a good look round the room in the daytime, as you can understand, for the talk up at Arlstray, Miss Donahue's place, had made me wonder a bit. But it seems just as usual some of the other rooms in the old wing, only perhaps a bit more lonesome. But that may be only because of the talk about it, you know. The whistling started about ten o'clock on the second night, as I said. Tom and I were in the library when we heard an awfully queer whistling coming along the east corridor. The room is in the east wing, you know. That's that blessed ghost, I said to Tom, and we collared the lamps off the table and went up to have a look. I tell you, even as we dug along the corridor, it took me a bit in the throat. It was so beastly queer. It was a sort of tune, in a way, but more as if a devil or some rotten thing were laughing at you and going to get around at your back. That's how it makes you feel. When we got to the door, we didn't wait, but rushed it open. And then I tell you, the sound of the thing fairly hit me in the face. Tom said he got it the same way, sort of felt stunned and bewildered. We looked all round and soon got so nervous we just cleared out and I locked the door. We come down here and had a stiff peg each. Then we got fit again and began to think we'd been nicely had. So we took sticks and went out into the grounds, thinking, after all, that it must be some of those confounded Irishmen working the ghost trick on us. But there was not a leg stirring. We went back into the house and walked over it and then paid another visit to the room. But we simply couldn't stand it. We fairly ran out and locked the door again. I don't know how to put it into words, but I had a feeling of being up against something that was rottenly dangerous. You know, we've carried our guns ever since. Of course, we had a real turnout of the room next day and the whole house place. We even hunted round the grounds, but there was nothing queer. And now I don't know what to think, except that the sensible part of me tells me that it's some plan of these wild Irishmen to try to take a rise out of me. Done anything since, I asked him. Yes, he said. Watched outside the door of the room at nights and chased round the grounds and sounded the walls and floor of the room. We've done everything we could think of and it's beginning to get in our nerves. So we sent for you. By this time we had finished eating. As we rose from the table, Tassock suddenly called out, Shh! Hark! We were instantly silent, listening. Then I heard it. An extraordinary hooning whistle, monstrous and inhuman, coming from far away through the corridors to my right. By God, said Tassock, and it's scarcely dark yet. Call her those candles, both of you, and come along. In a few moments we were all out of the door and racing up the stairs. Tassock turned into a long corridor and we followed, shielding our candles as we ran. The sound seemed to fill all the passage as we drew near, until I had the feeling that the whole air throbbed under the power of some wanton, immense force, a sense of an actual taint, as you might say, of monstrosity all about us. Tassock unlocked the door, then, giving it a push with his foot, jumped back and drew his revolver. As the door flew open, the sound beat out at us, with an effect impossible to explain to one who has not heard it, with a certain horrible personal note in it, 
as if in there in the darkness you could picture the room rocking and creaking in a mad vile glee to its own filthy piping and whistling and hooning to stand there and listen was to be stunned by realization it was as if someone showed you the mouth of a vast pit suddenly and said that's hell and you knew that they had spoken the truth do you get it even a little bit I stepped back a pace into the room and held the candle over my head and looked quickly round. Tassock and his brother joined me and the man came up at the back and we all held our candles high. I was deafened by the shrill piping hoon of the whistling and then clear in my ear something seemed to be saying to me, Get out of here! Quick! 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 As you chaps know, I never neglect that sort of thing. Sometimes it may be nothing but nerves. But, as you will remember, it was just such a warning that saved me in the gray dog case and in the yellow finger experiments, as well as other times. Well, I turned sharp round to the others. Out, I said, for God's sake, out, quick! And in an instant I had them in the passage. There came an extraordinary yelling scream into the hideous whistling, and then, like a clap of thunder, an utter silence. I slammed the door and locked it. Then, taking the key, I looked round at the others. They were pretty white, and I imagine I must have looked that way, too. And there we stood a moment, silent. "'Come down out of this and have some whiskey,' said Tassock at last, in a voice he tried to make ordinary, and he led the way. I was the back man, and I know we all kept looking over our shoulders. When we got downstairs, Tassock passed the bottle round. He took a drink himself and slapped his glass down on the table then sat down with a thud. "'That's a lovely thing to have in a house with you, isn't it?' he said, and directly afterwards, "'What on earth made you hustle us all out like that, Carnacki?' "'Something seemed to be telling me to get out quick,' I said. "'Sounds a bit silly, superstitious, I know, but when you are meddling with this sort of thing, you've got to take notice of queer fancies and risk being laughed at.' I told them, then, about the gray dog business, and he nodded a lot to that. Of course, I said, this may be nothing more than those would-be rivals of yours playing some funny game, but personally, though I am going to keep an open mind, I feel that there is something beastly and dangerous about this thing. We talked for a while longer, and then Tassock suggested billiards, which we played in a pretty half-hearted fashion, and all the time cocking an ear to the door, as you might say, for sounds. But none came, and later after coffee he suggested early bed, and a thorough overhaul of the room on the morrow. My bedroom was in the newer part of the castle, and the door opened into the picture gallery. At the east end of the gallery was the entrance to the corridor of the east wing. This was shut off from the gallery by two old and heavy oak doors, which looked rather odd and quaint beside the more modern doors of the various rooms. When I reached my room I did not go to bed, but began to unpack my instrument trunk, of which I had retained the key. I intended to take one or two preliminary steps at once in my investigation of the extraordinary whistling. Presently, when the castle had settled into quietness, I slipped out of my room and across to the entrance of the great corridor. I opened one of the low squat doors and threw the beam of my pocket searchlight down the passage. It was empty and I went through the doorway and pushed to the oak behind me. Then along the great passageway, throwing my light before and behind, and keeping my revolver handy. I had hung a protection belt of garlic round my neck, and the smell of it seemed to fill the corridor and give me assurance, for, as you all know, it is a wonderful protection against the more usual airy forms of semi-materialization by which I suppose the whistling might be produced, though at that period of my investigation I was quite prepared to find it due to some perfectly natural cause for it is astonishing the enormous number of cases that prove to have nothing abnormal in them. In addition to wearing the necklet, I had plugged my ears loosely with garlic, and, as I did not intend to stay more than a few minutes in the room, I hoped to be safe. When I reached the door and put my hand into my pocket for the key, I had a sudden feeling of sickening funk. But I was not going to back out if I could help it. I unlocked the door and turned the handle. Then I gave the door a sharp push with my foot, as Tassock had done, and drew my revolver, though I did not expect to have any use for it, really. 
I shone the searchlight all round the room and then stepped inside, with a disgustingly horrible feeling of walking slap into a waiting danger. I stood a few seconds, waiting, and nothing happened, and the empty room showed bare from corner to corner. And then, you know, I realized that the room was full of an abominable silence. Can you understand that? A sort of purposeful silence, just as sickening as any of the filthy noises the things have power to make. Do you remember what I told you about that silent garden business? Well, this room had just that same malevolent silence, the beastly quietness of a thing that is looking at you and not seeable itself, and thinks that it has got you. Oh, I recognized it instantly, and I whipped the top off my lantern so as to have light over the whole room. Then I set to, working like fury and keeping my glance all about me. I sealed the two windows with lengths of human hair, right across, and sealed them at every frame. As I worked, a queer, scarcely perceptible tenseness stole into the air of the place, and the silence seemed, if you can understand me, to grow more solid. I knew then that I had no business there without full protection, for I was practically certain that this was no mere airy development, but one of the worst forms, as the Sa'ati, like that grunting man case, you know. I finished the window and hurried over to the great fireplace. This is a huge affair and has a queer gallows iron, I think they are called, projecting from the back of the arch. I sealed the opening with seven human hairs, the seventh crossing the six others. Then, just as I was making an end, a low, mocking whistle grew in the room. A cold, nervous pricking went up my spine and round my forehead from the back. The hideous sound filled all the room with an extraordinary, grotesque parody of human whistling, too gigantic to be human, as if something gargantuan and monstrous had made the sounds softly. As I stood there a last moment, pressing down the final seal, I had no doubt but that I had come across one of those rare and horrible cases of the inanimate reproducing the functions of the animate. I made a grab for my lamp and went quickly to the door, looking over my shoulder and listening for the thing that I expected. It came, just as I got my hand upon the handle. A squeal of incredible malevolent anger, piercing through the low hooning of the whistling. I dashed out, slamming the door and locking it. I leant a little against the opposite wall of the corridor, feeling rather funny, for it had been a narrow squeak. There will be no safety to be gained by guards of holiness when the monster hath power to speak through wood and stone. So runs the passage in the Sigsand manuscript, and I proved it in that nodding door business. There is no protection against this particular form of monster, except possibly for a fractional period of time, for it can reproduce itself in, or take to its purpose, the very protective material which you may use, and has the power to form within the pentacle, though not immediately. There is, of course, the possibility of the unknown last line of the Sa'ama ritual being uttered, but it is too uncertain to count upon, and the danger is too hideous, and even then there is no power to protect for more than maybe five beats of the heart, as the Sig Sand has it. Inside of the room there was now a constant meditative hooning whistling, but presently this ceased, and the silence seemed worse, for there was such a sense of hidden mischief in a silence. After a little I sealed the door with crossed hairs, and then cleared off down the great passage, and so to bed. For a long time I lay awake, but managed eventually to get some sleep. Yet about two o'clock I was waked by the hooning whistling of the room coming to me, even through the closed doors. The sound was tremendous and seemed to beat through the whole house with a presiding sense of terror. As if, I remember thinking, some monstrous giant had been holding mad carnival with itself at the end of that great passage. I got up and sat on the edge of the bed, wondering whether to go along and have a look at the seal, and suddenly there came a thump on my door and Tassock walked in, with his dressing gown over his pajamas. "'I thought it would have waked you, so I came along to have a talk,' he said. "'I can't sleep. Beautiful, isn't it?' "'Extraordinary,' I said, and tossed him my case. He lit a cigarette, and we sat and talked for about an hour, and all the time that noise went on down at the end of the big corridor. 
Suddenly, Tassock stood up. Let's take our guns and go and examine the brute, he said, and turned toward the door. No, I said, by Jove, no. I can't say anything definite yet, but I believe that room is about as dangerous as it well can be. Haunted? Really haunted? he asked, keenly and without any of his frequent banter. I told him, of course, that I could not say a definite yes or no to such a question, but that I hoped to be able to make a statement soon. Then I gave him a little lecture on the false rematerialization of the animate force through the animate inert. He began then to see the particular way in the room might be dangerous, if it were really the subject of a manifestation. About an hour later, the whistling ceased quite suddenly, and Tassock went off again to bed. I went back to mine also, and eventually got another spell of sleep. In the morning I went along to the room. I found the seals on the door intact. Then I went in. The window seals and the hair were all right, but the seventh hair across the great fireplace was broken. This set me thinking. I knew that it might very possibly have snapped through my having tensioned it too highly, but then again it might have been broken by something else. Yet it was scarcely possible that a man, for instance, could have passed between the six unbroken hairs, for no one would ever have noticed them entering the room that way, you see, but just walked through them, ignorant of their very existence. I removed the other hairs and the seals, then I looked up the chimney. It went up straight, and I could see blue sky at the top. It was a big open flue, and free of any suggestion of hiding places or corners, Yet, of course, I did not trust any such casual examination, and after breakfast I put on my overalls and climbed to the very top, sounding all the way. But I found nothing. Then I came down and went over the whole of the room, floors, ceilings, and walls, mapping them out in six-inch squares and sounding with both hammer and probe. But there was nothing abnormal. Afterward, I made a three-week search of the whole castle, in the same thorough way. But I found nothing. I went even further then, for at night, when the whistling commenced, I made a microphone test. You see, if the whistling were mechanically produced, this test would have made evident to me the working of the machinery, if there were any such concealed within the walls. It certainly was an up-to-date method of examination, as you must allow. Of course, I did not think that any of Tassock's rivals had fixed up any mechanical contrivance, but I thought it just possible that there had been some such thing for producing the whistling, made away back in the years, perhaps with the intention of giving the room a reputation that would insurance being free of inquisitive folk. You see what I mean? Well, of course, it was just possible, if this were the case, that someone knew the secret of the machinery and was utilizing the knowledge to play this devil of a prank on Tassock. The microphone test of the walls would certainly have made this known to me, as I have said, but there was nothing of the sort in the castle, so that I had practically no doubt at all now but that it was a genuine case of what is popularly termed haunting. All this time, every night, and sometimes most of each night, the hooning whistling of the room was intolerable. It was as if an intelligence there knew that steps were being taken against it, and piped and hooned in a sort of mad, mocking contempt. I tell you, it was as extraordinary as it was horrible. Time after time I went along, tiptoeing noiselessly on stockinged feet to the sealed door, for I always kept the room sealed. I went at all hours of the night, and often the whistling inside would seem to change to a brutally malignant note, as though the half-animate monster saw me plainly through the shut door. And all the time the shrieking, hooning whistling would fill the whole corridor, so that I used to feel a precious lonely chap messing about there with one of Hell's mysteries. And every morning I would enter the room and examine the different hairs and seals. You see, after the first week I had stretched parallel hairs all along the walls of the room and along the ceiling. But over the floor, which was of polished stone, I had set out little colorless wafers, tacky side upmost. Each wafer was numbered and they were arranged in a definite plan, so that I should be able to trace the exact movements of any living thing that went across the floor. You will see that no material being or creature could possibly have entered that room, without leaving many signs to tell me about it. But nothing was ever disturbed, and I began to think that I should have to risk an attempt to stay the night in the room, in the electric pentacle. Yet, mind you, I knew that it would be a crazy thing to do, but I was getting stumped and ready to do anything. 
Once, about midnight, I did break the seal on the door and have a quick look in, but I tell you the whole room gave one mad yell and seemed to come toward me in a great belly of shadows, as if the walls had bellied in toward me. Of course, that must have been fancy. Anyway, the yell was sufficient, and I slammed the door and locked it, feeling a bit weak down my spine. You know the feeling. And then, when I had got to that state of readiness for anything, I made something of a discovery. It was about one in the morning, and I was walking slowly round the castle, keeping in the soft grass. I had come under the shadow of the east front, and far above me I could hear the vile hooning whistle of the room up in the darkness of the unlit wing. Then, suddenly, a little in front of me, I heard a man's voice, speaking low, but evidently with glee. "'By George, you chaps, I wouldn't care to bring a wife home in that,' it said in the tone of the cultured Irish. Someone started to reply, but there came a sharp exclamation, and then a rush, and I heard footsteps running in all directions. Evidently the men had spotted me. For a few seconds I stood there, feeling an awful ass. After all, they were at the bottom of the haunting. Do you see what a big fool it made me seem? I had no doubt but that they were some of Tussock's rivals, and here I had been feeling in every bone that I had hit a real bad genuine case. And then, you know, there came the memory of hundreds of details that made me just as much in doubt again. Anyway, whether it was natural or abnatural, there was a great deal yet to be cleared up. I told Tussock the next morning what I had discovered, and through the whole of every night, for five nights, we kept a close watch round the east wing. But there was never a sign of anyone prowling about, and all the time, almost from evening to dawn, that grotesque whistling would hoon incredibly far above us in the darkness. On the morning after the fifth night, I received a wire from here, which brought me home by the next boat. I explained to Tassock that I was simply bound to come away for a few days, but told him to keep up the watch round the castle. One thing I was very careful to do, and that was to make him absolutely promise never to go into the room between sunset and sunrise. I made it clear to him that we knew nothing definite yet, one way or the other, and if the room were what I had first thought it to be, it might be a lot better for him to die first than enter it after dark. When I got here and had finished my business, I thought you chaps would be interested, and also I wanted to get it all spread out clear in my mind, so I rung you up. I'm going over again tomorrow, and when I get back, I ought to have something pretty extraordinary to tell you. By the way, there is a curious thing I forgot to tell you. I tried to get a phonograph recording of the whistling, but it simply produced no impression on the wax at all. That is one of the things that has made me feel queer, I can tell you. Another extraordinary thing is that the microphone will not magnify the sound, will not even transmit it, seems to take no account of it, and acts as if it were non-existent. I am absolutely and utterly stumped up to the present. I am a wee bit curious to see whether any of your dear clever heads can make daylight of it. I cannot, not yet. He rose to his feet. Good night, all, he said, and began to usher us out abruptly, but without offense, into the night. A fortnight later he dropped each of us a card, and you can imagine that I was not late this time. When we arrived, Karnacki took us straight into dinner, and when we had finished and all made ourselves comfortable, he began again where he had left off. Now just listen quietly, for I have got something pretty queer to tell you. I got back late at night, and I had to walk up to the castle, as I had not warned them that I was coming. It was bright moonlight, so that the walk was rather a pleasure than otherwise. When I got there, the whole place was in darkness, and I thought I would take a walk around outside, to see whether Tassock or his brother was keeping watch. But I could not find them anywhere, and concluded that they had got tired of it and gone off to bed. As I returned across the front of the east wing, I caught the hooning whistling of the room, coming down strangely through the stillness of the night. It had a queer note in it, I remember, low and constant, queerly meditative. I looked up at the window, bright in the moonlight, and got a sudden thought to bring a ladder from the stable-yard, and try to get a look into the room through the window. With this notion I hunted round at the back of the castle, among the straggle of offices, and presently found a long, fairly light ladder. 
though it was heavy enough for one, goodness knows, and I thought at first that I should never get it reared. I managed at last, and let the ends rest very quietly against the wall, a little below the sill of the larger window. Then, going silently, I went up the ladder. Presently I had my face above the sill, and was looking in along with the moonlight. Of course the queer whistling sounded louder up there, but it still conveyed that peculiar sense of something whistling quietly to itself. Can you understand? Though for all the meditative lowness of the note, the horrible gargantuan quality was distinct. A mighty parody of the human, as if I stood there and listened to the whistling from the lips of a monster with a man's soul. And then, you know, I saw something. The floor in the middle of the huge empty room was puckered upward in the center into a strange soft-looking mound, parted at the top into an ever-changing hole that pulsated in that gentle, gentle hooning. At times, as I watched, I saw the heaving of the indented mound gap across with a queer inward suction, as if with the drawing of an enormous breath. Then the thing would dilate and pout once more to the incredible melody. And suddenly, as I stared dumb, it came to me that the thing was living. I was looking at two enormous blackened lips, blistered and brutal, there in the pale moonlight. Abruptly they bulged out to a vast pouting mound of force and sound, stiffened and swollen and hugely massive and clean-cut in the moonbeams, and a great sweat lay heavy on the vast upper lip. In the same moment of time the whistling had burst into a mad screaming note that seemed to stun me even where I stood outside of the window. And then the following moment I was staring blankly at the solid, undisturbed floor of the room, a smooth, polished stone flooring from wall to wall, and there was absolute silence. You can picture me staring into the quiet room and knowing what I knew. I felt like a sick, frightened kid and wanted to slide quietly down the ladder and run away. But in that very instant I heard Tassig's voice calling to me from within the room for help, help. My God, but I got such an awful dazed feeling and I had a vague, bewildered notion that, after all, it was the Irishmen who had got him in there and were taking it out of him. And then the call came again, and I burst the window and jumped in to help him. I had a confused idea that the call had come from within the shadow of the great fireplace, and I raced across to it. But there was no one there. Tassic! I shouted, and my voice went empty-sounding round the great apartment. Then, in a flash, I knew that Tassic had never called. I whirled round, sick with fear, toward the window, and as I did so, a frightful, exultant, whistling scream burst through the room. On my left, the end wall had bellied in toward me in a pair of gargantuan lips, black and utterly monstrous, to within a yard of my face. I fumbled for a mad instant at my revolver, not for it, but for myself, for the danger was a thousand times worse than death. And then, suddenly, the unknown last line of the Sa'ama ritual was whispered quite audibly in the room. Instantly, the thing happened that I have known once before. There came a sense as of dust following continually and monotonously, and I knew that my life hung, uncertain and suspended for a flash, in a brief, reeling vertigo of unseeable things. Then that ended, and I knew that I might live. My soul and body blended again, and life and power came to me. I dashed furiously at the window and hurled myself out head foremost, for I can tell you that I had stopped being afraid of death. I crashed down onto the ladder and slithered, grabbing and grabbing, and so came some way or other alive to the bottom. And there I sat in the soft, wet grass, with the moonlight all about me, and far above, through the broken window of the room, there was a low whistling. That is the chief of it. I was not hurt, and I went round to the front and knocked Tassock up. When they let me in, we had a long yarn over some good whiskey, for I was shaken to pieces, and I explained things as much as I could. I told Tassock that the room would have to come down, and every fragment of it burned in a blast furnace, erected within a pentacle. He nodded. There was nothing to say. Then I went to bed. We turned a small army onto the work, and within ten days that lovely thing had gone up in smoke, and what was left was calcined and clean. 
It was when the workmen were stripping the paneling that I got hold of a sound notion of the beginnings of that beastly development. Over the great fireplace, after the great oak panels had been torn down, I found that there was let into the masonry a scrollwork of stone, with on it an old inscription in ancient Celtic, that here in this room was burned Dion Tianse, jester of King Alzoff, who made the song of foolishness upon King Ernor of the Seventh Castle. When I got the translation clear, I gave it to Tassik. He was tremendously excited, for he knew the old tale, and took me down to the library to look at an old parchment that gave the story in detail. Afterward, I found that the incident was well known about the countryside, but always regarded more as a legend than as history. And no one seemed ever to have dreamt that the old east wing of Iastre Castle was the remains of the ancient seventh castle. From the old parchment, I gathered that there had been a pretty dirty job done away back in the years. It seemed that King Alsof and King Ernor had been enemies by birthright, as you might say truly, but that nothing more than a little raiding had occurred on either side for years until Dian Tianse made the song of foolishness upon King Ernor and sang it before King Alsof, and so greatly was it appreciated that King Alsof gave the jester one of his ladies to wife. Presently all the people of the land had come to know the song, and so it came at last to King Ernor, who was so angered that he made war upon his old enemy, and took and burned him and his castle. But Dian Tianse, the jester, he brought with him to his own place, and having torn his tongue out because of the song which he had made and sung, he imprisoned him in the room in the east wing, which was evidently used for unpleasant purposes, and the jester's wife he kept for himself, having a fancy for her prettiness. But one night Dian Tianse's wife was not found, and in the morning they discovered her lying dead in her husband's arms, and he, sitting, whistling the song of foolishness, for he had no longer the power to sing it. Then they roasted Dian Tianse in the great fireplace, probably from that self-same galley iron which I have already mentioned, and until he died Dian Tianse ceased not to whistle the song of foolishness which he could no longer sing. But afterward, in that room, there was often heard at night the sound of something whistling, and there grew a power in that room, so that none dared to sleep in it. And presently, it would seem, the king went to another castle, for the whistling troubled him. There you have it all. Of course, that is only a rough rendering of the translation of the parchment, but it sounds extraordinarily quaint. Don't you think so? Yes, I said, answering for the lot. But how did the thing grow to such tremendous manifestation? One of those cases of continuity of thought producing a positive action upon the immediate surrounding material, replied Carnacki. The development must have been going forward through the centuries to have produced such a monstrosity. It was a true instance of society manifestation, which I can best explain by likening it to a living spiritual fungus which involves the very structure of the ether fiber itself, and, of course, in so doing, acquires an essential control over the material substance involved in it. It is impossible to make it plainer in a few words. What broke the seventh hair? asked Taylor. But Carnacki did not know. He thought it was probably nothing but being too severely tensioned. He also explained that they found out that the men who had run away had not been up to the mischief, but had come over secretly merely to hear the whistling, which, indeed, had suddenly become the talk of the whole countryside. One other thing, said Arkwright. Have you any idea what governs the use of the unknown last line of the Sa'ama ritual? I know, of course, that it was used by the abhuman priests in the incantation of Rai, but what used it on your behalf, and what made it? You had better read Harzan's monograph and my addenda to it on astral and astral coordination and interference, said Kernaki. It is an extraordinary subject, and I can only say here that the human vibrations may not be insulated from the astral, as is always believed to be the case in interferences of the abhuman, without any immediate action being taken by those forces which govern the spinning of the outer circle. In other words, it is being proved time after time that there is some inscrutable protective force constantly intervening between the human soul, not the body, mind you, and the outer monstrosities. Am I clear? Yes, I think so, I replied. And you believe that the room had become the material expression of the ancient jester? That his soul, rotten with hatred, had bred into a monster, eh? I asked. 
Yes, said Karnacki, nodding. I think you've put my thought rather neatly. It is a queer coincidence that Miss Donahue was supposed to be descended, so I've heard since, from the same King Ernor. It makes one think some curious thoughts, doesn't it? The marriage coming on and the room waking to fresh life. If she had gone into that room ever, eh? It had waited a long time. Sins of the fathers. Yes, I've thought of that. They're to be married next week, and I am to be the best man, which is a thing I hate. And he won his bets, rather. Just think, if ever she had gone into that room. Pretty horrible, eh? He nodded his head grimly, and we four nodded back. Then he rose and took us collectively to the door, and presently thrust us forth in a friendly fashion on the embankment and into the fresh night air. Good night, we all called back, and went to our various homes. If she had, eh? If she had, that is what I kept thinking. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Horse of the Invisible I had that afternoon received an invitation from Carnacki. When I reached his place, I found him sitting alone. As I came into the room, he rose with a perceptibly stiff movement and extended his left hand. His face seemed to be badly scarred and bruised, and his right hand was bandaged. He shook hands and offered me his paper, which I refused. Then he passed me a handful of photographs and returned to his reading. Now, that is just Carnacki. Not a word had come from him, and not a question from me. He would tell us all about it later. I spent about half an hour looking at the photographs, which were chiefly snaps, some by flashlight, of an extraordinarily pretty girl, though in some of the photographs it was wonderful that her prettiness was so evident, for so frightened and startled was her expression, that it was difficult not to believe that she had been photographed in the presence of some imminent and overwhelming danger. The bulk of the photographs were interiors of different rooms and passages, and in every one the girl might be seen, either full length in the distance or closer, with perhaps little more than a hand or arm or a portion of the head or dress included in the photograph. All of these had evidently been taken with some definite aim that did not have for its first purpose the picturing of the girl, but obviously of her surroundings, and they made me very curious, as you can imagine. Near the bottom of the pile, however, I came upon something definitely extraordinary. It was a photograph of the girl standing upright and clear in the great blaze of a flashlight, as was plain to be seen. Her face was turned a little upward, as if she had been frightened suddenly by some noise. Directly above her, as though half-formed and coming down out of the shadows, was the shape of a single enormous hoof. I examined this photograph for a long time, without understanding it more than that it had probably to do with some queer case in which Carnacki was interested. When Jessop, Arkwright, and Taylor came in, Carnacki quietly held out his hand for the photographs, which I returned in the same spirit, and afterward we all went in to dinner. When we had spent a quiet hour at the table, we pulled our chairs round and made ourselves snug, and Carnacki began. "'I've been north,' he said, speaking slowly and painfully between puffs at his pipe, "'up to Higgins in East Lancashire. It has been a pretty strange business all round, as I fancy you chaps will think when I have finished. I knew before I went something about the horse story, as I have heard it called, but I never thought of it coming my way somehow.' Also, I know now that I never considered it seriously, in spite of my rule always to keep an open mind. Funny creatures, we humans. Well, I got a wire asking for an appointment, which of course told me that there was some trouble. On the date I fixed, old Captain Hisgins himself came to see me. He told me a great many new details about the horse story, though naturally I had always known the main points and understood that if the first child were a girl, that girl would be haunted by the horse during her courtship. It is, as you can see already, an extraordinary story, and though I have always known about it, I have never thought it to be anything more than an old-time legend, as I have already hinted. You see, for seven generations the Hisgins family have had men children for their firstborn, and even the Hisginses themselves have long considered the tale to be little more than a myth. To come to the present, the eldest child of the reigning family is a girl, and she has often been teased and warned in jest by her friends and relations that she is the first girl to be the eldest for seven generations, and that she would have to keep her men friends at arm's length or go into a nunnery if she hoped to escape the haunting. 
And this, I think, shows us how thoroughly the tale had grown to be considered as nothing worthy of the least serious thought. Don't you think so? Two months ago, Miss Hisgins became engaged to Beaumont, a young naval officer, and on the evening of the very day of the engagement, before it was even formally announced, a most extraordinary thing happened, which resulted in Captain Hisgins making the appointment, and my ultimately going down to their place to look into the thing. From the old family records and papers that were entrusted to me, I found that there could be no possible doubt that prior to something like a hundred and fifty years ago, there were some very extraordinary and disagreeable coincidences, to put the thing in the least emotional way. In the whole of the two centuries prior to that date, there were five first-born girls out of a total of seven generations of the family. Each of these girls grew up to maidenhood, and each became engaged, and each one died during the period of engagement, two by suicide, one by falling from a window, one from a broken heart, presumably heart failure owing to a sudden shock through fright. The fifth girl was killed one evening in the park round the house, but just how there seemed to be no exact knowledge, only that there was an impression that she had been kicked by a horse. She was dead when found. Now, you see, all of these deaths might be attributed in a way, even the suicides, to natural causes, I mean as distinct from supernatural, you see, yet in every case the maidens had undoubtedly suffered some extraordinary and terrifying experiences during their various courtships, for in all the records there was mention either of the neighing of an unseen horse or of the sounds of an invisible horse galloping, as well as many other peculiar and quite inexplicable manifestations. You begin to understand now, I think, just how extraordinary a business it was that I was asked to look into. I gathered from one account that the haunting of the girls was so constant and horrible that two of the girls' lovers fairly ran away from their lady loves. And I think it was this, more than anything else, that made me feel that there had been something more in it than a mere succession of uncomfortable coincidences. I got hold of these facts before I had been many hours in the house, and after this I went pretty carefully into the details of the thing that happened on the night of Miss Hisgins' engagement to Beaumont. It seems that as the two of them were going through the big lower corridor, just after dusk and before the lamps had been lighted, there had been a sudden horrible neighing in the corridor close to them. Immediately afterward, Beaumont received a tremendous blow or kick which broke his right forearm. Then the rest of the family and the servants came running to know what was wrong. Lights were brought, and the corridor, and afterward the whole house searched, but nothing unusual was found. You can imagine the excitement in the house and the half-incredulous, half-believing talk about the old legend. Then, later, in the middle of the night, the old captain was waked by the sound of a great horse galloping round and round the house. Several times after this, both Beaumont and the girl said that they had heard the sounds of hooves near them after dusk in several of the rooms and corridors. Three nights later, Beaumont was waked by a strange neighing in the nighttime, seeming to come from the direction of his sweetheart's bedroom. He ran hurriedly for her father, and the two of them raced to her room. They found her awake and ill with sheer terror, having been awakened by the neighing seemingly close to her bed. The night before I arrived, there had been a fresh happening, and they were all in a frightfully nervy state, as you can imagine. I spent most of the first day, as I have hinted, in getting hold of the details, but after dinner I slacked off and played billiards all the evening with Beaumont and Miss Hisgins. We stopped about ten o'clock and had coffee, and I got Beaumont to give me full particulars about the thing that had happened the evening before. He and Miss Hisgins had been sitting quietly in her aunt's boudoir whilst the old lady chaperoned them behind a book. It was growing dusk, and the lamp was at her end of the table. The rest of the house was not yet lit as the evening had come earlier than usual. Well, it seems that the door into the hall was open, and suddenly the girl said, Shh! What's that? They both listened, and then Beaumont heard it, the sound of a horse outside of the front door. Your father, he suggested? but she reminded him that her father was not writing. Well, of course, they were both ready to feel queer, as you can suppose, but Beaumont made an effort to shake this off and went into the hall to see whether anyone was at the entrance. It was pretty dark in the hall, and he could see the glass panels of the inner draft door, clear-cut in the darkness of the hall. He walked over to the glass and looked through into the drive beyond, but there was nothing in sight. 
He felt nervous and puzzled and opened the inner door and went out onto the carriage circle. Almost directly afterward, the great hall door swung to with a crash behind him. He told me that he had a sudden awful feeling of having been trapped in some way. That is how he put it. He whirled round and gripped the door handle, but something seemed to be holding it with a vast grip on the other side. Then, before he could be fixed in his mind that this was so, he was able to turn the handle and open the door. He paused a moment in the doorway and peered into the hall, for he had hardly steadied his mind sufficiently to know whether he was really frightened or not. Then he heard his sweetheart blow him a kiss out of the grayness of the big, unlit hall, and he knew that she had followed him from the boudoir. He blew her a kiss back and stepped inside the doorway, meaning to go to her. And then, suddenly, in a flash of sickening knowledge, he knew that it was not his sweetheart who had blown him that kiss. He knew that something was trying to tempt him alone into the darkness, and that the girl had never left the boudoir. He jumped back, and in the same instant of time he heard the kiss again nearer to him. He called out at the top of his voice, Mary, stay in the boudoir! Don't move out of the boudoir until I come to you! He heard her call something in reply from the boudoir, and then he struck a clump of a dozen or so matches, and was holding them above his head and looking round the hall. There was no one in it, but even as the matches burned out, there came the sounds of a great horse galloping down the empty drive. Now you see, both he and the girl had heard the sounds of the horse galloping, but when I questioned more closely, I found that the nurse had heard nothing, though it is true she is a bit deaf, and she was further back in the room. Of course, both he and Miss Hisgins had been in an extremely nervous state and ready to hear anything. The door might have been slammed by a sudden puff of wind, owing to some inner door being opened. And as for the grip on the handle, that may have been nothing more than the snick catching. With regard to the kisses and the sounds of the horse galloping, I pointed out that these might have seemed ordinary enough sounds if they had only been cool enough to reason. As I told him, and as he knew, the sounds of a horse galloping carry a long way on the wind, so that what he had heard might have been nothing more than a horse being ridden some distance away. As for the kiss, plenty of quiet noises, the rustle of a paper or a leaf, have a somewhat similar sound, especially if one is in an overstrung condition and imagining things. I finished preaching this little sermon on common sense versus hysteria as we put out the lights and left the billiard room. But neither Beaumont nor Miss Hisgins would agree that there had been any fancy on their parts. We had come out of the billiard room by this time and were going along the passage, and I was still doing my best to make both of them see the ordinary commonplace possibilities of the happening, when what killed my pig, as the saying goes, was the sound of a hoof in the dark billiard room we had just left. I felt the creep come on me in a flash, up my spine and over the back of my head. Miss Hisgins whooped like a child with a whooping cough and ran up the passage, giving little gasping screams. Beaumont, however, ripped round on his heels and jumped back a couple of yards. I gave back, too, a bit, as you can understand. "'There it is,' he said in a low, breathless voice. "'Perhaps you'll believe me now.' "'There's certainly something,' I whispered never taking my gaze off the closed door of the billiard room. Shh, he muttered. There it is again. There was a sound like a great horse pacing round and round the billiard room with slow, deliberate steps. A horrible, cold fright took me so that it seemed impossible to take a full breath. You know the feeling. And then I saw we must have been walking backward, for we found ourselves suddenly at the opening of the long passage. We stopped there and listened. The sounds went on steadily with a horrible sort of deliberateness, as if the brute were taking a sort of malicious gusto when walking about all over the room which we had just occupied. Do you understand just what I mean? Then there was a pause and a long time of absolute quiet, except for an excited whispering from some of the people down in the big hall. The sound came plainly up the wide stairway. I fancy they were gathered around Miss Hisgins with some notion of protecting her. I should think Beaumont and I stood there, at the end of the passage, for about five minutes, listening for any noise in the billiard room. Then I realized what a horrible funk I was in, and I said to him, I'm going to see what's there. So am I, he answered. He was pretty white, but he had heaps of pluck. I told him to wait one instant, and I made a dash into my bedroom and got my camera and flashlight. 
I slipped my revolver into my right-hand pocket and a knuckle-duster over my left fist where it was ready and yet would not stop me from being able to work my flashlight. Then I ran back to Beaumont. He held out his hand to show me that he had his pistol, and I nodded, but whispered to him not to be too quick to shoot, as there might be some silly practical joking at work after all. He had got a lamp from a bracket in the upper hall which he was holding in the crook of his damaged arm, so that we had a good light. Then we went down the passage toward the billiard room, and you can imagine that we were a pretty nervous couple. All this time there had not been a sound, but abruptly, when we were within perhaps a couple of yards of the door, we heard the sudden clumping of a hoof on the solid parquet floor of the billiard room. In the instant afterward, it seemed to me that the whole place shook beneath the ponderous hoof-falls of some huge thing coming toward the door. Both Beaumont and I gave back a pace or two, and then realized and hung on to our courage, as you might say, and waited. The great tread came right up to the door, and then stopped, and there was an instant of absolute silence, except that, so far as I was concerned, the pulsing in my throat and temples almost deafened me. I dare say we waited quite half a minute, and then came the further restless clumping of a great hoof. Immediately afterward the sounds came right on as if some invisible thing passed through the closed door, and the ponderous tread was upon us. We jumped, each of us, to our side of the passage, and I know that I spread myself stiff against the wall. The clunk-clunk, clunk-clunk of the great hooves passed right between us, and slowly, and with deadly deliberateness, down the passage. I heard them through a haze of blood beats in my ears and temples, and my body was extraordinarily rigid and pringling, and I was horribly breathless. I stood for a little time like this, my head turned so that I could see up the passage. I was conscious only that there was a hideous danger abroad. Do you understand? And then, suddenly, my pluck came back to me. I was aware that the noise of the hoofbeat sounded near the other end of the passage. I twisted quickly, and got my camera to bear, and snapped off the flashlight. Immediately afterward, Beaumont let out a storm of shots down the passage and began to run, shouting, It's after Mary! Run! Run! He rushed down the passage, and I after him. We came out on the main landing and heard the sound of a hoof on the stairs, and after that, nothing. And from thence onward, nothing. Down below us in the big hall, I could see a number of the household round Miss Hisgins, who seemed to have fainted, and there were several of the servants clumped together a little way off, staring up at the main landing, and no one was saying a single word. And about twenty steps up the stairs was old Captain Higgins with a drawn sword in his hand, where he had halted, just below the last hoof sound. I think I never saw anything finer than that old man standing there between his daughter and that infernal thing. I dare say you can understand the queer feeling of horror I had at passing that place on the stairs, where the sounds had ceased. It was as if the monster were still standing there, invisible. And the peculiar thing was that we never heard another sound of the hoof, either up or down the stairs. After they had taken Miss Hisgins to her room, I sent word that I should follow, so soon as they were ready for me. And presently, when a message came to tell me that I could come any time, I asked her father to give me a hand with my instrument box, and between us we carried it into the girl's bedroom. I had the bed pulled well out into the middle of the room, after which I erected the electric pentacle round the bed. Then I directed that lamps should be placed round the room, but that on no account must any light be made within the pentacle, neither must anyone pass in or out. The girl's mother I had placed within the pentacle, and directed that her maid should sit without, ready to carry any message, so as to make sure that Mrs. Hiskins did not have to leave the pentacle. I suggested also that the girl's father should stay the night in the room, and that he had better be armed. When I left the bedroom, I found Beaumont waiting outside the door in a miserable state of anxiety. I told him what I had done, and explained to him that Miss Hisgins was probably perfectly safe within the protection, but that in addition to her father remaining the night in the room, I intended to stand guard at the door. I told him that I should like him to keep me company, for I knew that he could never sleep, feeling as he did, and I should not be sorry to have a companion. Also, I wanted to have him under my own observation, for there was no doubt that he was actually in greater danger in some ways than the girl. 
At least, that was my opinion, and is still, as I think you will agree later. I asked him whether he would object to my drawing a pentacle round him for the night, and got him to agree, but I saw that he did not know whether to be superstitious about it or to regard it as more of a piece of foolish mumming, but he took it seriously enough when I gave him some particulars about the Black Veil case, when young Astor died. You remember. He said it was a piece of silly superstition and stayed outside. Poor devil. The night passed quietly enough until a little while before dawn, when we both heard the sounds of a great horse galloping round and round the house, just as old Captain Hisgins had described it. You can imagine how queer it made me feel, and directly afterward I heard someone stir within the bedroom. I knocked at the door, for I was uneasy, and the captain came. I asked whether everything was right, to which he replied yes, and immediately asked me whether I had heard the galloping, so that I knew he had heard them also. I suggested that it might be well to leave the bedroom door open a little until the dawn came in, as there was certainly something abroad. This was done, and he went back into the room, to be near his wife and daughter. I had better say here that I was doubtful whether there was any value in the defense about Miss Hisgins, for what I term the personal sounds of the manifestation were so extraordinarily material that I was inclined to parallel the case with that one of Harford's where the hand of the child kept materializing within the pentacle and patting the floor. As you will remember, that was a hideous business. Yet, as it chanced, nothing further happened, and so soon as daylight had fully come, we all went off to bed. Beaumont knocked me up about midday, and I went down and made breakfast into lunch. Miss Hisgins was there and seemed in very fair spirits, considering. She told me that I had made her feel almost safe for the first time for days. She told me also that her cousin, Harry Parskett, was coming down from London, and she knew that he would do anything to help fight the ghost. And after that, she and Beaumont went out into the grounds to have a little time together. I had a walk in the grounds myself, and went round the house, but saw no traces of hoof marks, and after that I spent the rest of the day making an examination of the house, but found nothing. I made an end of my search before dark and went to my room to dress for dinner. When I got down, the cousin had just arrived, and I found him one of the nicest men I have met for a long time, a chap with a tremendous amount of pluck, and the particular kind of man I like to have about me in a bad case like the one I was on. I could see that what puzzled him most was our belief in the genuineness of the haunting, and I found myself almost wanting something to happen, just to show him how true it was. As it chanced, something did happen, with a vengeance. Beaumont and Miss Hisgins had gone out for a stroll just before the dusk, and Captain Hisgins asked me to come into his study for a short chat, whilst Parskett went upstairs with his traps, for he had no man with him. I had a long conversation with the old captain, in which I pointed out that the haunting had evidently no particular connection with the house, but only with the girl herself and the sooner she was married, the better, as it would give Beaumont a right to be with her at all times, and further than this, it might be that the manifestations would cease if the marriage were actually performed. The old man nodded agreement to this, especially to the first part, and reminded me that three of the girls who were said to have been haunted had been sent away from home and met their deaths whilst away. And then in the midst of our talk there came a pretty frightening interruption, for all at once the old butler rushed into the room, most extraordinarily pale. "'Miss Mary, sir! Miss Mary, sir!' he gasped. "'She's screaming out in the park, sir, and they say they can hear the horse!' The captain made one dive for a rack of arms and snatched down his old sword and ran out, drawing it as he ran. I dashed out and up the stairs, snatched my camera flashlight and heavy revolver, gave one yell at Parskett's door, "'The horse!' and was down and into the grounds. Away in the darkness there was a confused shouting, and I caught the sounds of shooting out among the scattered trees. And then, from a patch of blackness to my left, there burst suddenly an infernal, gobbling sort of neighing. Instantly I whipped round and snapped off the flashlight. The great light blazed out momentarily, showing me the leaves of a big tree close at hand, quivering in the night breeze, but I saw nothing else, and then the tenfold blackness came down upon me, and I heard Parskett shouting a little way back, to know whether I had seen anything. 
The next instant he was beside me, and I felt safer for his company, for there was some incredible thing near to us, and I was momentarily blind because of the brightness of the flashlight. "'What was it? What was it?' he kept repeating in an excited voice, and all the time I was staring into the darkness and answering mechanically, "'I don't know. I don't know.' There was a burst of shouting somewhere ahead, and then a shot. We ran toward the sounds, yelling to the people not to shoot, for in the darkness and panic there was this danger also. Then there came two of the gamekeepers racing hard up the drive with their lanterns and guns, and immediately afterward a row of lights dancing toward us from the house, carried by some of the men-servants. As the lights came up, I saw we had come close to Beaumont. He was standing over Miss Hisgins, and he had his revolver in his hand. Then I saw his face, and there was a great wound across his forehead. By him was the captain, turning his naked sword this way and that, and peering into the darkness. A little behind him stood the old butler, a battle-axe from one of the arm-stands in the hall in his hands. Yet there was nothing strange to be seen anywhere. We got the girl into the house and left her with her mother in Beaumont, whilst a groom rode for a doctor. And then the rest of us, with four other keepers, all armed with guns and carrying lanterns, searched round the home park. But we found nothing. When we got back, we found that the doctor had been. He had bound up Beaumont's wound, which luckily was not deep, and ordered Miss Hisgins straight to bed. I went upstairs with the captain and found Beaumont on guard outside of the girl's door. I asked him how he felt, and then, so soon as the girl and her mother were ready for us, Captain Hisgins and I went into the bedroom and fixed the pentacle again round the bed. They had already got the lamps about the room, and after I had set the same order of watching as on the previous night, I joined Beaumont outside of the door. Parscott had come up while I had been in the bedroom, and between us we got some idea from Beaumont as to what had happened out in the park. It seems that they were coming home after their stroll from the direction of the West Lodge. It had got quite dark, and suddenly Miss Hisgins said, Hush! and came to a standstill. He stopped and listened, but heard nothing for a little. Then he caught it, the sound of a horse seemingly a long way off, galloping toward them over the grass. He told the girl that it was nothing, and started to hurry her toward the house, but she was not deceived, of course. In less than a minute they heard it quite close to them in the darkness, and they started running. Then Miss Hisgins caught her foot and fell. She began to scream, and that is what the butler heard. As Beaumont lifted the girl, he heard their hooves come thudding right at him. He stood over her and fired all five chambers of his revolver right at the sounds. He told us that he was sure he saw something that looked like an enormous horse's head, right upon him in the light of the last flash of his pistol. Immediately afterward he was struck a tremendous blow which knocked him down, and then the captain and the butler came running up, shouting. The rest, of course, we knew. About ten o'clock the butler brought us up a tray, for which I was very glad, as the night before I had got rather hungry. I warned Beaumont, however, to be very particular not to drink any spirits, and I also made him give me his pipe and matches. At midnight I drew a pentacle round him, and Parskett and I sat one on each side of him, outside the pentacle, for I had no fear that there would be any manifestation made against anyone except Beaumont and Miss Hisgins. After that we kept pretty quiet. The passage was lit by a big lamp at each end so that we had plenty of light, and we were all armed, Beaumont and I with revolvers and Parskett with a shotgun. In addition to my weapon I had my camera and flashlight. Now and again we talked in whispers, and twice the captain came out of the bedroom to have a word with us. About half-past one we had all grown very silent, and suddenly, about twenty minutes later, I held up my hand, silently, for there seemed to be a sound of galloping out in the night. I knocked on the bedroom door for the captain to open it, and when he came I whispered to him that we thought we heard the horse. For some time we stayed listening, and both Parskett and the captain thought they heard it, but now I was not so sure, neither was Beaumont. Yet afterward I thought I heard it again. I told Captain Hisgins I thought he had better go into the bedroom and leave the door a little open, and this he did. But from that time onward we heard nothing, and presently the dawn came in, and we all went very thankfully to bed. When I was called at lunchtime I had a little surprise, 
for Captain Hisgins told me that they had held a family council and had decided to take my advice and have the marriage without a day's more delay than possible. Beaumont was already on his way to London to get a special license, and they hoped to have the wedding next day. This pleased me, for it seemed the sanest thing to be done in the extraordinary circumstances, and meanwhile I should continue my investigations, but until the marriage was accomplished my chief thought was to keep Miss Hisgins near to me. After lunch I thought I would take a few experimental photographs of Miss Hisgins and her surroundings. Sometimes the camera sees things that would seem very strange to normal human eyesight. With this intention, and partly to make an excuse to keep her in my company as much as possible, I asked Miss Hisgins to join me in my experiments. She seemed glad to do this, and I spent several hours with her, wandering all over the house, from room to room, and whenever the impulse came, I took a flashlight of her and the room or corridor in which we chanced to be at the moment. After we had gone right through the house in this fashion, I asked her whether she felt sufficiently brave to repeat the experiments in the cellars. She said yes, and so I rooted out Captain Hisgins and Parskett, for I was not going to take her even into what you might call artificial darkness without help and companionship at hand. When we were ready, we went down into the wine cellar, Captain Hisgins carrying a shotgun and Parskett a specially prepared background and a lantern. I got the girl to stand in the middle of the cellar, whilst Parskett and the captain held out the background behind her. Then I fired off the flashlight, and we went into the next cellar, where we repeated the experiment. Then, in the third cellar, a tremendous pitch-dark place, something extraordinary and horrible manifested itself. I had stationed Miss Hisgins in the center of the place, with her father and Parskett holding the background as before. When all was ready, and just as I pressed the trigger of the flash, there came in the cellar that dreadful gobbling neighing that I had heard out in the park. It seemed to come from somewhere above the girl, and in the glare of the sudden light I saw that she was staring tensely upward, but at no visible thing. And then, in the succeeding comparative darkness, I was shouting to the captain and Parskett to run Miss Hisgins out into the daylight. This was done instantly, and I shut and locked the door afterward, making the first and eighth signs of the Sa'ama ritual opposite to each post, and connecting them across the threshold with a triple line. In the meanwhile, Parskett and Captain Hisgins carried the girl to her mother, and left her there, in a half-fainting condition, while Stye stayed on guard outside of the cellar door, feeling pretty horrible, for I knew that there was some disgusting thing inside, and along with this feeling there was a sense of half-ashamedness, rather miserable, you know, because I had exposed Miss Hisgins to the danger. I had got the captain's shotgun, and when he and Parskett came down again, they were each carrying guns and lanterns. I could not possibly tell you the utter relief of spirit and body that came to me when I heard them coming, but just try to imagine what it was like standing outside that cellar, can you? I remember noticing, just before I went to unlock the door, how white and ghastly Parskett looked, and the old captain was grey-looking, and I wondered whether my face was like theirs. And this, you know, had its own distinct effect upon my nerves, for it seemed to bring the beastliness of the thing crashed down onto me in a fresh way. I know it was only sheer willpower that carried me up to the door and made me turn the key. I paused one little moment, and then, with a nervy jerk, set the door wide open, and held my lantern over my head. Parskett and the captain came one on each side of me and held up their lanterns, but the place was absolutely empty. Of course I did not trust to a casual look of this kind, but spent several hours with the help of the two others in sounding every square foot of the floor, ceiling, and walls. Yet in the end I had to admit that the place itself was absolutely normal, and so we came away. But I sealed the door, and outside, opposite each doorpost, I made the first and last signs of the Sa'ama ritual, joining them, as before, with a triple line. Can you imagine what it was like searching that cellar? When we got upstairs, I inquired very anxiously how Miss Hisgins was, and the girl came out herself to tell me that she was all right, and that I was not to trouble about her, or blame myself, as I told her I had been doing. I felt happier then, and went off to dress for dinner, and after that was done, Parskett and I took one of the bathrooms to develop the negatives that I had been taking. Yet none of the plates had anything to tell us until we came to the one that was taken in the cellar. 
Parsket was developing, and I had taken a batch of the fixed plates out into the lamplight to examine them. I had just gone carefully through the lot when I heard a shout from Parsket, and when I ran to him, he was looking at a partially developed negative that he was holding up to the red light. It showed the girl plainly, looking upward as I had seen her, but the thing that astonished me was the shadow of an enormous hoof right above her, as if it were coming down upon her out of the shadows. And you know, I had run her bang into that danger. That was the thought that was chief in my mind. As soon as the developing was complete, I fixed the plate, and examined it carefully in a good light. There was no doubt about it at all. The thing above Miss Hisgins was an enormous shadowy hoof. Yet I was no nearer to coming to any definite knowledge, and the only thing I could do was to warn Parsket to say nothing about it to the girl, for it would only increase her fright. But I showed the thing to her father, for I considered it right that he should know. That night we took the same precaution for Miss Hisgins' safety as on the two previous nights, and Parsket kept me company. Yet the dawn came in without anything unusual having happened, and I went off to bed. When I got down to lunch, I learnt that Beaumont had wired to say that he would be in soon after four, also that a message had been sent to the rector, and it was generally plain that the ladies of the house were in a tremendous fluster. Beaumont's train was late, and he did not get home until five, but even then the rector had not put in an appearance, and the butler came in to say that the coachman had returned without him, as he had been called away unexpectedly. Twice more during the evening the carriage was sent down, but the clergyman had not returned, and we had to delay the marriage until the next day. That night I arranged the defense round the girl's bed, and the captain and his wife sat up with her as before. Beaumont, as I expected, insisted on keeping watch with me, and he seemed in a curiously frightened mood, not for himself, you know, but for Miss Hisgins. He had a horrible feeling, he told me, that there would be a final dreadful attempt on his sweetheart that night. This, of course, I told him was nothing but nerves, yet, really, it made me feel very anxious, for I had seen too much not to know that under such circumstances a premonitory conviction of impending danger is not necessarily to be put down entirely to nerves. In fact, Beaumont was so simply and earnestly convinced that the night would bring some extraordinary manifestation that I got Parsket to rig up a long cord from the wire of the butler's bell to come along the passage handy. To the butler himself, I gave directions not to undress, and to give the same order to two of the footmen. If I rang, he was to come instantly with the footmen carrying lanterns, and the lanterns were to be kept ready lit all night. If for any reason the bell did not ring, and I blew my whistle, he was to take that as a signal in the place of the bell. After I had arranged all these minor details, I drew a pentacle about Beaumont, and warned him very particularly to stay within it, whatever happened. And when this was done, there was nothing to do but wait, and pray that the night would go as quietly as the night before. We scarcely talked at all, and about 1 a.m. we were all very tense and nervous, so that at last Parsket got up and began to walk up and down the corridor to steady himself a bit. Presently I slipped off my pumps and joined him, and we walked up and down, whispering occasionally for something over an hour, until, in turning, I caught my foot in the bell cord and went down on my face, but without hurting myself or making a noise. When I got up, Parsket nudged me. "'Did you notice that the bell never rang?' he whispered. "'Jove,' I said. "'You're right.' "'Wait a minute,' he answered. "'I'll bet it's only a kink somewhere in the cord.' He left his gun and slipped along the passage, and, taking the top lamp, tiptoed away into the house, carrying Beaumont's revolver ready in his right hand. He was a plucky chap, I remember thinking then, and again later. Just then Beaumont motioned to me for absolute quiet. Directly afterward I heard the thing for which he listened, the sound of a horse galloping out in the night. I think I may say I fairly shivered. The sound died away and left a horrible, desolate, eerie feeling in the air, you know. I put my hand out to the bell cord, hoping Parsket had got it clear. Then I waited, glancing before and behind. Perhaps two minutes passed, full of what seemed like an almost unearthly quiet. And then, suddenly, 
Down the corridor at the lighted end there sounded the clumping of a great hoof, and instantly the lamp was thrown with a tremendous crash, and we were in the dark. I tugged hard on the cord and blew the whistle. Then I raised my snapshot and fired the flashlight. The corridor blazed into brilliant light, but there was nothing, and then the darkness fell like thunder. I heard the captain at the bedroom door and shouted to him to bring out a lamp quick, but instead something started to kick the door, and I heard the captain shouting within the bedroom, and then the screaming of the women. I had a sudden horrible fear that the monster had got into the bedroom, but in the same instant from up the corridor there came abruptly the vile gobbling neighing that we had heard in the park in the cellar. I blew the whistle again and groped blindly for the bell cord, shouting to Beaumont to stay in the pentacle, whatever happened. I yelled again to the captain to bring out a lamp, and there came a smashing sound against the bedroom door. Then I had my matches in my hand to get some light before that incredible, unseen monster was upon us. The match scraped on the box and flared up dully, and in the same instant I heard a faint sound behind me. I whipped round in a kind of mad terror and saw something in the light of the match, a monstrous horse head close to Beaumont. Look out, Beaumont! I shouted in a sort of scream. It's behind you! The match went out abruptly, and instantly there came the huge bang of Parskett's double barrel, both barrels at once, fired, evidently, single-handed by Beaumont, close to my ear, as it seemed. I caught a momentary glimpse of the great head in the flash, and of an enormous hoof amid the belch of fire and smoke seeming to be descending upon Beaumont. In the same instant I fired three chambers of my revolver. There was the sound of a dull blow, and then that horrible gobbling neigh broke out close to me. I fired twice at the sound. Immediately afterward something struck me, and I was knocked backward. I got onto my knees and shouted for help at the top of my voice. I heard the women screaming behind the closed door of the bedroom, and was dully aware that the door was being smashed from the inside, and directly afterward I knew that Beaumont was struggling with some hideous thing near to me. For an instant I held back, stupidly, paralyzed with funk, and then, blindly and in a sort of rigid chill of goose flesh, I went to help him, shouting his name. I can tell you I was nearly sick with the naked fear I had on me. There came a little choking scream out of the darkness, and at that I jumped forward into the dark. I gripped a vast, furry ear. Then something struck me another great blow, knocking me sick. I hit back, weak and blind, and gripped with my other hand at the incredible thing. Abruptly, I was dimly aware of a tremendous crash behind me and a great burst of light. There were other lights in the passage and a noise of feet and shouting. My hand grips were torn from the thing they held. I shut my eyes stupidly and heard a loud yell above me, and then a heavy blow, like a butcher chopping meat, and then something fell upon me. I was helped to my knees by the captain and the butler. On the floor lay an enormous horse head, out of which protruded a man's trunk and legs. On the wrists were fixed great hooves. It was the monster. The captain cut something with the sword that he held in his hand and stooped and lifted off the mask, for that is what it was. I saw the face then of the man who had worn it. It was Parskett. He had a bad wound across his forehead where the captain's sword had bit through the mask. I looked bewilderedly from him to Beaumont, who was sitting up, leaning against the wall of the corridor. Then I stared at Parskett again. "'By Jove!' I said at last. And then I was quiet, for I was so ashamed for the man. You can understand, can't you? And he was opening his eyes, and you know, I had grown so to like him. And then, you know, just as Parskett was getting back his wits and looking from one to the other of us and beginning to remember, there happened a strange and incredible thing. For from the end of the corridor there sounded suddenly the clumping of a great hoof. I looked that way, and then instantly at Parskett, and saw a horrible fear in his face and eyes. He wrenched himself round weakly, and stared in mad terror up the corridor to where the sound had been, and the rest of us stared in a frozen group. I remember, vaguely, half-sobs and whispers from Miss Hisgins' bedroom, all the while that I stared frightenedly up the corridor. The silence lasted several seconds, and then, abruptly, there came again the clumping of the great hoof, 
away at the end of the corridor, and immediately afterward the clunk-clunk, clunk-clunk of mighty hoofs coming down the passage toward us. Even then, you know, most of us thought it was some mechanism of Parscott still at work, and we were in the queerest mixture of fright and doubt. I think everyone looked at Parscott, and suddenly the captain shouted out, Stop this damn fooling at once! Haven't you done enough? For my part, I was now frightened, for I had a sense that there was something horrible and wrong. And then Parscott managed to gasp out, It's not me! My God! It's not me! My God! It's not me! And then, you know, it seemed to come home to everyone in an instant that there really was some dreadful thing coming down the passage. There was a mad rush to get away, and even old Captain Hisgins gave back with the butler and the footman. Beaumont fainted outright, as I found afterward, for he had been badly mauled. I just flattened back against the wall, kneeling as I was, too stupid and dazed even to run. And almost in the same instant the ponderous hoof-falls sounded close to me, and seemed to shake the solid floor as they passed. Abruptly the great sound ceased, and I knew, in a sort of sick fashion, that the thing had halted opposite to the door of the girl's bedroom. And then I was aware that Parskett was standing rocking in the doorway with his arms spread across so as to fill the doorway with his body. Parskett was extraordinarily pale, and the blood was running down his face from the wound in his forehead, and then I noticed that he seemed to be looking at something in the passage with a peculiar, desperate, fixed, incredibly masterful gaze. But there was really nothing to be seen. And suddenly the clunk-clunk, clunk-clunk, recommenced and passed onward down the passage. In the same moment, Parskett pitched forward out of the doorway onto his face. There were shouts from the huddle of men down the passage, and the two footmen and the butler simply ran, carrying their lanterns. But the captain went against the side wall with his back and put the lamp he was carrying over his head. The dull tread of the horse went past him and left him unharmed, and I heard the monstrous hoof-falls going away and away through the quiet house, and after that a dead silence. Then the captain moved and came toward me, very slow and shaky, and with an extraordinarily gray face. I crept toward Parskett, and the captain came to help me. We turned him over, and you know, I knew in a moment that he was dead, but you can imagine what a feeling it sent through me. I looked at the captain, and suddenly he said, That! 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 And I know that he was trying to tell me that Parskett had stood between his daughter and whatever it was that had gone down the passage. I stood up and steadied him, though I was not very steady myself. And suddenly his face began to work, and he went down on his knees by Parskett and cried like some shaken child. Then the women came out of the doorway of the bedroom, and I turned away and left him to them, whilst I over to Beaumont. That is practically the whole story, and the only thing that is left to me is to try to explain some of the puzzling parts here and there. Perhaps you have seen that Parskett was in love with Miss Hisgins, and this fact is the key to a good deal that was extraordinary. He was doubtless responsible for some portions of the haunting, in fact, I think, for nearly everything, but, you know, I can prove nothing, and what I have to tell you is chiefly the result of deduction. In the first place, it is obvious that Parskett's intention was to frighten Beaumont away, and when he found that he could not do this, I think he grew so desperate that he really intended to kill him. I hate to say this, but the facts force me to think so. I am quite certain that it was Parskett who broke Beaumont's arm. He knew all the details of the so-called horse legend, and got the idea to work upon the old story for his own end. He evidently had some method of slipping in and out of the house, probably through one of the many French windows, or possibly he had a key to one or two of the garden doors, and when he was supposed to be away, he was really coming down on the quiet and hiding somewhere in the neighborhood. The incident of the kiss in the dark hall I put down to sheer nervous imaginings on the part of Beaumont and Miss Hisgins, Yet, I must say that the sound of the horse outside of the front door is a little difficult to explain away. But I am still inclined to keep to my first idea on this point, that there was nothing really unnatural about it. The hoof sounds in the billiard room and down the passage were done by Parskett from the floor below, 
by bumping up against the paneled ceiling with a block of wood tied to one of the window hooks. I proved this by an examination which showed the dents in the woodwork. The sounds of the horse galloping round the house were possibly made also by Parskett, who must have had a horse tied up in the plantation nearby, unless indeed he made the sounds himself, but I do not see how he could have gone fast enough to produce the illusion. In any case, I don't feel perfect certainty on this point. I failed to find any hoof marks, as you remember. The gobbling neighing in the park was a ventriloquial achievement on the part of Parskett, and the attack out there on Beaumont was also by him, so that when I thought he was in his bedroom, he must have been outside all the time, and joined me after I ran out of the front door. This is almost probable. I mean that Parskett was the cause, for if it had been something more serious, he would certainly have given up his foolishness, knowing that there was no longer any need for it. I cannot imagine how he escaped being shot, both then and in the last mad action of which I have just told you. He was enormously without fear of any kind for himself, as you can see. The time when Parskett was with us, when we thought we heard the horse galloping round the house, we must have been deceived. No one was very sure, except, of course, Parskett, who would naturally encourage the belief. The neighing in the cellar is where I consider there came the first suspicion into Parskett's mind that there was something more at work than his sham haunting. The neighing was done by him in the same way that he did it in the park, but when I remember how ghastly he looked, I feel sure that the sounds must have had some infernal quality added to them which frightened the man himself. Yet later he would persuade himself that he had been getting fanciful. Of course I must not forget that the effect upon Miss Hisgins must have made him feel pretty miserable. Then, about the clergyman being called away, we found afterward that it was a bogus errand, or rather call, and it is apparent that Parskett was at the bottom of this, so as to get a few more hours in which to achieve his end. And what that was, a very little imagination will show you, for he had found that Beaumont would not be frightened away. I hate to think this, but I am bound to. Anyway, it is obvious that the man was temporarily a bit off his normal balance. Love's a queer disease. Then there is no doubt at all that Parskett left the cord to the butler's bell hitched somewhere, so as to give him an excuse to slip away naturally to clear it. This also gave him the opportunity to remove one of the passage lamps. Then he had only to smash the other, and the passage was in utter darkness for him to make the attempt on Beaumont. In the same way, it was he who locked the door of the bedroom and took the key. It was in his pocket. This prevented the captain from bringing a light and coming to the rescue. But Captain Hisgins broke down the door with a heavy fender curb, and it was his smashing the door that sounded so confusing and frightening in the darkness of the passage. The photograph of the monstrous hoof above Miss Hisgins in the cellar is one of the things that I am less sure about. It might have been faked by Parskett, whilst I was out of the room, and this would have been easy enough to anyone who knew how, but you know it does not look like a fake. Yet there is as much evidence of probability that it was faked as against, and the thing is too vague for an examination to help to a definite decision so that I will express no opinion one way or the other. It is certainly a horrible photograph. And now I come to that last dreadful thing. There has been no further manifestation of anything abnormal, so that there is an extraordinary uncertainty in my conclusions. If we had not heard those last sounds, and if Parskett had not shown that enormous sense of fear, the whole of this case could be explained in the way in which I have shown. And in fact, as you have seen, I am of the opinion that almost all of it can be cleared up. But I see no way of going past the thing we heard at the last, and the fear that Parskett showed. His death, no, that proves nothing. At the inquest it was described somewhat untechnically as due to heart spasm. That is normal enough, and leaves us quite in the dark as to whether he died because he stood between the girl and some incredible thing of monstrosity. The look on Parskett's face, and the thing he called out when he heard the great hoof sounds coming down the passage, seemed to show that he had the sudden realization of what before then must have been nothing more than a horrible suspicion. And his fear and appreciation of some tremendous danger approaching 
was probably more keenly real even than mine. And then he did the one fine, great thing. And the cause, I said, what caused it? Carnacki shook his head. God knows, he answered, with a peculiar, sincere reverence. If that thing was what it seemed to be, one might suggest an explanation which would not offend one's reason, but which may be utterly wrong. Yet I have thought, though it would take a long lecture on thought induction to get you to appreciate my reasons, that Parskid had produced what I might term a kind of induced haunting, a kind of induced simulation of his mental conceptions to his desperate thoughts and broodings. It is impossible to make it clearer in a few words. But the old story, I said, why may not there have been something in that? There may have been something in it, said Carnacki, but I do not think it had anything to do with this. I have not clearly thought out my reasons yet, but later I may be able to tell you why I think so. And the marriage and the cellar, was there anything found there? asked Taylor. Yes, the marriage was performed that day in spite of the tragedy, Carnacki told us. It was the wisest thing to do, considering the things that I cannot explain. Yes, I had the floor of that big cellar up, for I had a feeling I might find something there to give me some light. But there was nothing. You know, the whole thing is tremendous and extraordinary. I shall never forget the look on Parskett's face, and afterward the disgusting sounds of those great hooves going away through the quiet house. Carnacki stood up. Out you go, he said in a friendly fashion, using the recognized formula, and we went presently out into the quiet of the embankment, and so to our homes. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Searcher of the End House It was still evening, as I remember, and the four of us, Jessop, Arkwright, Taylor, and I, looked disappointedly at Carnacki, where he sat silent in his great chair. We had come in response to the usual card of invitation, which, as you know, we have come to consider a sure prelude to a good story. And now, after telling us the short incident of the three straw platters, he had lapsed into a contented silence, and the night not half gone, as I have hinted. However, as it chanced, some pitying fate jogged Carnacki's elbow, or his memory, and he began again in his queer level way. The straw platters business reminds me of the searcher's case, which I have sometimes thought might interest you. It was some time ago, in fact, a deuce of a long time ago, that the thing happened, and my experience of what I might term curious things was very small at that time. I was living with my mother when it occurred, in a small house just outside of Appledorn on the south coast. The house was the last of a row of detached cottage villas, each house standing in its own gardens, and very dainty little places they were, very old and most of them smothered in roses, and all with those quaint old leaded windows and doors of genuine oak. You must try to picture them for the sake of their complete niceness. Now I must remind you at the beginning that my mother and I had lived in that little house for two years, and in the whole of that time there had not been a single peculiar happening to worry us. And then something happened. It was about two o'clock one morning, as I was finishing some letters, that I heard the door of my mother's bedroom open, and she came to the top of the stairs and knocked on the banisters. All right, dear, I called for I suppose she was merely reminding me that I should have been in bed long ago. Then I heard her go back to her room, and I hurried my work, for fear she would lie awake until she heard me safe up to my room. When I was finished, I lit my candle, put out the lamp, and went upstairs. As I came opposite the door of my mother's room, I saw that it was open, called good night to her very softly, and asked whether I should close the door. As there was no answer, I knew that she had dropped off to sleep again, and I closed the door very gently and turned into my room, just across the passage. As I did so, I experienced a momentary, half-aware sense of a faint, peculiar, disagreeable odor in the passage. But it was not until the following night that I realized I had noticed a smell that offended me. You follow me? It is so often like that, one suddenly knows a thing that really recorded itself on one's consciousness, perhaps a year before. 
The next morning at breakfast I mentioned casually to my mother that she had dropped off and I had shut the door for her. To my surprise she assured me she had never been out of her room. I reminded her about the two raps she had given upon the banister, but she still was certain I must be mistaken, and in the end I teased her, saying she had grown so accustomed to my bad habit of sitting up late that she had come to call me in her sleep. Of course she denied this, and I let the matter drop but I was more than a little puzzled, and did not know whether to believe my own explanation, or to take the matter's, which was to put the noises down to the mice, and the open door to the fact that she couldn't have properly latched it when she went to bed. I suppose, away in the subconscious part of me, I had a stirring of less reasonable thoughts, but certainly I had no real uneasiness at that time. The next night there came a further development, about 2.30 a.m. I heard my mother's door open, just as on the previous night, and immediately afterward she rapped sharply on the banister as it seemed to me. I stopped my work and called up that I would not be long. As she made no reply and I did not hear her go back to bed, I had a quick sense of wonder whether she might not be doing it in her sleep after all, just as I had said. With the thought I stood up, and taking the lamp from the table began to go toward the door, which was open into the passage. It was then I got a sudden nasty sort of thrill, for it came to me, all at once, that my mother never knocked. When I sat up late she always called. You will understand I was not really frightened in any way, only vaguely uneasy, and pretty sure she must really be doing the thing in her sleep. I went quickly up the stairs, and when I came to the top my mother was not there, but her door was open. I had a bewildered sense, though believing she must have gone quietly back to bed without my hearing her. I entered her room and found her sleeping quietly and naturally, for the vague sense of trouble in me was sufficiently strong as to make me go over to look at her. When I was sure that she was perfectly right in every way, I was still a little bothered, but much more inclined to think my suspicion correct and that she had gone quietly back to bed in her sleep, without knowing what she had been doing. This was the most reasonable thing to think, as you must see. And then it came to me, suddenly, that vague, queer, mildewy smell in the room. And it was in that instant I became aware I had smelt the same strange, uncertain smell the night before in the passage. I was definitely uneasy now, and began to search my mother's room, though with no aim or clear thought of anything except to assure myself that there was nothing in the room. All the time, you know, I never expected really to find anything, only my uneasiness had to be assured. In the middle of my search my mother woke up, and of course I had to explain. I told her about her door opening and the knocks on the banister, and that I had come up and found her asleep. I said nothing about the smell, which was not very distinct, but told her that the thing happening twice had made me a bit nervous and possibly fanciful, and I thought I would take a look round just to feel satisfied. I have thought since that the reason I made no mention of the smell was not only that I did not want to frighten my mother, for I was scarcely that myself, but because I had only a vague half-knowledge that I associated the smell with fancies too indefinite and peculiar to bear talking about. You will understand that I am able now to analyze and put the thing into words, but then I did not even know my chief reason for saying nothing, let alone appreciate its possible significance. It was my mother, after all, who put part of my vague sensations into words. What a disagreeable smell, she exclaimed, and was silent a moment looking at me. Then, you feel there's something wrong? still looking at me, very quietly, but with a little nervous note of questioning expectancy. I don't know, I said. I can't understand it unless you've really been walking about in your sleep. The smell, she said. Yes, I replied, that's what puzzles me too. I'll take a walk through the house, but I don't suppose it's anything. I lit her candle, and taking the lamp I went through the other bedrooms, and afterward all over the house, including the three underground cellars, which was a little trying on the nerves, seeing that I was more nervous than I would admit. Then I went back to my mother, and told her that there was really nothing to bother about, and you know, in the end, we talked ourselves into believing it was nothing. My mother would not agree that she might have been sleepwalking, but she was ready to put the door opening down to the fault of the latch, which certainly snicked very lightly. 
As for the knocks, they might be the old warped woodwork of the house cracking a bit, or a mouse rattling a piece of loose plaster. The smell was more difficult to explain, but finally we agreed that it might easily be the queer night smell of the moist earth coming in through the open window of my mother's room, from the back garden, or, for that matter, from the little churchyard beyond the big wall at the bottom of the garden. And so we quietened down, and finally I went to bed and to sleep. I think this is certainly a lesson in the way we humans can delude ourselves, for there was not one of these explanations that my reason could really accept. Try to imagine yourself in the same circumstances, and you will see how absurd our attempts to explain the happenings really were. In the morning, when I came down to breakfast, we talked it all over again, and whilst we agreed that it was strange, we also agreed that we had begun to imagine funny things in the backs of our minds, which now we felt half ashamed to admit. This is very strange when you come to look into it, but very human. And then, that night again, my mother's door was slammed once more just after midnight. I caught up the lamp, and when I reached her door, I found it shut. I opened it quickly and went in, to find my mother lying with her eyes open and rather nervous, having been waked by the bang of the door. But what upset me more than anything was the fact that there was a disgusting smell in the passage and in her room. Whilst I was asking her whether she was all right, a door slammed twice downstairs, and you can imagine how it made me feel. My mother and I looked at one another, and then I lit her candle, and taking the poker from the fender, went downstairs with the lamp, beginning to feel really nervous. The cumulative effect of so many queer happenings was getting hold of me, and all the apparently reasonable explanations seemed futile. The horrible smell seemed to be very strong in the downstairs passage, also in the front room and the cellars, but chiefly in the passage. I made a very thorough search of the house, and when I had finished I knew that all the lower windows and doors were properly shut and fastened, and that there was no living thing in the house beyond our two selves. Then I went up to my mother's room again, and we talked the thing over for an hour or more, and in the end came to the conclusion that we might, after all, be reading too much into a number of little things. But you know, inside of us we did not believe this. Later, when we had talked ourselves into a more comfortable state of mind, I said good night and went off to bed, and presently managed to get to sleep. In the early hours of the morning, whilst it was still dark, I was waked by a loud noise. I sat up in bed and listened, and from downstairs I heard, bang, 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 one door after another being slammed, at least that is the impression the sounds gave to me. I jumped out of bed, with the tingle and shiver of sudden fright on me, and at the same moment, as I lit my candle, my door was pushed slowly open. I had left it unlatched, so as not to feel that my mother was quite shut off from me. "'Who's there?' I shouted out, in a voice twice as deep as my natural one, and with a queer breathlessness that sudden fright so often gives one. "'Who's there?' Then I heard my mother saying, "'It's me, Thomas.' Whatever is happening downstairs? She was in the room by this, and I saw that she had her bedroom poker in one hand and her candle in the other. I could have smiled at her had it not been for the extraordinary sounds downstairs. I got into my slippers and reached down an old sword bayonet from the wall. Then I picked up my candle and begged my mother not to come, but I knew it would be of little use if she had made up her mind, and she had, with the result that she acted as a sort of rear-guard for me during our search. I know, in some ways, I was very glad to have her with me, as you will understand. By this time, the door's slamming had ceased, and there seemed, probably because of the contrast, to be an appalling silence in the house. However, I led the way, holding my candle high and keeping the sword bayonet very handy. Downstairs we found all the doors wide open, although the outer doors and the windows were closed all right. I began to wonder whether the noises had been made by the doors after all. Of one thing only were we sure, and that was, there was no living thing in the house, besides ourselves, while everywhere throughout the house there was the taint of that disgusting odor. Of course it was absurd to try to make believe any longer. There was something strange about the house, and as soon as it was daylight, I set my mother to packing, 
and soon after breakfast I saw her off by train. Then I set to work to try to clear up the mystery. I went first to the landlord and told him all the circumstances. From him I found that twelve or fifteen years back the house had got rather a curious name from three or four tenants, with the result that it had remained empty for a long while. In the end he had let it at a low rent to a Captain Tobias, on the one condition that he should hold his tongue if he saw anything peculiar. The landlord's idea, as he told me frankly, was to free the house from these tales of something queer by keeping a tenant in it, and then to sell it for the best price he could get. However, when Captain Tobias left, after a ten years' tenancy, there was no longer any talk about the house, so when I offered to take it on a five years' lease, he had jumped at the offer. This was the whole story, so he gave me to understand. When I pressed him for details of the supposed peculiar happenings in the house all those years back, he said the tenants had talked about a woman who always moved about the house at night. Some tenants never saw anything, but others would not stay out the first month's tenancy. One thing the landlord was particular to point out, that no tenant had ever complained about knockings or door slamming. As for the smell, he seemed positively indignant about it, but why, I don't suppose he knew himself, except that he probably had some vague feeling that it was an indirect accusation on my part that the drains were not right. In the end, I suggested that he should come down and spend the night with me. He agreed at once, especially as I told him I intended to keep the whole business quiet and try to get to the bottom of the curious affair, for he was anxious to keep the rumor of the haunting from getting about. About three o'clock that afternoon he came down, and we made a thorough search of the house, which, however, revealed nothing unusual. Afterward, the landlord made one or two tests, which showed him the drainage was in perfect order. After that, we made our preparations for sitting up all night. First, we borrowed two policemen's dark lanterns from the station nearby, and where the superintendent and I were friendly, and as soon as it was really dusk, the landlord went up to his house for his gun. I had the sword bayonet I have told you about, and when the landlord got back, we sat talking in my study until nearly midnight. Then we lit the lanterns and went upstairs. We placed the lanterns, gun, and bayonet handy on the table. Then I shut and sealed the bedroom doors. Afterward, we took our seats and turned off the lights. From then until two o'clock, nothing happened. But a little after two, as I found by holding my watch near the faint glow of the closed lanterns, I had a time of extraordinary nervousness, and I bent toward the landlord and whispered to him that I had a queer feeling something was about to happen, and to be ready with his lantern. At the same time, I reached out toward mine. In the very instant I made this movement, the darkness which filled the passage seemed to become suddenly of a dull violet color, not as if a light had been shown, but as if the natural blackness of the night had changed color. And then, coming through this violet night, through this violet-colored gloom, came a little naked child, running. In an extraordinary way, the child seemed not to be distinct from the surrounding gloom, but almost as if it were a concentration of that extraordinary atmosphere, as if that gloomy color which had changed the night came from the child. It seems impossible to make clear to you, but try to understand it. The child went past me, running, with the natural movement of the legs of a chubby human child, but in an absolute and inconceivable silence. It was a very small child, and must have passed under the table, but I saw the child through the table, as if it had been only a slightly darker shadow than the colored gloom. In the same instant I saw that a fluctuating glimmer of violet light outlined the metal of the gun barrels and the blade of the sword bayonet making them seem like faint shapes of glimmering light, floating unsupported where the tabletop should have shown solid. Now, curiously, as I saw these things, I was subconsciously aware that I heard the anxious breathing of the landlord, quite clear and labored, close to my elbow, where he waited nervously with his hands on the lantern. I realized in that moment that he saw nothing, but waited in the darkness for my warning to come true. Even as I took heed of these minor things, I saw the child jump to one side, and hide behind some half-seen object that was certainly nothing belonging to the passage. I stared intently, 
with a most extraordinary thrill of expectant wonder, with fright making goose-flesh of my back, and even as I stared I solved for myself the less important problem of what the two black clouds were that hung over a part of the table. I think it very curious and interesting, the double working of the mind, often so much more apparent during times of stress. The two clouds came from two faintly shining shapes, which I knew must be the metal of the lanterns, and the things that looked black to the sight with which I was then seeing could be nothing else than to what a normal human sight is known as light. This phenomenon I have always remembered. I have twice seen a somewhat similar thing, in the dark light case, and in that trouble of Matheson's, which you know about. Even as I understood this matter of the lights, I was looking to my left, to understand why the child was hiding. And suddenly I heard the landlord shout out, THE WOMAN! But I saw nothing. I had a disagreeable sense that something repugnant was near to me, and I was aware in the same moment that the landlord was gripping my arm, in a hard, frightened grip. Then I was looking back to where the child had hidden. I saw the child peeping out from behind its hiding place, seeming to be looking up the passage, but whether in fear I could not tell. Then it came out and ran headlong away, through the place where should have been the wall of my mother's bedroom, but the sense with which I was seeing these things showed me the wall only as a vague, upright shadow, unsubstantial and immediately the child was lost to me in the dull, violent gloom. At the same time I felt the landlord press back against me, as if something had passed close to him, and he called out again, a hoarse sort of cry, THE WOMAN! THE WOMAN! and turned the shade clumsily from off his lantern. But I had seen no woman, and the passage showed empty as he shone the beam of his light jerkily to and fro, but chiefly in the direction of the doorway of my mother's room. He was still clutching my arm, and had risen to his feet, and now, mechanically, and almost slowly, I picked up my lantern and turned on the light. I shone it a little dazedly at the seals upon the doors, but none were broken. Then I sent the light to and fro, up and down the passage, but there was nothing. And I turned to the landlord, who was saying something in a rather incoherent fashion. As my light passed over his face, I noted, in a dull sort of way, that he was drenched with sweat. Then my wits became more handleable, and I began to catch the drift of his words. Did you see her? Did you see her? He was saying, over and over again. And then I found myself telling him, in quite a level voice, that I had not seen any woman. He became more coherent then, and I found that he had seen a woman come from the end of the passage and go past us, but he could not describe her except that she kept stopping and looking about her, and had even peered at the wall close beside him, as if looking for something. But what seemed to trouble him most was that she had not seemed to see him at all. He repeated this so often that in the end I told him, in an absurd sort of way, that he ought to be very glad she had not. What did it all mean was the question. Somehow I was not so frightened as utterly bewildered. I had seen less then than since, but what I had seen had made me feel adrift from my anchorage of reason. What did it mean? He had seen a woman searching for something. I had not seen this woman. I had seen a child running away and hiding from something or someone. He had not seen the child or the other things, only the woman. And I had not seen her. What did it all mean? I had said nothing to the landlord about the child, I had been too bewildered, and I realized that it would be futile to attempt an explanation. He was already stupid with the thing he had seen, and not the kind of man to understand. All this went through my mind as we stood there, shining the lanterns to and fro. All the time, intermingled with a streak of practical reasoning, I was questioning myself, what did it all mean? What was the woman searching for? What was the child running from? Suddenly, as I stood there, bewildered and nervous, making random answers to the landlord, a door below was violently slammed, and directly I caught the horrible reek of which I have told you. There, I said to the landlord, and caught his arm in my turn. The smell! Do you smell it? 
He looked at me so stupidly that, in a sort of nervous anger, I shook him. Yes, he said in a queer voice, trying to shine the light from his shaking lantern at the stairhead. Come on, I said, and picked up my bayonet, and he came, carrying his gun awkwardly. I think he came, more because he was afraid to be left alone than because he had any pluck left, poor beggar. I never sneer at that kind of funk, at least very seldom, for when it takes you it makes rags of your courage. I led the way downstairs, shining my light into the lower passage, and afterward at the doors to see whether they were shut, for I had closed and latched them, placing a corner of a mat against each door, so I should know which had been opened. I saw at once that none of the doors had been opened. Then I threw the beam of my light down alongside the stairway, in order to see the mat I had placed against the door at the top of the cellar stairs. I got a horrid thrill, for the mat was flat. I paused a couple of seconds, shining my light to and fro in the passage, and holding fast to my courage, I went down the stairs. As I came to the bottom step, I saw patches of wet all up and down the passage. I shone my lantern on them. It was the imprint of a wet foot on the oilcloth of the passage, not an ordinary footprint, but a queer, soft, flabby, spreading imprint that gave me a feeling of extraordinary horror. Backward and forward I flashed the light over the impossible marks, and saw them everywhere. Suddenly I noticed that they led to each of the closed doors. I felt something touch my back, and glanced round swiftly to find the landlord had come close to me, almost pressing against me in his fear. "'It's all right,' I said, but in a rather breathless whisper, meaning to put a little courage into him, for I could feel that he was shaking through all his body. Even then, as I tried to get him steadied enough to be of some use, his gun went off with a tremendous bang. He jumped and yelled with sheer terror, and I swore because of the shock. "'Give it to me, for God's sake,' I said, and slipped the gun from his hand. And in the same instant there was a sound of running steps up the garden path, and immediately the flash of a bull's-eye lantern upon the fanlight over the front door. Then the door was tried, and directly afterward there came a thunderous knocking, which told me a policeman had heard the shot. I went to the door and opened it. Fortunately, the constable knew me, and when I had beckoned him in, I was able to explain matters in a very short time. While doing this, Inspector Johnstone came up the path, having missed the officer, and seeing lights on the open door. I told him as briefly as possible what had occurred, and did not mention the child or the woman, for it would have seemed too fantastic for him to notice. I showed him the queer wet footprints and how they went toward the closed doors. I explained quickly about the mats and how that the one against the cellar door was flat, which showed that the door had been opened. The inspector nodded and told the constable to guard the door at the top of the cellar stairs. He then asked the hall lamp to be lit, after which he took the policeman's lantern and led the way into the front room. He paused with the door wide open and threw the light all round. Then he jumped into the room and looked behind the door. There was no one there, but all over the polished oak floor, between the scattered rugs, went the marks of those horrible spreading footprints, and the room permeated with that horrible odor. The inspector searched the room carefully, then went into the middle room, using the same precautions. There was nothing in the middle room, or in the kitchen, or pantry, but everywhere went the wet footmarks through all the rooms, showing plainly wherever there were woodwork or oilcloth, and always there was the smell. The inspector ceased from his search of the rooms, and spent a minute in trying whether the mats would really fall flat when the doors were open, or merely ruckle up in a way as to appear they had been untouched, but in each case the mats fell flat and remained so. Extraordinary, I heard Johnstone mutter to himself, and then he went toward the cellar door. He had inquired at first whether there were windows to the cellar, and when he learned there was no way out except by the door, he had left this part of the search to the last. As Johnstone came up to the door, the policeman made a motion of salute, and said something in a low voice, and something in the tone made me flick my light across him. I saw then that the man was very white, and he looked strange and bewildered. What? said Johnstone impatiently. Speak up! A woman came along here, sir, and went through this ear door, said the constable clearly, but with a curious monotonous intonation that is sometimes heard from an unintelligent man. Speak up! shouted the inspector. 
"'A woman came along and went through this ear door,' repeated the man monotonously. The inspector caught the man by the shoulder and deliberately sniffed his breath. "'No,' he said, and then sarcastically, "'I hope you held the door open politely for the lady.' "'The door weren't open, sir,' said the man simply. "'Are you mad?' began Johnstone. "'No,' broke in the landlord's voice from the back, speaking steadily enough. "'I saw the woman upstairs.' It was evident that he had got back his control again. "'I'm afraid, Inspector Johnstone,' I said, "'that there is more in this than you think. "'I certainly saw some very extraordinary things upstairs.' The inspector seemed to be about to say something, but instead he turned again to the door and flashed his light down and round about the mat. I saw then that the strange, horrible footmarks came straight up to the cellar door, and the last print showed under the door, yet the policeman said the door had not been opened. And suddenly, without any intention or realization of what I was saying, I asked the landlord, What were the feet like? I received no answer, for the inspector was ordering the constable to open the cellar door, and the man was not obeying. Johnstone repeated the order, and at last, in a queer, automatic way, the man obeyed and pushed the door open. The loathsome smell beat up at us in a great wave of horror, and the inspector came backward a step. "'My God!' he said, and went forward again, and shone his light down the steps. But there was nothing visible only that on each step showed the unnatural footprints. The inspector brought the beam of the light vividly on the top step, and there, clear in the light, there was something small, moving. The inspector bent to look, and the policeman and I with him. I don't want to disgust you, but the thing we looked at was a maggot. The policeman backed suddenly out of the doorway. The churchyard, he said, at the back of the house! Silence, said Johnstone, with a queer break in the word, and I knew that at last he was frightened. He put his lantern into the doorway and shone it from step to step, following the footprints down into the darkness. Then he stepped back from the open doorway, and we all gave back with him. He looked round, and I had a feeling that he was looking for a weapon of some kind. Your gun, I said to the landlord, and he brought it from the front hall and passed it over to the inspector who took it and ejected the empty shell from the right barrel. He held out his hand for a live cartridge, which the landlord brought from his pocket. He loaded the gun and snapped the breech. He turned to the constable. Come on, he said, and moved toward the cellar doorway. I ain't coming, sir, said the policeman, very white in the face. With a sudden blaze of passion, the inspector took the man by the scruff and hove him bodily down into the darkness, and he went downward, screaming. The inspector followed him instantly with his lantern and the gun, and I after the inspector with the bayonet ready. Behind me I heard the landlord. At the bottom of the stairs the inspector was helping the policeman to his feet, where he stood swaying a moment in a bewildered fashion. Then the inspector went into the front cellar, and his man followed him in a stupid fashion, but evidently no longer with any thought of running away from the horror. We all crowded into the front cellar, flashing our lights to and fro. Inspector Johnstone was examining the floor, and I saw that the footmarks went all round the cellar, into all the corners, and across the floor. I thought suddenly of the child that was running away from something. Do you see the thing that I was seeing, vaguely? We went out of the cellar in a body, for there was nothing to be found. In the next cellar the footprints went everywhere in that queer, erratic fashion, as if someone were searching for something, or following some blind scent. In the third cellar the prince ended at the shallow well that had been the old water supply of the house. The well was full to the brim, and the water so clear that the pebbly bottom was plainly to be seen, as we shone the lights into the water. The search came to an abrupt end, and we stood about the well, looking at one another, in an absolute horrible silence. Johnstone made another examination of the footprints, then he shone his light again into the clear shallow water, searching each inch of the plainly seen bottom, but there was nothing there. The cellar was full of the dreadful smell, and everyone stood silent except for the constant turning of the lamps to and fro around the cellar. The inspector looked up from his search of the well and nodded quietly across at me, with his sudden acknowledgment that our belief was now his belief. The smell in the cellar seemed to grow more dreadful, and to be, as it were, a menace, 
and material expression that some monstrous thing was there with us, invisible. I think, began the inspector, and shone his light toward the stairway, and at this the constable's restraint went utterly, and he ran for the stairs, making a queer sound in his throat. The landlord followed at a quick walk, and then the inspector and I. He waited a single instant for me, and we went up together, treading on the same steps, and with our lights held backward. At the top I slammed and locked the stair door and wiped my forehead, and my hands were shaking. The inspector asked me to give his man a glass of whiskey, and then he sent him on his beat. He stayed a short while with the landlord and me, and it was arranged that he would join us again the following night and watch the well with us from midnight until daylight. Then he left us just as the dawn was coming in. The landlord and I locked up the house and went over to his place for a sleep. In the afternoon, the landlord and I returned to the house to make arrangements for the night. He was very quiet, and I felt that he was to be relied on now that he had been salted, as it were, with his fright of the previous night. We opened all the doors and windows and blew the house through very thoroughly, and in the meanwhile we lit the lamps in the house and took them into the cellars, where we set them all about so as to have light everywhere. Then we carried down three chairs and a table and set them in the cellar where the well was sunk. After that, we stretched thin piano wire across the cellar, about nine inches from the floor, at such a height that it should catch anything moving about in the dark. When this was done, I went through the house with the landlord and sealed every window and door in the place, excepting only the front door and the door at the top of the cellar stairs. Meanwhile, a local wiresmith was making something to my order, and when the landlord and I had finished tea at his house, we went down to see how the smith was getting on. We found the thing complete. It looked rather like a huge parrot's cage, without any bottom, a very heavy gauge wire, and stood about seven feet high and was four feet in diameter. Fortunately, I remembered to have it made longitudinally in two halves, or else we should never have got it through the doorways and down the cellar stairs. I told the wiresmith to bring the cage up to the house so he could fit the two halves rigidly together. As we returned, I called in at an ironmonger's, where I bought some thin hemp rope and an iron rack pulley, like those used in Lancashire for hauling up the ceiling clothes racks, which you will find in every cottage. I bought also a couple of pitchforks. We shan't want to touch it, I said to the landlord, and he nodded, rather white all at once. As soon as the cage arrived and had been fitted together in the cellar, I sent away the smith, and the landlord and I suspended it over the well, into which it fitted easily. After a lot of trouble, we managed to hang it so perfectly central from the rope over the iron pulley, that when hoisted to the ceiling and dropped, it went every time plunk into the well like a candle extinguisher. When we had it finely arranged, I hoisted it up once more, to the ready position, and made the rope fast to a heavy wooden pillar, which stood in the middle of the cellar. By ten o'clock I had everything arranged, with the two pitchforks and the two police lanterns, also some whiskey and sandwiches. Underneath the table I had several buckets full of disinfectant. A little after eleven o'clock there was a knock at the front door, and when I went I found Inspector Johnstone had arrived, and brought with him one of his plain clothes men. You will understand how pleased I was to see there would be this addition to our watch, for he looked a tough, nerveless man, brainy and collected, and one I should have picked to help us with the horrible job I felt pretty sure we should have to do that night. When the inspector and detective had entered, I shut and locked the front door. Then, while the inspector held the light, I sealed the door carefully with tape and wax. At the head of the cellar's stairs, I shut and locked that door also, and sealed it in the same way. As we entered the cellar, I warned Johnstone and his man to be careful not to fall over the wires, and then, as I saw his surprise at my arrangements, I began to explain my ideas and intentions, to all of which he listened with strong approval. I was pleased to see also that the detective was nodding his head as I talked, in a way that showed he appreciated all my precautions. As he put his lantern down, the inspector picked up one of the pitchforks and balanced it in his hand. He looked at me and nodded. The best thing, he said. I only wish you'd got two more. Then we all took our seats, the detective getting a washing stool from the corner of the cellar. From then until a quarter to twelve, we talked quietly, whilst we made a light supper of whiskey and sandwiches, 
after which we cleared everything off the table, excepting the lanterns and the pitchforks. One of the latter I handed to the inspector, the other I took myself, and then, having set my chair so as to be handy to the rope which lowered the cage into the well, I went round the cellar and put out every lamp. I groped my way to my chair and arranged the pitchfork and the dark lantern ready to my hand, after which I suggested that everyone should keep an absolute silence throughout the watch. I asked also that no lantern should be turned on until I gave the word. I put my watch on the table where a faint glow from my lantern made me able to see the time. For an hour nothing happened, and everyone kept an absolute silence, except for an occasional uneasy movement. About half-past one, however, I was conscious again of the same extraordinary and peculiar nervousness which I had felt on the previous night. I put my hand out quickly and eased the hitch rope from around the pillar. The inspector seemed aware of the movement, for I saw the faint light from his lantern move a little, as if he had suddenly taken hold of it in readiness. A minute later I noticed there was a change in the color of the night in the cellar, and it grew slowly violent-tinted upon my eyes. I glanced to and fro quickly in the new darkness, and even as I looked I was conscious that the violet color deepened in the direction of the well, but seeming at a great distance. There was, as it were, a nucleus to the change, and the nucleus came swiftly toward us, appearing to come from a great space, almost in a single moment. It came near, and I saw again that it was a little, naked child, running, and seeming to be of the violet night in which it ran. The child came with a natural running movement, exactly as I described it before, but in a silence so peculiarly intense that it was as if it brought the silence with it. About halfway between the well and the table, the child turned swiftly and looked back at something invisible to me, and suddenly it went down into a crouching attitude, and seemed to be hiding behind something that showed vaguely, but there was nothing there except the bare floor of the cellar, nothing, I mean, of our world. I could hear the breathing of the three other men with wonderful distinctness, and also the tick of my watch upon the table seemed to sound as loud and as slow as the tick of an old grandfather's clock. Some way I knew that none of the others saw what I was seeing. Abruptly the landlord, who was next to me, let out his breath with a little hissing sound. I knew then that something was visible to him. There came a creak from the table, and I had a feeling that the inspector was leaning forward, looking at something that I could not see. The landlord reached out his hand through the darkness and fumbled a moment to catch my arm. The woman, he whispered close to my ear, over by the well. I stared hard in that direction, but saw nothing except that the violet color of the cellar seemed a little duller just there. I looked back quickly to the vague place where the child was hiding. I saw it was peering back from its hiding place. Suddenly it rose and ran straight for the middle of the table, which showed only as a vague shadow halfway between my eyes and the unseen floor. As the child ran under the table, the steel prongs of my pitchfork glimmered with a violet, fluctuating light. A little way off, there showed, high up in the gloom, the vaguely shining outline of the other fork, so I knew that the inspector had raised it in his hand, ready. There was no doubt but that he saw something. On the table, the metal of the five lanterns shone with the same strange glow, and about each lantern there was a little cloud of absolute blackness, with a phenomenon that is light to our natural eyes, came through the fittings. And in this complete darkness, the metal of each lantern showed plain, as might a cat's eye in a nest of black cotton wool. Just beyond the table, the child paused again, and stood, seeming to oscillate a little upon its feet, which gave the impression that it was lighter and vaguer than a thistle-down. And yet, in the same moment, Another part of me seemed to know that it was to me as something that might be beyond thick invisible glass and subject to conditions and forces that I was unable to comprehend. The child was looking back again, and my gaze went the same way. I stared across the cellar and saw the cage hanging clear in the violet light, every wire and tie outlined with its glimmering. Above it there was a little space of gloom, and then the dull shining of the iron pulley which I had screwed into the ceiling. 
I stared in a bewildered way round the cellar. There were thin lines of vague fire crossing the floor in all directions, and suddenly I remembered the piano wire that the landlord and I had stretched. But there was nothing else to be seen except that near the table there were indistinct glimmerings of light, and at the far end the outline of a dull glowing revolver, evidently in the detective's pocket. I remember a sort of subconscious satisfaction as I settled the point in a queer, automatic fashion. On the table near to me there was a little shapeless collection of the light, and this I knew, after an instant's consideration, to be the steel portions of my watch. I had looked several times at the child and round at the cellar, whilst I was decided these trifles, and had found it still in that attitude of hiding from something. But now, suddenly, it ran clear away into the distance, and was nothing more than a slightly deeper colored nucleus far away in the strange colored atmosphere. The landlord gave out a queer little cry, and twisted over against me as if to avoid something. From the inspector there came a sharp breathing sound as if he had been suddenly drenched with cold water. Then suddenly the violet color went out of the night, and I was conscious of the nearness of something monstrous and repugnant. There was a tense silence, and the blackness of the cellar seemed absolute, with only the faint glow about each of the lanterns on the table. Then, in the darkness and the silence, there came a faint tinkle of water from the well, as if something were rising noiselessly out of it, and the water running back with a gentle tinkling. In the same instant, there came to me a sudden waft of the awful smell. I gave a sharp cry of warning to the inspector and loosed the rope. There came instantly the sharp splash of the cage entering the water, and then, with a stiff, frightened movement, I opened the shutter of my lantern and shone the light at the cage, shouting to the others to do the same. As my light struck the cage, I saw that about two feet of it projected from the top of the well, and there was something protruding up out of the water, into the cage. I stared with a feeling that I recognized the thing, and then, as the other lanterns were opened, I saw that it was a leg of mutton. The thing was held by a brawny fist and arm that rose out of the water. I stood utterly bewildered, watching to see what was coming. In a moment there rose into view a great bearded face that I felt for one quick instant was the face of a drowned man, long dead. Then the face opened at the mouth part, and spluttered and coughed. Another big hand came into view and wiped the water from the eyes, which blinked rapidly and then fixed themselves into a stare at the lights. From the detective there came a sudden shout. "'Captain Tobias!' he shouted, and the inspector echoed him, and instantly burst into loud roars of laughter. The inspector and the detective ran across the cellar to the cage, and I followed, still bewildered, the man in the cage was holding the leg of mutton as far away from him as possible, and holding his nose. "'Lift this dab trap quick!' he shouted in a stifled voice. But the inspector and the detective simply doubled before him and tried to hold their noses whilst they laughed, and the light from their lanterns went dancing all over the place. "'Quig! Quig!' said the man in the cage, still holding his nose and trying to speak plainly. Then Johnstone and the detective stopped laughing and lifted the cage. The man in the well threw the leg across the cellar and turned swiftly to go down into the well, but the officers were too quick for him and had him out in a twinkling. Whilst they held him, dripping upon the floor, the inspector jerked his thumb in the direction of the offending leg, and the landlord, having harpooned it with one of the pitchforks, ran with it upstairs and so into the open air. Meanwhile, I had given the man from the well a stiff tot of whiskey, for which he thanked me with a cheerful nod, and having emptied the glass in a draught, held his hand for the bottle, which he finished as if it had been so much water. As you will remember, it was a Captain Tobias who had been the previous tenant, and this was the very man who had appeared from the well. In the course of the talk that followed, I learned the reason for Captain Tobias leaving the house, he had been wanted by the police for smuggling. He had undergone imprisonment and had been released only a couple of weeks earlier. He had returned to find new tenants in his old home. He had entered the house through the well, the walls of which were not continued to the bottom. This I will deal with later. 
and gone up by a little stairway in the cellar wall, which opened at the top through a panel beside my mother's bedroom. This panel was opened by revolving the left doorpost of the bedroom door, with the result that the bedroom door always became unlatched in the process of opening the panel. The captain complained, without any bitterness, that the panel had warped and that each time he opened it, it made a cracking noise. This had evidently been what I mistook for raps. He would not give his reason for entering the house, but it was pretty obvious that he had hidden something which he wanted to get. However, as he found it impossible to get into the house without the risk of being caught, he decided to try to drive us out, relying on the bad reputation of the house and his own artistic efforts as a ghost. I must say he succeeded. He intended then to rent the house again as before, and would then, of course, have plenty of time to get whatever he had hidden. The house suited him admirably, for there was a passage, as he showed me afterward, connecting the dummy well with the crypt of the church beyond the garden wall, and these, in turn, were connected with certain caves in the cliffs, which went down to the beach beyond the church. In the course of his talk, Captain Tobias offered to take the house off my hands, and as this suited me perfectly, for I was about stalled with it, and the plan also suited the landlord, it was decided that no steps should be taken against him, and that the whole business should be hushed up. I asked the captain whether there was really anything queer about the house, whether he had ever seen anything. He said yes, that he had twice seen a woman going about the house. We all looked at one another when the captain said that. He told us she never bothered him, and that he had only seen her twice, and on each occasion it had followed a narrow escape from the revenue people. Captain Tobias was an observant man. He had seen how I had placed the mats against the doors, and after entering the rooms and walking all about them so as to leave the footmarks of an old pair of wet woolen slippers everywhere, he had deliberately put the mats back as he found them. The maggot which had dropped from his disgusting leg of mutton had been an accident, and beyond even his horrible planning. He was hugely delighted to learn how it had affected us. The moldy smell I had noticed was from the little closed stairway when the captain opened the panel. The door slamming was also another of his contributions. I come now to the end of the captain's ghost play, and to the difficulty of trying to explain the other peculiar things. In the first place, it was obvious there was something genuinely strange in the house, which made itself manifest as a woman. Many different people had seen this woman, under differing circumstances, so it is impossible to put the thing down to fancy. At the same time, it must seem extraordinary that I should have lived two years in the house and seen nothing, whilst the policeman saw the woman before he had been there twenty minutes. The landlord, the detective, and the inspector all saw her. I can only surmise that fear was in every case the key, as I might say, which opened the senses to the presence of the woman. The policeman was a highly strung man, and when he became frightened was able to see the woman. The same reasoning applies all round. I saw nothing, until I became really frightened. Then I saw, not the woman, but a child, running away from something, or someone. However, I will touch on that later. In short, until a very strong degree of fear was present, no one was affected by the force which made itself evident as a woman. My theory explains why some tenants were never aware of anything strange in the house, whilst others left immediately. The more sensitive they were, the less would be the degree of fear necessary to make them aware of the force present in the house. The peculiar shining of all the metal objects in the cellar had been visible only to me. The cause, naturally, I do not know. Neither do I know why I, alone, was able to see the shining. The child, I asked, can you explain that part at all? Why you didn't see the woman, but why they didn't see the child? Was it merely the same force, peering differently to different people? No, said Carnacki, I can't explain that. But I am quite sure that the woman and the child were not only two complete and different entities, but even they were each not in quite the same planes of existence. To give you a root idea, however, it is held in the Sigsand manuscript 
that a child still born is snatched back by the hags. This is crude, but yet may contain an elemental truth. Yet before I make this clear, let me tell you a thought that has often been made. It may be that physical birth is but a secondary process, and that prior to the possibility, the mother spirit searches for, until it finds, the small element, the primal ego or child's soul. It may be that a certain waywardness would cause such to strive to evade capture by the mother spirit. It may have been such a thing as this that I saw. I have always tried to think so, but it is impossible to ignore the sense of repulsion that I felt when the unseen woman went past me. This repulsion carries forward the idea suggested in the Sigsand manuscript, that a stillborn child is thus because its ego or spirit has been snatched back by the hags, in other words, by certain of the monstrosities of the outer circle. The thought is inconceivably terrible, and probably the more so because it is so fragmentary. It leaves us with the conception of a child's soul adrift, halfway between two lives, and running through eternity from something incredible and inconceivable, because not understood, to our senses. The thing is beyond further discussion, for it is futile to attempt to discuss a thing, to any purpose, of which one has knowledge so fragmentary as this. There is one thought which is often mine. Perhaps there is a mother spirit. And the well, said Arkwright, how did the captain get in from the other side? As I said before, answered Carnacki, the side walls of the well did not reach to the bottom, so that you had only to dip down into the water and come up again on the other side of the wall, under the cellar floor, and so climb into the passage. Of course, the water was the same height on both sides of the walls. Don't ask me who made the well entrance or the little stairway, for I don't know. The house was very old, as I told you, and that sort of thing was useful in the old days. And the child, I said, coming back to the thing which chiefly interested me, you would say that the birth must have occurred in that house, and in this way one might suppose that the house to have become en rapport, if I can use the word in that way, with the forces that produced the tragedy. Yes, replied Carnacki, that is, supposing we take the suggestion of the Sigsand manuscript to account for the phenomenon. There may be other houses, I began. There are, said Carnacki, and stood up. Out you go, he said genially, using the recognized formula, and in five minutes we were on the embankment, going thoughtfully to our various homes. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The Thing Invisible Carnacki had just turned to Shane Walk Chelsea. I was aware of this interesting fact by reason of the curt and quaintly worded postcard which I was rereading and by which I was requested to present myself at his house not later than seven o'clock on that evening. Mr. Carnacki had, as I and the others of his strictly limited circle of friends knew, been away in Kent for the past three weeks, but beyond that we had no knowledge. Carnacki was genially secretive and curt and spoke only when he was ready to speak. When this stage arrived, I and his three other friends, Jessop, Arkwright, and Taylor, would receive a card or a wire asking us to call. Not one of us ever willingly missed, for after a thoroughly sensible little dinner, Carnacki would snuggle down into his big armchair, light his pipe, and wait whilst we arranged ourselves comfortably in our accustomed seats and nooks. Then he would begin to talk. On this particular night I was the first to arrive and found Carnacki sitting, quietly smoking over a paper. He stood up, shook me firmly by the hand, pointed to a chair, and sat down again, never having uttered a word. For my part I said nothing either. I knew the man too well to bother him with questions or the weather, and so took a seat and a cigarette. Presently the three others turned up, and after that we spent a comfortable and busy hour at dinner. Dinner over, Carnacki snugged himself down into his great chair, as I have said was his habit, filled his pipe, and puffed for a while, his gaze directed thoughtfully at the fire. 
The rest of us, if I may so express it, made ourselves cozy, each after his own particular manner. A minute or so later, Carnacki began to speak, ignoring any preliminary remarks and going straight to the subject of the story we knew he had to tell. I have just come back from Sir Alfred Jarnock's place in Burtontree in South Kent, he began, without removing his gaze from the fire. Most extraordinary things have been happening down there lately, and Mr. George Jarnock, the eldest son, wired to ask me to run over and see whether I could help to clear matters up a bit. I went. When I got there I found that they have an old chapel attached to the castle, which has had quite a distinguished reputation for being what is popularly termed haunted. They have been rather proud of this, as I managed to discover, until quite lately when something very disagreeable occurred, which served to remind them that family ghosts are not always content, as I might say, to remain purely ornamental. It sounds almost laughable, I know, to hear of a long-respected supernatural phenomenon growing unexpectedly dangerous, and in this case the tale of the haunting was considered as little more than an old myth, except after nightfall, when possibly it became more plausible-seeming. But however this may be, there is no doubt at all but that what I might term the haunting essence which lived in the place had become suddenly dangerous, deadly dangerous too, the old butler being nearly stabbed to death one night in the chapel with a peculiar old dagger. It is, in fact, this dagger which is popularly supposed to haunt the chapel. At least there has been always a story handed down in the family that this dagger would attack any enemy who should dare to venture into the chapel after nightfall. But of course this had been taken with just about the same amount of seriousness that people take most ghost tales, and that is not usually of a worryingly real nature. I mean that most people never quite know how much or how little they believe in matters abhuman or abnormal, and generally they never have an opportunity to learn. And indeed, as you are all aware, I am as big a skeptic concerning the truth of ghost tales as any man you are likely to meet. Only I am what I might term an unprejudiced skeptic. I am not given to either believing or disbelieving things on principle, as I have found many idiots prone to be, and what is more some of them not ashamed to boast of the insane fact. I view all reported hauntings as unproven until I have examined into them, and I am bound to admit that ninety-nine cases in a hundred turn out to be sheer bosh and fancy. But the hundredth! Well, if it were not for the hundredth, I should have few stories to tell you, eh? Of course, after the attack on the butler, it became evident that there was at least something in the old story concerning the dagger, and I found everyone in a half-belief that the queer old weapon did really strike the butler, either by the aid of some inherent force, which I found them peculiarly unable to explain, or else in the hand of some invisible thing or monster of the outer world. From considerable experience I knew that it was much more likely that the butler had been knifed by some vicious and quite material human. Naturally the first thing to do was to test this probability of human agency, and I set to work to make a pretty drastic examination of the people who knew most about the tragedy. The result of this examination both pleased and surprised me, for it left me with very good reasons for belief that I had come upon one of those extraordinary rare true manifestations of the extrusion of a force from the outside, in more popular phraseology, a genuine case of haunting. These are the facts. On the previous Sunday evening but one, Sir Alfred Jarnock's household had attended family service, as usual, in the chapel. You see, the rector goes over to officiate twice each Sunday, after concluding his duties at the public church about three miles away. At the end of the service in the chapel, Sir Alfred Jarnock, his son, Mr. George Jarnock, and the rector had stood for a couple of minutes talking, whilst old Bellet, the butler, went round putting out the candles. Suddenly the rector remembered that he had left his small prayer book on the communion table in the morning. He turned, 
and asked the butler to get it for him before he blew out the chancel candles. Now I have particularly called your attention to this because it is important and that it provides witnesses in a most fortunate manner at an extraordinary moment. You see, the rector's turning to speak to Bellet had naturally caused both Sir Alfred Jarnock and his son to glance in the direction of the butler, and it was at this identical instant, and whilst all three were looking at him, that the old butler was stabbed. There, full in the candlelight, before their eyes. I took the opportunity to call early upon the rector, after I had questioned Mr. George Jarnock, who replied to my queries in place of Sir Alfred Jarnock, for the older man was in a nervous and shaken condition as a result of the happening and his son wished him to avoid dwelling upon the scene as much as possible. The rector's version was clear and vivid, and he had evidently received the astonishment of his life. He pictured to me the whole affair, Bellet up at the chancel gate, going for the prayer book, and absolutely alone, and then the blow, out of the void he described it, and the force prodigious, the old man being driven headlong into the body of the chapel. Like the kick of a great horse, the rector said, and his benevolent old eyes bright and intense with the effort he had actually witnessed, in defiance of all that he had hitherto believed. When I left him, he went back to the writing which he had put aside when I appeared. I feel sure that he was developing the first unorthodox sermon that he had ever evolved. He was a dear old chap, and I should certainly like to have heard it. The last man I visited was the butler. He was, of course, in a frightfully weak and shaken condition, but he could tell me nothing that did not point to there being a power abroad in the chapel. He told the same tale, in every minute particle, that I had learned from the others. He had been just going up to put out the altar candles and fetch the rector's book, when something struck him an enormous blow, high up on the left breast, and he was driven headlong into the aisle. Examination had shown that he had been stabbed by the dagger, of which I will tell you more in a moment, that hung always above the altar. The weapon had entered, fortunately some inches above the heart, just under the collarbone, which had been broken by the stupendous force of the blow, the dagger itself being driven clean through the body and out through the scapula behind. The poor old fellow could not talk much, and I soon left him, but what he had told me was sufficient to make it unmistakable that no living person had been within yards of him when he was attacked, and as I knew, this fact was verified by three capable and responsible witnesses, independent of Bellet himself. The thing now was to search the chapel, which is small and extremely old. It is very massively built and entered through only one door, which leads out of the castle itself, and the keys of which is kept by Sir Alfred Jarnock the butler having no duplicate. The shape of the chapel is oblong, and the altar is railed off after the usual fashion. There are two tombs in the body of the place, but none in the chancel, which is bare except for the two candlesticks and the chancel rail, beyond which is the undraped altar of solid marble, upon which stand four small candlesticks, two at each end. Above the altar hangs the wayful dagger, as I learned it was named. I fancy the term has been taken from an old vellum, which describes the dagger and its supposed abnormal properties. I took the dagger down, and examined it minutely and with method. The blade is ten inches long, two inches broad at the base, and tapering to a rounded but sharp point, rather peculiar. It is double-edged. The metal sheath is curious for having a cross piece, which, taken with the fact that the sheath itself is continued three parts up the hilt of the dagger, in a most inconvenient fashion, gives it the appearance of a cross. That this is not unintentional is shown by an engraving of the Christ crucified upon one side, whilst upon the other, in Latin, is the inscription, Vengeance is mine, I will repay a quaint and rather terrible conjunction of ideas. Upon the blade of the dagger is graven in old English capitals, I watch, I strike. On the butt of the hilt there is carved deeply a pentacle. This is a pretty accurate description of the peculiar old weapon that has had the curious and uncomfortable reputation of being able, 
either of its own accord or in the hand of something invisible, to strike murderously any enemy of the Jarnock family who may chance to enter the chapel after nightfall. I may tell you here and now that before I left, I had very good reason to put certain doubts behind me, for I tested the deadliness of the thing myself. As you know, however, at this point of my investigation, I was still at that stage where I considered the existence of a supernatural force unprovable. In the meanwhile, I treated the chapel drastically, sounding and scrutinizing the walls and floor, dealing with them almost foot by foot, and particularly examining the two tombs. At the end of this search, I had in a ladder and made a very close survey of the groined roof. I passed three days in this fashion, and by the evening of the third day I had proved to my entire satisfaction that there is no place in the whole of that chapel where any living being could have hidden, and also that the only way of ingress and egress to and from the chapel is through the doorway which leads into the castle, the door of which is always kept locked, and the key kept by Sir Alfred Jarnock himself, as I have told you. I mean, of course, that this doorway is the only entrance practical to material people. Yes, as you will see, even had I discovered some other opening, secret or otherwise, it would not have helped at all to explain the mystery of the incredible attack in a normal fashion. For the butler, as you know, was struck in full sight of the rector, Sir Jarnock, and his son. And old Bellet himself knew that no living person had touched him, out of the void, the rector had described the inhumanly brutal attack. Out of the void. A strange feeling it gives one, eh? And this is the thing that I had been called in to bottom. After considerable thought, I decided on a plan of action. I proposed to Sir Alfred Jarnock that I should spend a night in the chapel, and keep a constant watch upon the dagger. But to this the old knight, a little wizened, nervous man, would not listen for a moment. He, at least, I felt assured, had no doubt of the reality of some dangerous supernatural force a roam at night in the chapel. He informed me that it had been his habit every evening to lock the chapel door, so that no one might foolishly or heedlessly run the risk of any peril that it might hold at night and that he could not allow me to attempt such a thing after what had happened to the butler. I could see that Sir Alfred Jarnock was very much in earnest, and would evidently have held himself to blame had he allowed me to make the experiment, and any harm had come to me. So I said nothing in argument, and presently, pleading the fatigue of his years and health, he said good night, and left me, having given me the impression of being a polite but rather superstitious old gentleman. That night, however, whilst I was undressing, I saw how I might achieve the thing I wished, and be able to enter the chapel after dark, without making Sir Alfred Jarnock nervous. On the morrow, when I borrowed the key, I would take an impression, and have a duplicate made. Then, with my private key, I could do just what I liked. In the morning I carried out my idea. I borrowed the key, as I wanted to take a photograph of the chancel by daylight, when I had done this, I locked up the chapel and handed the key to Sir Alfred Jarnock, having first taken an impression in soap. I had brought out the exposed plate, in its slide, with me, but the camera I had left exactly as it was, as I wanted to take a second photograph of the chancel that night, from the same position. I took the dark slide into Burton Tree, also the cake of soap with the impress. The soap I left with the local ironmonger, who was something of a locksmith, and promised to let me have my duplicate, finished, if I would call in two hours. This I did, having in the meanwhile found out a photographer, where I developed the plate and left it to dry, telling him I would call next day. At the end of the two hours I went for my key and found it ready, much to my satisfaction. Then I returned to the castle. After dinner that evening, I played billiards with young Jarnock for a couple of hours. Then I had a cup of coffee and went off to my room, telling him I was feeling awfully tired. He nodded and told me he felt the same way. I was glad, for I wanted the house to settle as soon as possible. I locked the door of my room. Then, from under the bed, where I had hidden them earlier in the evening, I drew out several fine pieces of armor plate, which I had removed from the armory. There was also a shirt of chain mail, 
with a sort of quilted hood of mail to go over the head. I buckled on the plate armor and found it extraordinarily uncomfortable, and overall I drew on the chain mail. I know nothing about armor, but from what I have learned since I must have put on parts of two suits. Anyway, I felt beastly, clamped and clumsy, and unable to move my arms and legs naturally, but I knew that the thing I was thinking of doing called for some sort of protection for my body. Over the armor I pulled on my dressing gown and shoved my revolver into one of the side pockets, and my repeating flashlight into the other. My dark lantern I carried in my hand. As soon as I was ready I went out into the passage and listened. I had been some considerable time making my preparations, and I found that now the big hall and staircase were in darkness, and all the house seemed quiet. I stepped back and closed and locked my door. Then, very slowly and silently, I went downstairs to the hall and turned into the passage that led to the chapel. I reached the door and tried my key. It fitted perfectly, and a moment later I was in the chapel, with the door locked behind me, and all about me the utter dree silence of the place, with just the faint showings of the outlines of the stained, leaded windows, making the darkness and lonesomeness almost the more apparent. Now, it would be silly to say I did not feel queer. I felt very queer indeed. You just try, any of you, to imagine yourself standing there in the dark silence and remembering not only the legend that was attached to the place, but what had really happened to the old butler only a little while gone. I can tell you, as I stood there, I could believe that something invisible was coming toward me in the air of the chapel. Yet I had got to go through with the business, and I just took hold of my little bit of courage and set to work. First of all, I switched on my light. Then I began a careful tour of the place, examining every corner and nook. I found nothing unusual. At the chancel gate I held up my lamp and flashed the light at the dagger. It hung there right enough, above the altar, but I remember thinking of the word demure as I looked at it. However, I pushed the thought away, for what I was doing needed no addition of uncomfortable thoughts. I completed the tour of the place with a constantly growing awareness of its utter chill and unkind desolation. An atmosphere of cold dismalness seemed to be everywhere, and the quiet was abominable. At the conclusion of my search, I walked across to where I had left my camera focused upon the chancel. From the satchel that I had put beneath the tripod, I took out a dark slide and inserted it into the camera, drawing the shutter. After that, I uncapped the lens, pulled out my flashlight apparatus, and pressed the trigger. There was an intense, brilliant flash that made the whole of the interior of the chapel jump into sight and disappear as quickly. Then, in the light from my lantern, I inserted the shutter into the slide and reversed the slide so as to have a fresh plate ready to expose at any time. After I had done this, I shut off my lantern and sat down in one of the pews near to my camera. I cannot say what I expected to happen, but I had an extraordinary feeling, almost a conviction, that something peculiar or horrible would soon occur. It was, you know, as if I knew. An hour passed of absolute silence. The time I knew by the far-off faint chime of a clock that had been erected over the stables. I was beastly cold, for the whole place is without any kind of heating pipes or furnace, as I had noticed during my search, so that the temperature was sufficiently uncomfortable to suit my frame of mind. I felt like a kind of human periwinkle encased in boilerplate and frozen with cold and funk, and you know, somehow, the dark about me seemed to press coldly against my face. I cannot say whether any of you have ever had the feeling, but if you have, you will know just how disgustingly unnerving it is. And then, all at once, I had a horrible sense that something was moving in the place. It was not that I could hear anything, but I had a kind of intuitive knowledge that something had stirred in the dark. Can you imagine how I felt? Suddenly my courage went. I put up my mailed arms over my face. I wanted to protect it. I had got a sudden, sickening feeling that something was hovering over me in the dark. Talk about fright. I could have shouted if I had not been afraid of the noise. And then, abruptly, 
I heard something. Away up the aisle there sounded a dull clang of metal, as it might be the tread of a mailed heel upon the stone of the aisle. I sat immovable. I was fighting with all my strength to get back my courage. I could not take my arms down from over my face, but I knew that I was getting hold of the gritty part of me again, and suddenly I made a mighty effort and lowered my arms. I held my face up in the darkness, and I tell you, I respect myself for the act, because I thought truly at that moment that I was going to die. But I think, just then, by the slow revulsion of feeling which had assisted my effort, I was less sick in that instant at the thought of having to die than at the knowledge of the utter weak cowardice that had so unexpectedly shaken me all to bits for a time. Do I make myself clear? You understand, I feel sure, that the sense of respect which I spoke of is not really unhealthy egotism, because, you see, I am not blind to the state of mind which helped me. I mean that if I had uncovered my face by a sheer effort of will, unhelped by any revulsion of feeling, I should have done a thing much more worthy of mention. But even as it was, there were elements of the act worthy of respect. You follow me, don't you? And you know... Nothing touched me, after all, so that in a little while I had got back a bit to my normal and felt steady enough to go through with the business without any more funking. I dare say a couple of minutes passed, and then, away up near the chancel, there came that clang, as though an armored foot stepped cautiously. By Jove, but it made me stiffen! and suddenly the thought came that the sound I heard might be the rattle of the dagger above the altar. It was not a particularly sensible notion, for the sound was far too heavy and resonant for such a cause. Yet, as can be easily understood, my reason was bound to submit somewhat to my fancy at such a time. I remember now that the idea of that insensate thing becoming animate and attacking me did not occur to me with any sense of possibility or reality. I thought, rather, in a vague way, of some invisible monster of outer space, fumbling at the dagger. I remembered the old rector's description of the attack on the butler, of the void, and he had described the stupendous force of the blow as being like the kick of a great horse. You can see how uncomfortably my thoughts were running. I felt round swiftly and cautiously for my lantern. I found it close to me, on the pew seat, and with a sudden jerky movement I switched on the light. I flashed it up the aisle, to and fro across the chancel, but I could see nothing to frighten me. I turned quickly and set the jet of light darting across and across the rear end of the chapel. Then on each side of me, before and behind, up at the roof and down at the marble floor, but nowhere was there any visible thing to put me in fear not a thing that need have set my flesh thrilling, just the quiet chapel, cold and eternally silent. You know the feeling. I had been standing whilst I sent the light about the chapel, but now I pulled out my revolver, and then, with a tremendous effort of will, switched off the light, and sat down again in the darkness, to continue my constant watch. It seemed to me that quite half an hour, or even more, must have passed after this, during which no sound had broken the intense stillness. I had grown less nervously tense, for the flashing of the light round the place had made me feel less out of bounds of the normal. It had given me something of that unreasoned sense of safety that a nervous child obtains at night by covering its head up with the bedclothes. This just about illustrates the complete human illogicalness of the workings of my feelings, for, as you know, whatever creature, thing, or being it was that had made that extraordinary and horrible attack on the old butler, it had certainly not been visible. And so you must picture me sitting there in the dark, clumsy with armor and with my revolver in one hand, and nursing my lantern ready with the other, and then it was, after this little time of partial relief from intense nervousness, that there came a fresh strain on me, for somewhere in the utter quiet of the chapel, I thought I heard something. I listened, tense and rigid, my heart booming just a little in my ears for a moment. Then I thought I heard it again. I felt sure that something had moved at the top of the aisle. I strained in the darkness to hark, 
and my eyes showed me blackness within blackness, wherever I glanced, so that I took no heed of what they told me, for even if I looked at the dim loom of the stained window at the top of the chancel, my sight gave me the shapes of vague shadows passing noiselessly and ghostly across, constantly. There was a time of almost peculiar silence, horrible to me as I felt just then, and suddenly I seemed to hear a sound again, nearer to me and repeated, infinitely stealthy. It was as if a vast soft tread were coming slowly down the aisle. Can you imagine how I felt? I do not think you can. I did not move any more than the stone effigies on the two tombs, but sat there, stiffened. I fancied now that I heard the tread all about the chapel, and then, you know, I was just as sure in a moment that I could not hear it, that I had never heard it. Some particularly long minutes passed about this time, but I think my nerves must have quieted a bit, for I remember being sufficiently aware of my feelings to realize that the muscles of my shoulders ached with the way that they must have been contracted as I sat there, hunching myself, rigid. Mind you, I was still in a disgusting funk, but what I might call the imminent sense of danger seemed to have eased from around me. At any rate, I felt, in some curious fashion, that there was a respite, a temporary cessation of malignity from around me. It is impossible to word my feelings more clearly to you, for I cannot see them more clearly than this myself. Yet you must not picture me as sitting there free from strain, for the nervous tension was so great that my heart action was a little out of normal control, the blood beat making a dull booming at times in my ears, with the result that I had the sensation that I could not hear accurately. This is a simply beastly feeling, especially under such circumstances. I was sitting like this, listening, as I might say, with body and soul, when suddenly I got that hideous conviction again that something was moving in the air of the place. The feeling seemed to stiffen me as I sat, and my head appeared to tighten as if all the scalp had grown tense. This was so real that I suffered an actual pain, most peculiar and at the same time intense. The whole head pained. I had a fierce desire to cover my face again with my mailed arms, but I fought it off. If I had given way then to that, I should simply have bunked straight out of the place. I sat and sweated coldly, that's the bald truth, with a creep busy at my spine. And then, abruptly, once more I thought I heard the sound of that huge, soft tread on the aisle, and this time closer to me. There was an awful little silence, during which I had the feeling that something enormous was bending over toward me from the aisle. And then, through the booming of the blood in my ears, there came a slight sound from the place where my camera stood, a disagreeable sort of slithering sound, and then a sharp tap. I had the lantern ready in my left hand, and now I snapped it on desperately and shone it straight above me for I had a conviction that there was something there, but I saw nothing. Immediately I flashed the light at the camera and along the aisle, but again there was nothing visible. I wheeled round, shooting the beam of light in a great circle about the place, to and fro I shone it, jerking it here and there, but it showed me nothing. I had stood up the instant that I had seen that there was nothing in sight over me, and now... I determined to visit the chancel and see whether the dagger had been touched. I stepped out of the pew into the aisle, and here I came to an abrupt pause, for an almost invincible sick repugnance was fighting me back from the upper part of the chapel. A constant queer prickling went up and down my spine, and a dull ache took me in the small of the back as I fought with myself to conquer this sudden new feeling of terror and horror. I tell you that no one who has not been through these kind of experiences has any idea of the sheer, actual physical pain attendant upon, and resulting from, the intense nervous strain that ghostly fright sets up in the human system. I stood there feeling positively ill. 
but I got myself in hand, as it were, in about half a minute, and then I went, walking, I expect, as jerky as a mechanical tin man, and switching the light from side to side, before and behind, and over my head, continually, and the hand that held my revolver sweated so much that the thing fairly slipped in my fist. Does not sound very heroic, does it? I passed through the short chancel and reached the step that led up to the small gate in the chancel rail. I threw the beam from my lantern upon the dagger. Yes, I thought, it's all right. Abruptly it seemed to me that there was something wanting, and I leaned forward over the chancel gate to peer, holding the light high. My suspicion was hideously correct. The dagger had gone. Only the cross-shaped sheath hung there above the altar. In a sudden, frightened flash of imagination, I pictured the thing adrift in the chapel, moving here and there as though of its own volition, for whatever force had wielded it, it was certainly beyond visibility. I turned my head stiffly over to the left, glancing frightenedly behind me and flashing the light to help my eyes. In the same instant I was struck a tremendous blow over the left breast and hurled backward from the chancel rail into the aisle, my armor clanging loudly in the horrible silence. I landed on my back and slithered along on the polished marble. My shoulder struck the corner of a pew front and brought me up half stunned. I scrambled to my feet, horribly sick and shaken, but the fear that was on me making little of that at the moment. I was minus both revolver and lantern, and utterly bewildered as to just where I was standing. I bowed my head, and made a scrambling run into the complete darkness, and dashed into a pew. I jumped back, staggering, got my bearings a little, and raced down the center of the aisle, putting my mailed arms over my face. I plunged into my camera, hauling it among the pews. I crashed into the font and reeled back. Then I was at the exit. I fumbled madly in my dressing-gown pocket for the key. I found it and scraped at the door feverishly for the keyhole. I found the keyhole, turned the key, burst the door open, and was into the passage. I slammed the door and leant hard against it, gasping, whilst I felt crazily again for the keyhole, this time to lock the door upon what was in the chapel. I succeeded and began to feel my way stupidly along the wall of the corridor. Presently I had come to the big hall, and so in a little to my room. In my room I sat for a while, until I had steadied down something to the normal. After a time I commenced to strip off the armor. I saw then that both the chainmail and the plate armor had been pierced over the breast, and suddenly it came home to me that the thing had struck for my heart. Stripping rapidly, I found that the skin of the breast over the heart had just been cut sufficiently to allow a little blood to stain my shirt, nothing more. Only the whole breast was badly bruised and intensely painful. You can imagine what would have happened had I not worn the armor. In any case, it is a marvel that I was not knocked senseless. I did not go to bed at all that night, but sat upon the edge, thinking and waiting for the dawn for I had to remove my litter before Sir Alfred Jarnock should enter if I were to hide from him the fact that I had managed a duplicate key. So soon as the pale light of the morning had strengthened sufficiently to show me the various details of my room, I made my way quietly down to the chapel. Very silently and with tense nerves I opened the door. The chill light of the dawn made distinct the whole place, everything seeming instinct with a ghostly, unearthly quiet. Can you get the feeling? I waited several minutes at the door, allowing the morning to grow, and likewise my courage, I suppose. Presently the rising sun threw an odd beam right in through the big east window, making colored sunshine all the length of the chapel. And then, with a tremendous effort, I forced myself to enter. I went up the aisle to where I had overthrown my camera in the darkness. The legs of the tripod were sticking up from the interior of a pew, and I expected to find the machine smashed to pieces, yet, beyond that the ground glass was broken, there was no real damage done. I replaced the camera, in the position from which I had taken the previous photography, but the slide containing the plate I had exposed by flashlight I removed and put into one of my side pockets, 
regretting that I had not taken a second flash picture at the instant when I heard those strange sounds up in the chancel. Having tidied my photographic apparatus, I went to the chancel to recover my lantern and revolver, which had both, as you know, been knocked from my hands when I was stabbed. I found the lantern lying, hopelessly bent, with smashed lens just under the pulpit. My revolver I must have held until my shoulder struck the pew, for it was lying there in the aisle, just about where I believe I cannoned into the pew corner. It was quite undamaged. Having secured these two articles, I walked up to the chancel rail to see whether the dagger had returned, or been returned, to its sheath above the altar. Before, however, I reached the chancel rail, I had a slight shock. For there on the floor of the chancel, about a yard away from where I had been struck, lay the dagger, quiet and demure upon the polished marble pavement. I wonder whether you will, any of you, understand the nervousness that took me at the sight of the thing. With a sudden, unreasoned action, I jumped forward and put my foot on it to hold it there. Can you understand, do you? And you know, I could not stoop down and pick it up with my hands for quite a minute, I should think. Afterward, when I had done so, however, and handled it a little, this feeling passed away and my reason, and also I expect the daylight, made me feel that I had been a little bit of an ass. Quite natural, though, I assure you. It was a new kind of fear to me. I am taking no notice of the cheap joke about the ass. I am talking about the curiousness of learning in that moment a new shade or quality of fear that had hitherto been outside of my knowledge or imagination. Does it interest you? I examined the dagger minutely, turning it over and over in my hands, and never, as I suddenly discovered, holding it loosely. It was as if I were subconsciously surprised that it lay quiet in my hands. Yet even this feeling passed, largely, after a short while. The curious weapon showed no signs of the blow, except that the dull color of the blade was slightly brighter at the rounded point that had cut through the armor. Presently, when I had made an end of staring at the dagger, I went up the chancel step and in through the little gate. Then, kneeling upon the altar, I replaced the dagger in its sheath, and came outside of the rail again, closing the gate after me and feeling awarely uncomfortable because the horrible old weapon was back again in its accustomed place. I suppose, without analyzing my feelings very deeply, I had an unreasoned and only half-conscious belief that there was a greater probability of danger when the dagger hung in its five-century resting place than when it was out of it. Yet, somehow I don't think this is a very good explanation when I remember the demure look the thing seemed to have when I saw it lying on the floor of the chancel. Only I know this, that when I had replaced the dagger I had quite a touch of nerves, and I stopped only to pick up my lantern from where I had placed it while I examined the weapon, after which I went down the quiet aisle at a pretty quick walk, and so got out of the place. That the nerve tension had been considerable I realized when I had locked the door behind me. I felt no inclination now to think of old Sir Alfred as a hypochondriac because he had taken such hyper-seeming precautions regarding the chapel. I had a sudden wonder as to whether he might not have some knowledge of a long prior tragedy in which the dagger had been concerned. I returned to my room, washed, shaved, and dressed, after which I read a while. Then I went downstairs and got the acting butler to give me some sandwiches and a cup of coffee. Half an hour later I was headed for Burton Tree as hard as I could walk, for a sudden idea had come to me which I was anxious to test. I reached the town a little before 8.30 and found the local photography with his shutters still up. I did not wait, but knocked until he appeared with his coat off, evidently in the act of dealing with his breakfast. In a few words I made clear that I wanted the use of his dark room immediately, and this he at once placed at my disposal. I had brought with me the slide which contained the plate that I had used with the flashlight, and as soon as I was ready I set to work to develop. Yet it was not the plate which I had exposed that I first put into the solution, but the second plate, which had been ready in the camera during all the time of my waiting in the darkness. You see, the lens had been uncapped all that while, so that the whole chancel had been, as it were, under observation. 
You all know something of my experiments in lightless photography, that is, appreciating light. It was X-ray work that started me in that direction. Yet, you must understand, though I was attempting to develop this unexposed plate, I had no definite idea of results, nothing more than a vague hope that it might show me something. Yet, because of the possibilities, it was with the most intense and absorbing interest that I watched the plate under the action of the developer. Presently I saw a faint smudge of black appear in the upper part, and after that others, indistinct and wavering of outline. I held the negative up to the light. The marks were rather small and almost entirely confined to one end of the plate, but as I have said, lacked definiteness. Yet such as they were, they were sufficient to make me very excited, and I shoved the thing quickly back into the solution. For some minutes further I watched it, lifting it out once or twice to make a more exact scrutiny, but could not imagine what the markings might represent until suddenly it occurred to me that in one of two places they certainly had shapes suggestive of a cross-hilted dagger. Yet the shapes were sufficiently indefinite to make me careful not to let myself be over-impressed by the uncomfortable resemblance, though I must confess the very thought was sufficient to set some odd thrills adrift in me. I carried development a little further, then put the negative into the hypo, and commenced work upon the other plate. This came up nicely, and very soon I had a really decent negative that appeared similar in every respect, except for the difference of lighting, to the negative I had taken during the previous day. I fixed the plate, then, having washed both it and the unexposed one for a few minutes under the tap, I put them into mentholated spirits for fifteen minutes, after which I carried them into the photographer's kitchen and dried them in the oven. Whilst the two plates were drying, the photographer and I made an enlargement from the negative I had taken by daylight. Then we did the same with the two that I had just developed, washing them as quickly as possible, for I was not troubling about the permanency of the prints and drying them with spirits. When this was done, I took them to the window and made a thorough examination, commencing with the one that appeared to show shadowy daggers in several places. Yet, though it was now enlarged, I was still unable to feel convinced that the marks truly represented anything abnormal, and because of this I put it to one side, determined not to let my imagination play too large a part in constructing weapons out of the indefinite outlines. I took up the two other enlargements, both of the chancel, as you will remember, and commenced to compare them. For some minutes I examined them without being able to distinguish any difference in the scene they portrayed. And then, abruptly, I saw something in which they varied. In the second enlargement, the one made from the flashlight negative, the dagger was not in its sheath. Yet I had felt sure it was there but a few minutes before I took the photograph. After this discovery, I began to compare the two enlargements in a very different manner from my previous scrutiny. I borrowed a pair of calipers from the photographer, and with these I carried out a most methodical and exact comparison of the details shown in the two photographs. Suddenly I came upon something that set me all tingling with excitement. I threw the calipers down, paid the photographer, and walked out through the shop into the street. The three enlargements I took with me, making them into a roll as I went. At the corner of the street I had the luck to get a cab and was soon back at the castle. I hurried up to my room and put the photographs away. Then I went down to see whether I could find Sir Alfred Jarnock, but Mr. George Jarnock, who met me, told me that his father was too unwell to rise, and would prefer that no one entered the chapel unless he were about. Young Jarnock made a half-apologetic excuse for his father, remarking that Sir Alfred Jarnock was perhaps inclined to be a little over-careful, but that, considering what had happened, we must agree that the need for his carefulness had been justified. He added, also, that even before the horrible attack on the butler, his father had been just as particular, always keeping the key and never allowing the door to be unlocked except when the place was in use for divine service, and for an hour each forenoon when the cleaners were in. To all this I nodded understandingly, but when presently the young man left me, I took my duplicate key and made for the door of the chapel. I went in and locked it behind me, after which I carried out some intensely interesting and rather weird experiments. 
these proved successful to such an extent that I came out of the place in a perfect fever of excitement. I inquired for Mr. George Jarnock and was told that he was in the morning room. "'Come along,' I said, when I had found him. "'Please, give me a lift. I've something exceedingly strange to show you.' He was palpably very much surprised, but came quickly. As we strode along, he asked me a score of questions, to all of which I just shook my head, asking him to wait a little. I led the way to the armory. Here I suggested that he should take one side of a dummy, dressed in half-plate armor, whilst I took the other. He nodded, though obviously vastly bewildered, and together we carried the thing to the chapel door. When he saw me take out my key and open the way for us, he appeared even more astonished, but held himself in, evidently waiting for me to explain. We entered the chapel, and I locked the door behind us, after which we carted the armored dummy up the aisle to the gate of the chancel rail, where we put it down upon its round wooden stand. "'Stand back!' I shouted suddenly, as young Jarnock made a movement to open the gate. "'My God, man, you mustn't do that!' "'Do what?' he asked, half startled and half irritated by my words and manner. "'One minute,' I said. "'Just stand to the side a moment and watch.' He stepped to the left whilst I took the dummy in my arms and turned it to face the altar, so that it stood close to the gate. Then, standing well away on the right side, I pressed the back of the thing so that it leant forward a little upon the gate, which flew open. In the same instant the dummy was struck a tremendous blow that hurled it into the aisle, the armor rattling and clanging upon the polished marble floor. "'Good God!' shouted young Jarnock and ran back from the chancel rail, his face very white. "'Come, and look at the thing,' I said, and led the way to where the dummy lay, its armored upper limbs all splayed adrift in queer contortions. I stooped over it and pointed. There, driven right through the thick steel breastplate, was the wayful dagger. "'Good God!' said young Jarnock again. "'Good God, it's the dagger! The thing's been stabbed, same as Bellet!' Yes, I replied, and saw him glance swiftly toward the entrance of the chapel. But I will do him the justice to say that he never budged an inch. Come and see how it was done, I said, and led the way back to the chancel rail. From the wall to the left of the altar, I took down a long, curiously ornamented iron instrument, not unlike a short spear. The sharp end of this I inserted in a hole in the left-hand gatepost of the chancel gateway. I lifted hard, and a section of the post, from the floor upward, bent inward toward the altar as though hinged at the bottom. Down it went, leaving the remaining part of the post standing. As I bent the movable portion lower, there came a quick click, and a section of the floor slid to one side, showing a long, shallow cavity sufficient to enclose the post. I put my weight to the lever and hove the post down into the niche. Immediately there was a sharp clang as some catch snicked in and held it against a powerful operating spring. I went over now to the dummy and after a few minutes' work managed to wrench the dagger loose out of the armor. I brought the old weapon and placed its hilt in a hole near the top of the post where it fitted loosely the point upward. After that I went again to the lever and gave another strong heave and the post descended about a foot to the bottom of the cavity catching there with another clang. I withdrew the lever, and the narrow strip of floor slid back, covering post and dagger, and looking no different from the surrounding surface. Then I shut the chancel gate, and we both stood well to one side. I took the spear-like lever and gave the gate a little push, so that it opened. Instantly there was a loud thud, and something sang through the air, striking the bottom wall of the chapel. It was the dagger. I showed Jarnock then that the other half of the post had sprung back into place, making the whole post as thick as the one upon the right side of the gate. There, I said, turning to the young man and tapping the divided post, there's the invisible thing that used the dagger, but who the deuce is the person who sets the trap? I looked at him keenly as I spoke. My father is the only one who has a key, he said, so it's practically impossible for anyone to get in and meddle. 
I looked at him again, but it was obvious that he had not yet reached out to any conclusion. "'See here, Mr. Jarnock,' I said, perhaps rather curter than I should have done, considering what I had to say. "'Are you quite sure that Sir Alfred is quite balanced mentally?' He looked at me, half-frightenedly, and flushing a little. I realized then how badly I put it. I, "'I don't know,' he replied, after a slight pause, and was then silent except for one or two half-incoherent remarks. "'Tell the truth,' I said. "'Haven't you suspected something now and again? You needn't be afraid to tell me.' "'Well,' he answered slowly, "'I'll admit I've thought Father a little—a little, a little strange, perhaps, at times.' "'But I've always tried to think I was mistaken. "'I've always hoped no one else would see it. "'You see, I'm very fond of the old governor.' "'I nodded. "'Quite right, too,' I said. "'There's not the least need to make any kind of scandal about this. "'We must do something, though, but in a quiet way. "'No fuss, you know. "'I should go and have a chat with your father "'and tell him we've found out about this thing.' "'I touched the divided post.' Young Jarnock seemed very grateful for my advice, and after shaking my hand pretty hard, took my key and let himself out of the chapel. He came back in about an hour, looking rather upset. He told me that my conclusions were perfectly correct. It was Sir Alfred Jarnock who had set the trap, both on the night that the butler was nearly killed, and on the past night. Indeed, it seemed that the old gentleman had set it every night for many years. He had learnt of its existence from an old manuscript book in the castle library. It had been planned and used in an earlier age as protection for the gold vessels of the ritual, which were, it seemed, kept in a hidden recess at the back of the altar. This recess Sir Alfred Jarnock had utilized secretly to store his wife's jewelry. She had died some twelve years back, and the young man told me that his father had never seemed quite himself since. I mentioned to young Jarnock how puzzled I was that the trap had been set before the service, on the night that the butler was struck. For, if I understood him aright, his father had been in the habit of setting the trap late every night and unsetting it each morning before anyone entered the chapel. He replied that his father, in a fit of temporary forgetfulness, natural enough in his neurotic condition, must have set it too early, and hence what had so nearly proved a tragedy. That is about all there is to tell. The old man is not, so far as I could learn, really insane in the popularly accepted sense of the word. He is extremely neurotic and has developed into a hypochondriac, the whole condition probably brought about by the shock and sorrow resulted on the death of his wife, leading to years of sad broodings and to overmuch of his own company and thoughts. Indeed, young Jarnock told me that his father would sometimes pray for hours together alone in the chapel. Carnick made an end of speaking, and leant forward for a spill. "'But you've never told us just how you discovered the secret of the divided post and all that,' I said, speaking for the four of us. "'Oh, that,' replied Carnacki, puffing vigorously at his pipe. I found, on comparing the, the photos, that the one, taken in the daytime, showed a thicker left-hand gatepost than the one taken at night by the flashlight. That put me onto the track. I saw at once that there might be some mechanical dodge at the back of the whole queer business, and nothing at all of an abnormal nature. I examined the post, and the rest was simple enough, you know. By the way, he continued, rising and going to the mantelpiece, you may be interested to have a look at the so-called Waffle Dagger. Young Jarnock was kind enough to present it to me as a little memento of my adventure. He handed it round to us, and whilst we examined it, stood silent before the fire, puffing meditatively at his pipe. Jarnock and I made the trap so that it won't work, he remarked after some minutes. I've got the dagger, as you see, and old Bellet's getting about again, so the whole business can be hushed up decently. All the same, I fancy the chapel will never lose its reputation as a dangerous place, should be pretty safe now to keep valuables in. There's two things you haven't explained yet, I said. What do you think caused the two clangy sounds when you were in the chapel in the dark? And do you believe that the soft, tready sounds were real, or only a fancy with your being so worked up and tense? Don't know for certain about the clangs, replied Carnacki. I'm puzzled quite a bit about them. 
I can only think that the spring which worked the post must have given a trifle, slipped, you know, in the catch. If it did, under such a tension, it would make a bit of a ringing noise, and a little sound goes a long way in the middle of the night when you're thinking of ghostesses. You can understand that, eh? Yes, I agreed, and the other sounds? Well, the same thing. I mean, the extraordinary quietness may help to explain these a bit. They may have been some usual enough sound that would never have been noticed under ordinary conditions, or they may have been only fancy. It is just impossible to say. They were disgustingly real to me. As for the slithery noise, I am pretty sure that one of the tripod legs of my camera must have slipped a few inches. If it did so, it may easily have jolted the lens cap off the baseboard, which would account for that queer little tap which I heard directly after. How do you account for the dagger being in its place above the altar when you first examined it that night? I asked. How could it be there when at that very moment it was set in the trap? That was my mistake, replied Carnacki. The dagger could not possibly have been in its sheath at the time, though I thought it was. You see, the curious cross-hilted sheath gave the appearance of the complete weapon, as you can understand. The hilt of the dagger protrudes very little above the continued portion of the sheath, a most inconvenient arrangement for drawing quickly. He nodded sagely at the lot of us and yawned, then glanced at the clock. Out you go, he said in a friendly fashion, using the recognized formula. I want to sleep. We rose, shook him by the hand, and went out presently into the night and the quiet of the embankment, and so to our homes. End of chapter 6 Recording by Peake End of Carnacki, the Ghost Finder, by William Hope Hodgson